Richard I, also known as Richard the Lionheart, was a formidable figure in medieval European history, renowned for his prowess and leadership on the battlefield. Richard ascended to the throne in England in 1189, ruling until his death in 1199. His lineage traced back to Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine, and though initially an unlikely heir, Richard emerged as a dominant force in European politics. From a young age, Richard exhibited military acumen, taking command of his own army by the age of sixteen and quelling rebellions against his father. However, his most notable exploits came during the Third Crusade, where he played a crucial role as a commander of the Christian forces. Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to see you. And if you're coming back, it's good to see you again. If you'd like to support the channel and everything I do here on YouTube, go and have a look at the Patreon, where all the videos are ad-free. Also, like, subscribe, and comment below if you're enjoying this style of content. Now, without further ado, let's begin our topic for today's video. Richard the Lionheart Richard, born on the 8th of September, 1157, likely at Beaumont Palace in Oxford, England was the son of King Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine. He grew up alongside siblings William, Henry the Young King, and Matilda, with William passing away before Richard's birth. Despite being a younger son, Richard was not anticipated to inherit the throne. He had four additional siblings from his parents, and two half-sisters from Eleanor's prior marriage to King Louis the Seventh of France. Richard's lineage traced back to William the Conqueror, and according to legend, to figures like Noah and Woden. Raised primarily in England during his father's periodic visits to his various domains, Richard's early years were marked by travels to Normandy with his mother and the care of his wet nurse, Hodierna of St. Albans. While the extent of his English proficiency remains uncertain, Richard was known for his education, displaying talents in poetry and writing in both Limousin and French. During his imprisonment, Richard's brother John leveraged English bias against foreigners to undermine the authority of Richard's Chancellor, William Longchamp, who was Norman. One accusation against Longchamp, made by John's supporter, Hugh Nanant, was his purported inability to speak English, highlighting the expectation of English proficiency for those in positions of authority in the late 12th century England. Descriptions of Richard depict him as physically striking, with reddish blonde hair, light eyes, and a fair complexion. While his exact height is uncertain due to the loss of his remains, some sources claim he stood at six foot five contrasting starkly with his shorter brother John, who was around five foot five. One account describes Richard as tall, with an elegant build, reddish gold hair and a long, well-suited limbs, particularly well-suited for wielding a sword. In medieval Europe, Marriage alliances were not just matters of personal choice, but crucial diplomatic tools that could shape political landscapes. Richard, 
born in 1157 to King Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine, was destined to play a central role in such engagements. Early on, a marriage pact was proposed between Richard and one of the daughters of Raymond Berenguer IV, the Count of Barcelona, in March 1159. However, due to various circumstances, this plan eventually fell through. Meanwhile, Henry, the young king, Richard's elder brother, solidified an alliance by marrying Margaret, daughter of Louis VII of France, in 1160. This union between the Plantagenets and the Capetians, though seemingly harmonious, occasionally faced tensions inherent in their complex relationship between England and France. Henry II's territorial ambitions further complicated matters, especially in Brittany and the Vexin, leading to conflicts with the French crown. Despite these challenges, Richard's betrothal to Alice, Countess of the Vexin, was finally confirmed in January 1169, after a peace treaty mediated by Pope Alexander III. This betrothal marked a significant diplomatic achievement, as it represented an attempt to bridge the rivalry between the English and French monarchies. Henry II, envisioning a division of his vast territories, planned for Richard to inherit Aquitaine and Poitiers from his mother, Eleanor, thereby securing his position as a powerful vassal in southwest of France. Henry II's illness in 1170 prompted the formal implementation of his territorial division plan. Richard, who at this time was only fourteen years old, was granted the Duchy of Aquitaine, a momentous step towards his independent rule. Together with his mother, Eleanor, Richard embarked on a tour of Aquitaine in 1171, aiming to assert his authority and win over the local populace. The ceremonies held in Poitiers and Limoges in June of 1172 were pivotal in Richard's official recognition as the Duke of Aquitaine and Count of Poitiers. These events marked his transition from a young nobleman to a ruler vested with authority over significant territories. With the backing of his mother and the formalities of investiture, Richard embarked on his journey of becoming one of the most renowned figures in the medieval era, setting the stage for his illustrious reign as the Lionheart. The seeds of rebellion sown within the Plantagenet family bore bitter fruit in the form of Henry the young king's defiance against his father, Henry the Second. According to Ralph of Coggeshall, the young king sought to assert his independence and stake his claim to the territories promised to him, weary of his father's control over finances and authority. Speculation even arose that Eleanor of Aquitaine, the young king's mother, may have fueled the flames of dissent among her sons, but that is exactly that speculation. Henry the young king's bold move to seek refuge at the French court under Louis VII signaled the beginning of open defiance. Joined by his brothers Richard and Geoffrey, they formed a formidable coalition against their father, strengthened by Louis's support and the accolade of knighthood bestowed upon Richard. Their rebellion, as described by the poet Jordan Fantos, was marked by strife and discord, devoid of all familial affection. 
bound by a solemn oath at the French court. The brothers vowed not to negotiate with Henry II without Louis VII and the French baron's consent. Bolstered by promises of land and wealth, the young king garnered support from influential barons, including Philip I, Count of Flanders, and rallied allies in England, igniting rebellions in various regions. Robert de Beaumont, Earl of Leicester, joined forces with other nobles, launching a rebellion in Suffolk that gained momentum by July 1173, with sieges and captures marking their advance. As the rebellion continued to unfold, Richard took charge of the situation in Poitou, rallying local barons to his cause against his father's supporters in Aquitaine. Eleanor's capture left Richard to lead the campaign independently, facing resistance as he sought to consolidate his base of operations. Though met with a good amount of setbacks, Richard's resolve remained firm as he navigated the tumultuous landscape of that familial strife and politics, laying the groundwork for his future as a formidable leader. The rebellion continued to intensify, and Henry II mobilized a formidable army of over 20,000 mercenaries to quell the unrest. Advancing towards Verneuil, he forced Louis VII into retreat and recaptured Dole, asserting control over Brittany. Despite the military presence, Henry III extended an olive branch to his sons, offering peace, but the Council of Louis led to its rejection. In a swift turn of events, Henry's forces seized Santes by surprise, capturing much of its garrison, while Richard narrowly escaped, seeking refuge in Chateau de Telebaud. Meanwhile, Henry the young king and the Count of Flanders prepared to support the rebellion in England. However, their plans were thwarted as Henry II swiftly returned with a contingent of soldiers, accompanied by his prisoners, including Eleanor and his son's wives and fiancés. Yet upon his arrival, Henry discovered that the rebellion had already crumbled, with key figures like William of Scotland and Hugh Bigod already captured. Subsequently, Henry returned to France, lifting the siege of Rouen, where Louis VII and the young king had converged after abandoning their English invasion plans. The ensuing defeat led to the signing of the Treaty of Mont-Louis in the September of 1174. With the truce excluding Richard, he found himself to be isolated and vulnerable. In a dramatic plea for forgiveness, Richard sought reconciliation with his father, reportedly shedding tears and falling at Henry's feet. Moved by his son's display of contrition, Henry extended the peace, marking the beginning of a reconciliation process that would also involve Richard's brothers. However, the terms offered to the brothers were less favourable than earlier proposals, with Richard granted limited control over castles in Poitou and Aquitaine. Eleanor, held as a captive, remained a political pawn in Henry II's political manoeuvres, ensuring Richard's compliance with the terms of reconciliation. Following the resolution of the conflict, efforts to restore order in the rebellious territories commenced. Henry undertook the pacification of Anjou, while Geoffrey focused on Brittany. 
In January of 1175, Richard was dispatched to Aquitaine to quell dissent among the barons who had rallied to his cause. The Chronicle of Roger Howden provides insight into Richard's activities during this period, detailing his endeavours to restore control over the region. According to Howden, Richard's directives included the restoration of most rebel-held castles to their pre-war condition, albeit within a tight deadline, with some structures rather slated for destruction. The task proved to be arduous, given the proliferation of stone castles and the extensive fortification that was undertaken by the barons. One notable engagement during Richard's campaign was the two-month siege of castellon sur agen Despite the fortress's formidable reputation, Richard's determined leadership and siege engines eventually compelled the defenders to surrender. It was during this campaign that Richard earned the epithet The Lion, or The Lionheart, for his courageous and indomitable demeanour. References to Richard as our lion appear as early as 1187, while the moniker Lionheart is first documented in Ambroise L'Histoire de la Guerre Sainte, and once again, sorry about my French pronunciation, in 1191, during the campaign in Arcor, later in the Crusades era. Also, you might hear the French expression Cordelion. Richard de Cordelion just means Richard the Lionheart. But I'll try and keep it in English as much as I can. Now amidst these military exploits, tensions simmered within the royal family. Henry II, weary of him empowering his sons with resources that could be ultimately turned against him, reportedly appropriated Alice of France, that's Richard's betrothed, as his own mistress. This maneuver complicated Richard's prospects at marrying Alice, as the union would be deemed illicit by the church. Despite pressure to renounce the betrothal, Richard hesitated as Alice's dowry, which included the strategic Vexin region, held significant political value. Moreover, Alice's familial ties to King Philip II of France posed further complications, as he was a key ally whose goodwill Henry II sought to maintain. Following his failed rebellion against his father, Richard turned his attention to quelling internal revolts within Aquitaine, particularly in Gascony, where his increasingly harsh rule actually managed to incite a major uprising in 1179. The rebels seeking to dispose Richard enlisted the aid of his brothers, Henry and Geoffrey. However, the tide turned in the spring of 1179 at the Charent Valley, where the formidable fortress of Taylorburg stood. Richard employed a strategic approach, decimating the surrounding lands to cut off reinforcements and retreat options for the fortress's defenders. Despite its formidable defences, Richard's forces prevailed, compelling the garrison to sally out and engaging them in battle before seizing the castle in a swift two-day assault. This resounding victory at Taylorburg quelled further rebellion, as many barons pledged allegiance to Richard. In subsequent years, Tensions between Richard and his father kept escalating, with Henry II demanding Richard's homage to Henry the Young King, which Richard adamantly refused. 
The situation reached a boiling point in 1183, when Henry the Young King, along with Geoffrey of Brittany, invaded Aquitaine to subdue Richard. However, Richard successfully repelled the invasion, with his barons rallying to his cause. The conflict intensified with the execution of prisoners, and only paused briefly with the young king's death in the June of 18, 1183, rather, leaving Richard as the eldest surviving son, and also the heir to the English throne. Yet the rift between Richard and Henry had persisted. Exacerbated by Henry's demand for Richard to relinquish Aquitaine, Richard's steadfast refusal prompted Henry II to release Queen Eleanor from captivity and dispatch her to Aquitaine, tasking her with asserting control over Richard's lands. In 1187, Richard sought to bolster his position by forging an alliance with Philip II, the young king of France and son of Eleanor's former husband. Louis the Seventh. Roger of Howden's chronicle depicts Richard's audacious move to secure his castles in Poitou, and defy his father's authority, effectively setting the stage for further confrontations between the father and son. Howden's focus on the political dynamics between Richard and Philip sheds light on their strategic alliance, which was instrumental in shaping the events leading to Richard's ascension. In response to the escalating tensions with his father, and the looming threat posed by Henry's forces, Richard took decisive action by joining Philip in taking the cross at Tours, indicating their commitment to the Crusades. In exchange for Philip's support against Henry, Richard paid homage to him in November 1188. Their combined forces achieved a significant victory over Henry's army at Balans on the 4th of July 1189, prompting Henry to acknowledge Richard as his heir apparent. Just two days later, Henry's death in Chinon paved the way for Richard to ascend to the English throne, as well as inherit the titles of the Duke of Normandy and Count of Anjou. Although Roger of Houghton's account of Henry's death bleeding in Richard's presence remains unverified, it underscores the political intrigue surrounding Richard's rise to power. Richard I's investiture as Duke of Normandy on the 20th of July, 1189, marked a significant step in his ascent to power, culminating in his coronation as King at Westminster Abbey on the 3rd of September, 1189. However, this momentous occasion was marred by violence and persecution against the Jewish community. Despite tradition barring Jews from investiture culture, some Jewish leaders ventured to present gifts to the new king, only to face rather brutal mistreatment at the hands of Richard's courtiers, as recounted by Ralph of Decito. Rumors soon circulated that Richard had ordered the killing of all triggering a vicious attack by the people of London on the Jewish population. Arsonists destroyed many Jewish homes. Several Jews were forcibly converted. And there were also many tragedies of casualties in the mix of all of this. Roger of Howden attributes the violence to jealousy and bigotry among the citizens, with Richard punishing the perpetrators and even allowing forcibly converted Jew to return to Judaism. 
However, Baldwin of Ford, Archbishop of Canterbury, expressed dismay at the unfolding events, highlighting the precarious situation faced by Richard as he prepared to depart on crusade. Recognizing the potential destabilization of his realm, Richard ordered the execution of those responsible for the most egregious acts, including rioters who inadvertently harmed Christian homes. Despite issuing a royal writ to protect the Jews, further violence erupted in March, culminating in a massacre at York. These events underscore the pretty terrible situation during Richard's early reign, which was categorized by religious tensions and challenges to royal authority. In 1187, Richard committed fully to the Third Crusade as Count of Poitou. Following his father and Philip II's lead after the fall of Jerusalem to Saladin in 1188, fearing territorial usurpation during their absence, Richard and Philip agreed to embark on the crusade together. Richard, seeking redemption for his past deeds, raised funds for his crusader army by depleting his father's treasury imposing taxes, and granting positions and privileges for absorbent fees. Notably, he freed William I of Scotland from his oath of subservience, in exchange for a hefty sum. Finalizing agreements on the continent, he appointed various officials to oversee his domains, and left regions to manage affairs in his absence. Troubadours like Bertrand de Bourne criticized Richard's delay in departing for the crusade. Meanwhile, Richard's brother John began scheming against William Longchamp, one of the appointed regents. In pursuit of funds, Richard was reputed to have made a rather interesting remark. Apparently, he had quipped, I would have sold London if I could have found a buyer. In September 1190, Richard and Philip arrived in Sicily, where they encountered political turmoil following the death of King William II. Tancred had seized power, imprisoning Richard's sister, Queen Joan, and withholding her inheritance. Richard demanded her release and restitution, which was granted, partially. However, the unrest continued to persist, leading to a revolt in Messina in October of the same year. Richard intervened, capturing the city and establishing it as his base, leading to a good amount of friction with Philip. After prolonged negotiations, a treaty was signed in March 1191, securing compensation for Joan and confirming Arthur of Brittany as Richard's heir. Despite the initial tensions, Richard and Philip made a full reconciliation, with Richard ending his betrothal to Philip's sister Alice. Before departing for the Holy Land, Richard met with Joachim of Fiore, who shared a prophecy from the Book of Revelation with him. The prophecy was rather motivating, and sent Richard along his way. In April 1191, Richard embarked from Messina for Arca with 17,000 troops, but he didn't get far. A storm scattered his fleet. His sister, Joan, and fiancé, Berengaria of Navarre, along with other ships, was stranded on Cyprus, 
which at the time was ruled by Isaac Comenos. Upon arriving in Lemesos in the 1st of May, Richard demanded their release, but Isaac refused. Richard's forcers then took Lemnos, and various holy land princes, including Guy of Lusignan, fled support in exchange for backing Guy against Conrad of Montferrat. Local magnates then began to desert Isaac, who initially sought peace, but later attempted escape. By June 1st, Richard's troops led by Guy de Lusignan, conquered the island fully. Isaac surrendered, and Richard named governors, eventually selling Cyprus to the temple Templar's master, Robert de Sable, before departing for Acre on the 5th of June. The swift capture of Cyprus secured a vital maritime route to the Holy Land, and bolstered Richard's reputation in coffers, while the island maintained a Christian stronghold until the Ottoman conquest of 1570. Before departing Cyprus for the crusade, Richard married Berengaria, daughter of King Sancho VI of Navarre, whom he had grown close to at the Navarres tournament. The lavish wedding took place on the 12th of May, 1191, in Lemesos Chapel of St. George, attended by Richard's sister, Joan. Despite being betrothed to Alice, Richard pursued the match to secure Navarre as a fife and align with Eleanor's interests, as Navarre bordered Aquitaine. Richard and Berengaria briefly joined the crusade together, before returning separately. Berengaria faced challenges on her journey home, and did not reach England until after Richard's death. Although Richard expressed some remorse for his past behaviour after his release from German captivity, he and Berengaria remained estranged and their marriage remained childless. Richard arrived at Acre on June 8, 1191, and supported Guy of Lusignan's claim to the kingship of Jerusalem. Despite Guy's wife Sibylla's death during the previous year's siege of Acre, Conrad of Montferrat, Sibylla's half-sister, Isabella's second husband, contested Guy's claim, and was backed by Philip of France and Leopold V, Duke of Austria. Richard also allied with Humphrey IV of Toron, Isabella's first husband. Despite suffering from a serious illness similar to scurvy, Richard aided in the capture of Arca, he quarrelled with Leopold over the disposition of Isaac Comenos, and raised banners, resulting in Leopold's departure from the crusade, followed by Philip's departure due to health issues and disputes with Richard. Richard kept Muslim prisoners as hostages, but feared being trapped in Arca, so he ordered their execution. He then defeated Saladin's forces at the Battle of Arasuf and advanced towards Jerusalem, reaching Beit Nubar before deciding to retreat due to bad weather and other strategic concerns. Negotiations with Saladin were unsuccessful. Then Richard re-fortified Ascalon in early 1192. Following an election, Richard reluctantly accepted Conrad of Montferrat as king of Jerusalem, and sold Cyprus to his protégé, Guy. However, Conrad was assassinated by the assassins before his coronation. Richard's nephew, Henry II of Champagne, 
then married Conrad's widow, Isabella, who at this time was pregnant with Conrad's child. Although the murder remained unsolved, many suspected Richard's involvement. In the June of 1192, the Crusader army approached Jerusalem, but it was divided on strategy. Richard and the majority advocated for attacking Egypt to weaken Saladin, while Hugh III, Duke of Burgundy, insisted on a direct assault on Jerusalem. This disagreement led to a retreat to the coast, as the army lacked a unified command. Minor skirmishes followed, including a notable victory for the Crusaders at the Battle of Jaffa, where Richard's martial prowess was praised by contemporary Muslim sources. However, both sides recognized the growing difficulties of their position. Richard faced plots from Philip and his own brother John, while Saladin's army suffered from low morale due to repeated defeats. Despite attempts to strengthen his bargaining position, such as an unsuccessful invasion of Egypt, Richard realized he needed to return home. He reached a settlement with Saladin on September the 2nd, 1192, agreeing to destroy Ascalon's fortifications and initiating a three-year truce. Ill with Arnaldia, Richard departed for England on October the 9th, 1192. Bad weather during Richard's voyage compelled him to dock at Corfu, then part of the Byzantine Empire under Isaac II Angelos. However, Angelos was not too impressed with Richard. He objected to his annexation of Cyprus, which had previously been Byzantine territory. Disguised as a Knight Templar, Richard sailed from Corfu with four attendants, but their ship was wrecked near Aquilia. This forced Richard and his companions to embark on a dangerous overland journey throughout Central Europe. Subsequently, near Vienna, Richard was captured just before Christmas 1192 by Leopold of Austria, who accused him of arranging the murder of Conrad de Montferrat, and resented Richard's actions at Acre, particularly the tearing down of Leopold's standard. Richard was then held prisoner at Dernstein Castle, under the care of Leopold's ministerialis, Hadmar of Quenring. News of Richard's captivity reached England, where the regents were initially uncertain of his whereabouts. Meanwhile, Richard composed Genus en Prix. That's right, he wrote his own little song about it, a song that expressed his feelings of abandonment, addressed to his half-sister Marie. Pope Celestine III, considering the detention of a crusader contrary to public law, decided to excommunicate Leopold. And this was a big deal, by the way. If you got excommunicated, your people were very displeased with you. Richard was later transferred to Trefell's castle, under the custody of the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry the Sixth. I know there's a lot of Henrys, just bear with me. Who was aggrieved by Richard's support for Henry the Lion's family and his recognition of Tancred in Sicily. Henry demanded an exorbitant sum, a big ransom set at 150,000 marks, 
and that was equivalent to two or three times the annual income of the English crown under Richard. Eleanor of Aquitaine, Richard's mother, tirelessly worked to raise the ransom. Leopold proposed a marriage between his heir Frederick and Eleanor, fair maid of Brittany, niece of Richard, as part of the ransom negotiation. Clergy and laymen were heavily taxed, church treasures were confiscated, and additional funds were raised from taxes wherever they could get them. Despite John and King Philip of France offering a ransom to prolong Richard's captivity, the money was eventually raised, and Richard was released on the 4th of February 1194. Philip sent a warning to John upon Richard's release, indicating that the devil is loose. Additionally, pressure from the Pope compelled Frederick to abandon the marriage plan with Eleanor after Leopold's sudden death. Now, during Richard's absence, his brother John had rebelled with the support of Philip II of France, who successfully conquered Normandy, among other territories, during Richard's imprisonment. However, upon Richard's return, he forgave John, and reaffirmed him as his heir, instead of their new nephew, Arthur. To nullify the shame of his captivity, Richard underwent a second coronation ceremony at Winchester, on 11th of March, 1194. After this, he immediately initiated the reconquest of Normandy, focusing on building a new stronghold to defend the duchy and serve as a base for his campaign. Despite the terms of the Treaty of Louviers prohibiting fortifications, Richard embarked on the construction of the formidable Chateau Gaillard. The Archbishop of Rouen, initially reluctant to sell the necessary land, eventually acquiesced after Richard seized the property amid opposition from the church. Construction of Chateau Gaillard, although costly, proceeded swiftly under Richard's personal supervision. Its innovative design and efficient construction made it one of the finest castles in Europe, Richard made the chateau his favoured residence, evident in official documents bearing its name. Determined to resist Philip's expansionist ambitions, Richard formed alliances and waged war against him. Despite Philip's military successes, Richard secured victories at battles like Fret de Val in 1194, and Gisors in 1198, where he adopted the motto, God and my right, which later became the motto of the British monarchy. In March 1199, Richard found himself in Limousin, quelling a revolt led by Viscount Aymar V of Limoges. Despite it being Lent, Richard mercilessly ravaged the Viscount's land in a campaign marked by fire and sword. He then turned his attention to the insignificant castle of Chalus Chabrol, which some chroniclers suggest was due to rumours of a hidden treasure trove of Roman gold. On the 6th of March, 1199, tragedy struck as Richard was struck in the shoulder by a crossbow bolt during the siege. The wound quickly turned gangrenous, sealing Richard's fate. There was nothing they could do about it. Desiring to confront his assailant, Richard learned that the crossbowman was a youth seeking revenge for Richard's prior action against his family. Remarkably, Richard 
forgave the boy and granted him freedom, showing a final act of mercy before his death on the 6th of April, 1199, in the presence of his mother. Richard's death marked the end of an era, earning him the posthumous epithet, The Lion by the Ant. His remains were then divided, with his heart interred in Rowan, his entrails in Chalos, and the rest of his body laid to rest beside his father in Fontevraud Abbey. In 2012, analysis of Richard's embalmed heart revealed symbolic substances, including frankincense. In the years following his death, Bishop Henry Sandford claimed to have witnessed Richard's ascent to heaven in a vision, suggesting his purification in purgatory. With no legitimate heirs, Richard's brother John succeeded him as king. Although his French territories initially favoured his nephew Arthur, Richard's passing without direct heir marked the beginning of the decline of the Angevin Empire. Baldwin the Fourth, the Leper King, the formidable noble that led his army into the glory of the chaotic era of the Crusades. Born in the kingdom of Jerusalem, this grand strategist was bound for the battlefield, etching his name onto the pages of history forever. Despite his crippling leprosy, his soldiers rallied around their king, in a time where the cross made its valiant stand against the crescent. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. If you're coming back, it's good to see you again. And if you'd like to support the channel, hop on over to the Patreon and take a look. Otherwise, if you're inclined to do so, like, comment and subscribe, and we can get on to our topic for today, Baldwin the Fourth. In the middle of the year 1161, a future king was born into a world of nobility and strife. His father, Amalric, held the titles of Count of Jaffa and Ascalon, and his mother was Agnes of Cordenay. This child, Baldwin, was welcomed into the fold of royalty with his uncle, King Baldwin III, humorously bestowing upon him the grandiose gift of the Kingdom of Jerusalem at his christening. This jest reflected the unlikely prospect of Baldwin's rise to the throne, as King Baldwin III was young and newly wed, presumably poised to have heirs of his own. However, fate had other plans, and by 1163 the king passed away, without leaving behind any children, propelling Amalric closer to kingship. The path to the throne was, of course, fraught with obstacles, notably due to the kingdom's nobility's disdain for Agnes, Baldwin's mother, they viewed her potential influence with suspicion and general distaste, ultimately coercing Amalric into annulling his marriage on claims of being too closely related by blood. Despite this, Amalric managed to secure the legitimacy of his children, Sibylla and Baldwin, ensuring their place in the line of succession. Baldwin's childhood was marked by absence. His mother remarried and slowly drifted away from his life, and he rarely saw his sister Sibylla, who at this time had been taken away to be raised in a convent. 
when Baldwin was six years old, his father remarried, bringing Maria Komnen as a stepmother into his life. This new queen, ambitious and calculating, likely saw the young prince as a hurdle to her own offspring's prospects. Amidst these familial complexities, Baldwin's upbringing was distinctly noble, characterized by the martial and cultural education fitting for someone of his noble status. He was especially tutored by William of Tyre, a renowned cleric known for his wisdom and worldly knowledge. Under William's guidance, Baldwin displayed an unusual stoicism and a remarkable knack for learning. Despite facing a mysterious ailment at this time that rendered his right arm insensate. Despite the looming shadow of illness, Baldwin grew into a young man of determination and optimism. He inherited his father's charismatic presence and was quick to learn, albeit with a stutter, but that never dampened his spirit. He showed a keen interest in history and tales of the old world, with an exceptional memory that held both grudges and gratitude alike. But, of course, the elephant in the room could not be ignored. The spectre of Baldwin's potential leprosy loomed large, influencing his father's decisions regarding the future of the kingdom. Amalric sought to secure the realm's future by arranging a marriage for Sibylla, Baldwin's sister, with the French Count Stephen I of saint -Gerais envisioning a regency that would safeguard the kingdom in the event of his early demise. However, this plan was disrupted by Amalric's untimely death from dysentery in the July of 1174, leaving Baldwin as the young heir to a kingdom encircled by adversaries and riddled with internal dissent. This narrative not only charts the early years of Baldwin's life, but also encapsulates the tumultuous era of the Crusader states, surrounded by a mosaic of cultures and religions, with the Kingdom of Jerusalem at its beating heart. Baldwin's story is one of a young prince, navigating the complexities of a royal succession, familial dynamics, and a debilitating condition. All set against the backdrop of the medieval Levant's political and military intrigues. Following the death of Amalric, the destiny of the Kingdom of Jerusalem hung in a delicate balance. The High Court, the Kingdom's assembly of nobles and clergy, gathered to ponder over succession to the throne. Despite no formal diagnosis at the time, whispers, concerns, and a good deal of raised eyebrows regarding young Baldwin's health began to circulate fueled by the royal physician's suspicions that he may indeed have contracted leprosy. The kingdom faced a dire lack of male successors, and Baldwin was the only son of Amalric. Though the king had daughters from his second marriage, only Isabella had survived infancy. While the laws did not really bar women from ascending to the throne, the only other female heirs, Sibylla and the toddler Isabella, were simply considered unsuitable due to their ages and marital statuses. 
particularly since the latter was about four years old. Can't really have a four-year-old king or queen in a tumultuous crusader state. Now, the potential male heirs to the throne, all cousins of Amalric, were deemed politically incompatible for various regions. Prince Bohemond III of Antioch was preoccupied with his own dominion far to the north. Baldwin of Antioch served the Byzantine Emperor Manuel I Komnenos, and Raymond III of Tripoli was virtually a foreigner to the king's barons, having spent the last nine years in Muslim captivity. Well, after three days of intense deliberation, the High Court arrived at a consensus. Baldwin the Fourth, despite the looming shadow of his illness, was named King. This decision carried an implicit understanding a suitable husband would be sought for Sibylla to ensure the succession should Baldwin the Fourth's health deteriorate. The coronation of Baldwin was conducted with an urgency that broke from the established traditions. Rather than waiting for a Sunday, as was customary for crowning medieval rulers, Baldwin was crowned on the 15th of July, 1174, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This date was symbolically chosen to coincide with the 75th anniversary of the First Crusade's capture of Jerusalem, imbuing Baldwin's ascension with a sense of historical continuity and a sprinkling of divine favor. This moment marked the beginning of a new chapter for the young king and his embattled kingdom set against the backdrop of the crusader state's perpetual struggle for survival in the Holy Land. Now, until the interim until Baldwin reached the age of majority, the kingdom's stewardship fell to a series of regents, beginning with Miles of Blancy and transitioning to Count Raymond III of Tripoli, a closer kinsman to Baldwin. The period was marred, of course, by intrigue and violence, including the murder of Miles. Baldwin, despite his youth and deteriorating health, found himself shouldering the responsibilities of his station, especially in the regent's absence. The return of Baldwin's mother Agnes, to court during Raymond's regency, marked a significant turn in the young king's personal life. Historians and contemporary sources, particularly William of Tyre, have cast Agnes in a contentious light. Yet her rekindled relationship with Baldwin evolved into one of genuine affection and mutual support. Well, glad that his mother was back there, because he was about to need her. As Baldwin's condition began to progress, the fears of his leprosy were more or less confirmed, and the urgency to secure the royal lineage was intensified. This led to strategic marital arrangements for his sister Sibylla, aiming to strengthen ties with influential European nobility and ensure the kingdom's overall stability. On the momentous day of 15th of July, 1176, marking two years since his coronation, Baldwin IV stepped into adulthood and officially took the reins of the Kingdom of Jerusalem thereby concluding Raymond's term as a regent. With the guidance of his mother, 
Baldwin appointed his maternal uncle, Jocelyn of Courtenay, as Seneschal, a move that not only solidified familial alliances through Jocelyn's marriage to Agnes and Milly, but also signified a strategic shift in the kingdom's governance and foreign policy, especially towards the Egyptian ruler, Saladin. We'll get back to him later. Now, under Baldwin's leadership, a proactive stance replaced Raymond's more cautious diplomacy. Rejecting a peace treaty with Saladin, Baldwin aligned with Jocelyn's perspective that the Sultan's expanding influence posed a threat necessitating containment. This period marked Baldwin's foray into direct military engagement, demonstrating remarkable personal courage, along with tactical acumen, despite his obvious physical limitations. Notably during a raid around Damascus and an intervention in Saladin's conflict with the Order of Assassins in the Bekaa Valley. Amidst these military endeavours, the kingdom's political landscape was also in flux. The marriage of William of Montferrat to Baldwin's sister Sibylla, despite noble descent, underscored the precarious balance of power and the complex interplay of local and foreign interests. Baldwin's proposal to resign the throne, although declined by William, illustrated the young king's dedication to the realm's stability over his personal ambition. The campaign against Egypt necessitated internal alliances, leading Baldwin to dispatch Reynald of Châtillon on a diplomatic mission to Emperor Manuel in Constantinople. The successful negotiation for Byzantine support in exchange for the significant concessions highlighted Baldwin's strategic foresight, but also set the stage for future complexities, including Reynald's marriage to Stephanie of Milly, and the unfortunate passing of William of Montferrat from malaria. As Baldwin continued to contend with his own health issues, and the loss of key figures. His decision-making in military and governmental appointments, such as entrusting Reynald over the Count of Tripoli, revealed his adeptness at navigating the kingdom's internal politics, along with its external threats. Despite setbacks, including the withdrawal of Byzantine support due to the fractious behavior of European allies, Baldwin's tenure was characterized by an unwavering commitment to the Crusader state's survival and prosperity, marked by efforts to maintain alliances and seek new avenues for support, even in the face of debilitating illness and the complexities of medieval geopolitics. In the latter part of 1177, with the Frankish forces extended into northern Syria, Saladin perceived a strategic opening to advance into Baldwin's realm. Despite still grappling with the aftermath of malaria, Baldwin's resolve to confront Saladin showcased his indomitable spirit. As Saladin moved closer, Baldwin's initial defensive manoeuvre in Ascalon demonstrated both desperation and strategic cunning, culminating in an unexpected counter-attack against Saladin's forces at Monte Gassard. This battle, marked by Baldwin's leadership from the very front lines, resulted in a significant victory for the young king defying all odds and against a very numerically superior enemy. Saladin was embarrassed. However, 
Baldwin's strategic challenges were far, far from over. His decision to reinforce the kingdom's defences by initiating the construction of Chastellet, despite previous commitments not to fortify that section of the border, illustrated a pragmatic approach to security, underscored by rejecting Saladin's monetary offer to halt construction. Furthermore, Baldwin's diplomatic engagement, as seen in the hosting of Michael the Syrian, underscored a broader strategy of consolidating support within the broader region. The ongoing conflict with Saladin continued to test Baldwin's military acumen and physical resilience. Encounters in 1179, from ambushes, all the way to direct confrontations, highlighted the constant threats at the kingdom's borders and the personal risks that Baldwin was constantly facing. The loss of key figures, like Humphrey II of Toron, and the physical limitations imposed by his illness underscored the harsh realities of leadership in such turbulent times. The siege and eventual fall of Le Chastelet to Saladin's forces, despite Baldwin's effort to rally support, marked a setback in the continuous struggle for dominance in the region. Yet through these adversaries, Baldwin's reign was characterized by his relentless determination setting a president of leadership amidst the complex and precarious landscape of the Crusader states. As the year 1177 drew to a close, the Kingdom of Jerusalem navigated through a series of pivotal events under Baldwin's rule. Following his sister Sibylla's widowhood, the kingdom entered a period of mourning that culminated in the strategic consideration of her remarriage, a matter of state importance given her position as the king's heir presumptive. Despite the interest from Baldwin of Ibelin, the king looked elsewhere, balancing court politics by permitting Balian of Ibelin to marry Queen Maria thus avoiding conflict with the influential Ibelin family. In a significant move to secure the kingdom's future, Baldwin began to publicly associate Sibylla with acts of governance, subtly signalling her status as his successor. Baldwin sought a strong ally in marriage for Sibylla, reaching out to the King of France with candid reflections on his condition and the kingdom's vulnerability. The political landscape intensified in 1180, when prominent lords from Antioch and Tripoli appeared poised to challenge Baldwin's decisions regarding Sibylla's future. In a decisive counter-move, Baldwin arranged her marriage to Guy of Lusignan, a choice that sidelined the ambitions of Baldwin of Ibelin and maintained the king's autonomy in governance. Baldwin's reign was characterized by such internal divisions within his court, contrasting the traditional, cautious approach of native barons and the hospitallers with more aggressive stance on Western newcomers and the Templars. Despite historiographical debates over the nature and origins of these factions, the period following Sibylla's marriage to Guy saw the king navigating these complexities, ultimately leaning towards his maternal relatives and allies. In a bid for peace along the ongoing conflicts and his deteriorating health. Baldwin, 
sought a truce with Saladin, allowing both sides to refocus their efforts elsewhere. This period also saw Baldwin reinforcing his domestic position by securing strategic marital alliances for his siblings, notably arranging for his half-sister Isabella's betrothal to Humphrey IV of Duron, further entrenching his political strategy and safeguarding the kingdom's future. During the period of truce with Saladin, Baldwin astutely consolidated the power of his maternal relatives, enhancing their positions through strategic grants and publicly aligning with Guy and Sibylla, reinforcing his domestic support network. However, the king's relationship with Raymond of Tripoli remained strained, fueled by suspicions of conspiracy and potential challenges to his authority. This tension reached a peak when Baldwin contemplated charging Raymond with treason over the Principality of Galilee, but was persuaded by the High Court to seek reconciliation instead, highlighting a delicate balance between power and influence within the kingdom. The ceasefire with Saladin, a crucial respite for the kingdom, was prematurely disrupted by Renaud's aggressive actions against a merchant caravan, setting the stage for renewed hostilities. As Saladin poised to extend his dominion into Aleppo, Baldwin faced the challenge head on opposing Saladin's ambitions and demonstrating a steadfast commitment to safeguarding the Crusader state's interests. The ensuing military campaigns underscored Baldwin's tactical acumen. Despite his leprosy continuing to get worse and worse, he led his forces to significant victories, such as the Battle of La Forbele and the relief of Beirut from Saladin's siege. These successes were not only testament to Baldwin's strategic vision, but also to the loyalty and respect he commanded among his troops and allies, including the crucial support from the Italian maritime republics. As Saladin shifted his focus northward, Baldwin seized the opportunity to press into Damascus territory, showcasing his relentless pursuit of securing the kingdom's borders and asserting its presence in the region. The king's decision-making during these campaigns reflected a nuanced understanding of the politics of the time, balancing military aggression with diplomatic consideration. He took a cautious approach towards Damascus. As Baldwin's health deteriorated significantly by 1183, leaving him unable to walk or even use his hands, and eventually leading to blindness due to corneal drying from an inability to blink, his resilience in the face of adversary continued to define his reign. Nothing stops him. Despite this incapacitating condition, he remained undimmed, particularly evident when he was forced to confront yet another military challenge posed by Saladin's movements southward after the latter's conquest of Aleppo in June. In response to this looming threat, and while battling a life-threatening fever, Baldwin displayed his unwavering commitment by summoning the High Court to his bedside at Nazareth. In a pivotal decision, he entrusted the regency to his brother-in-law, Guy of Lusignan, effectively making Guy the steward of the kingdom, while retaining the royal title and direct control over Jerusalem himself. 
This arrangement was underscored by Baldwin's insistence that Guy neither crown himself king nor divest any part of the royal domain during Baldwin's lifetime. Reflecting a deep consideration for the kingdom's future, and the delicate balance of power within. However, the transition was anything but smooth. Guy's lack of military experience, and the resultant refusal of cooperation by the kingdom's most powerful lords and military orders, underscored the challenges of leadership and legitimacy. Baldwin's subsequent recovery and return to Jerusalem highlighted the complex interplay between personal health, political power, and the strategic imperative of ruling a crusader state. The siege of Kerak, coinciding with the wedding of Baldwin's half-sister Isabella and Humphrey of Toron, presented a critical military and familial crisis. Baldwin's decisive action to dismiss Guy from the Regency, in the light of the siege, underscored not only the political fallout from Guy's perceived incompetence, but also Baldwin's deep personal involvement in the defense and governance of his realm. Leprosy or not, Blindness or not, he was going to protect his kingdom, no matter the cost. The crowning of Baldwin's nephew, also creatively named Baldwin, as co-king, marked a strategic move to secure the succession and the future of the kingdom. Even as Baldwin IV continued to lead and inspire his troops, exemplifying his role as a unifying figure. The lifting of the siege of Karak, with Saladin's withdrawal upon hearing of Baldwin's approach, not only underscored the king's enduring influence, but symbolized a moment of triumph and unity for the beleaguered kingdom, even as the shadows of Baldwin's reign began to draw to a close. In his final years, Baldwin faced even more complex challenges concerning the regency for his young nephew, a dilemma that was only intensified by his determination to exclude Guy of Lusignan, Sibylla's husband, from claiming it. He'd already proved that he couldn't handle the job. Baldwin contemplated annulment of their marriage as a strategy to preempt Guy's regency. Engaging in discussions with Patriarch Heraclius about potentially declaring their marriage unlawful on the grounds of coercion. However, Sibylla stood by her husband. Her staunch support for Guy thwarted Baldwin's plans, highlighting deep personal loyalties that complicated the politics in the kingdom. Their marriage was not something to be bought and sold. At least, Sibylla would not allow that. Baldwin's resolve to assert his authority over Guy led to a dramatic confrontation at Ascalon. When Guy repeatedly excused himself from answering Baldwin's summons due to his ill health, and ultimately refused the king entry into the city, it was a blatant challenge to Baldwin's authority. The scene of Baldwin, physically weakened, but still determined, being denied entry at the gates of Ascalon before the eyes of its inhabitants underscore the intense personal and political strife that had now gripped the kingdom. Baldwin's subsequent actions in Jaffa and Arker, aimed at curtailing Guy's power, revealed the depths of the conflict between royal authority and noble autonomy. The Crisis 
reached a peak during the council in Arker, where Baldwin sought support for punitive measures against Guy. The intervention of the Patriarch and the Grand Masters, advocating for forgiveness to prevent civil war, highlighted the kingdom's internal divisions. The council's refusal to support Baldwin's proposed actions against Guy, influenced by the ecclesiastical and military leader's departure, marked a significant moment of political isolation for the king. Reconciliation with the Patriarch and the Grand Masters by June of the same year, coupled with the diplomatic mission to Europe for aid, indicated Baldwin's capacity to navigate through the kingdom's internal division, always for its greater good. The repeated sieges at Kerak by Saladin and Baldwin's responses showcased further the king's relentless commitment to defending his realm, even after his physical condition continued to worsen. Most men at this point would have fell down and given up, but not Baldwin. His efforts to repair and fortify Kerak after Saladin's withdrawal reflected not only his strategic focus on defense, but also his personal investment in the well-being of his subjects. In the waning months of 1184, Baldwin was confronted with the grievous news of Guy of Lusignan's brutal action against the Bedouin of Darum, a group who was under royal protection that had been instrumental in providing intelligence on Egyptian movements. This act not only violated the established protection of these groups that was enjoyed under royal edict, but also threatened the intelligence network that was critical for the kingdom's security. Guy had proved again how he was not the guy for the job. No pun intended. Actually, pun intended. Well, this event left Baldwin deeply troubled, contributing to a fever that marked the beginning of his final decline. Well, as he returned to Jerusalem, he could feel it. His health was worsening, and he found himself making a decision that would have once seemed unthinkable. Appointing Raymond of Tripoli as regent. Despite a history of distrust and political rivalry, Baldwin recognized Raymond as the only viable option to ensure the kingdom's governance and the protection of his young nephew, Baldwin V. His final act was to summon the High Court officially to appoint Raymond as the permanent regent for Baldwin V, ensuring a seamless transition of power and governance. He also mandated that homage be paid by both the young king and Raymond as regent, culminating in a crown-wearing ceremony at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. These actions further highlight his meticulous planning for the kingdom's future, even as he stared in the face of his own mortality. Baldwin IV's death in early 1185 marked the end of a reign that was characterized by remarkable resilience in the face of personal illness and a kingdom under constant threat. He was respectfully laid to rest in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, near his father, symbolizing a lineage of kingship that had navigated a complex and often perilous landscape. His passing ushered in a brief period of rule by his nephew Baldwin V, before the succession passed to Sibylla, and then unfortunately to Guy. 
setting the stage for the dramatic events that would lead to the kingdom's downfall following the Battle of Hattin. I don't want to blame Guy for it, but I'm going to blame Guy for it anyway. The subsequent loss of Jerusalem to Saladin in 1187, and the deaths of Sibylla and her daughters in 1190, left Isabella I as the sole heir to a kingdom greatly diminished. The legacy of Baldwin's reign, though marked by military and political strife, also reflects a profound dedication to the ideals and the survival of the kingdom of Jerusalem, even in the face of these insurmountable odds. So what happened next? Well, the aftermath of Baldwin's reign, culminating in the Christian defeat at Hattin, indeed cast a shadow over his legacy, prompting historians to delve into the complexities and discord of his time on the throne. However, remember this, it's critical to recognize that under Baldwin's leadership, the Kingdom of Jerusalem not only maintained its territorial integrity, but experienced economic growth and spiritual enrichment. Baldwin's strategic foresight in countering Saladin's ambitions, his careful selection of ministers, and let's not forget his delegation of ecclesiastical patronage and financial management to trusted family members, it all came together to mark a diligent governance and a pure commitment to the kingdom's welfare. His decision not to abdicate until a suitable successor was in place, despite immense personal toll of his illness, exemplified his dedication to the continuity and unity of the kingdom. All of this resolve was instrumental in preserving the fragile peace and cohesion within the realm during these chaotic and tumultuous times. The contrasting perspectives on leprosy during Baldwin's era, from Pope Alexander III's harsh judgment to a more compassionate Christian viewpoint that saw Christ in those afflicted, reflect the broader societal debates of the time. Baldwin's reign, in turn, played a role in gradually shifting attitudes towards leprosy within the kingdom, showcasing a remarkable level of acceptance and support from his subjects, despite the prevalent stigmas. You imagine all those young kids out there with leprosy finally having someone to look up to, finally having a role model. If the king can have this, look just like me, and be so respected, well, maybe I can make something of myself too. His personal virtues, particularly his chastity and martial success against Saladin, not only bolstered his public image, but were also seen as manifestations of divine favor. The legacy of Baldwin is a testament to the multifaceted nature of leadership during the Crusades, where personal adversity, political acumen and spiritual convictions intersected to shape the course of history. His tenure as king marked by courage, honor, and deep commitment to his realm. Well, it all remains a compelling chapter in the narrative of the Crusader states, offering valuable insights into the challenges and triumphs of medieval kingship. Perhaps there's a lot that we can learn from Baldwin. I know that I certainly have, and I hope you have too because now we reach the end of our video. No doubt you will hear more about Baldwin in my subsequent videos on the Crusades, which are coming soon. I've also made videos on Saladin 
and Richard the Lionheart, and some other figures are on the list of this time. Attila the Hun, often referred to as the Scourge of God, was a fearsome figure who dominated the nightmares of Europeans during the 5th century AD. As one of the most infamous barbarian leaders of ancient history, Attila's relentless campaigns and ferocious reputation left a permanent mark on the annals of warfare. Would you like to know all about him? Well, that's what we're here to do today. Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's very good to meet you. And if you are a returning viewer, it's great to have you back. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, you may follow the links to the Patreon in the comments and description. Otherwise, if you feel inclined to like, comment and subscribe, that also helps. Now, without further ado, let's get on to our topic today. Firstly, a brief note on the Huns in general, and then the life of Attila. The Huns, a formidable group of Eurasian nomads, emerged from the eastern regions beyond the Volga River around the year 370 CE, embarking on a migration westward that would ultimately lead to the establishment of a vast empire in the western Europe. Masters of mounted archery and javelin throwing, the Huns were renowned for their military prowess and formidable cavalry tactics. While they were in the process of developing settlements prior to their westward migration, the Huns remained primarily a society of pastoral warrior nomads, sustaining themselves primarily through products of their herds, such as their meat and milk. The precise origin and linguistic affiliations of the Huns have long been subjects of scholarly debate. Some theories suggest that their leaders, at least, may have spoken a Turkic branch of language, possibly akin to the modern Chuvash language. However, the Huns' ethnic composition is believed to have been a complex amalgamation of Central Asian Turkic Mongolic and Ugric elements, particularly among those who migrated westward. If you want to know all about the Huns before Attila, then go and look at my video on the history of the Huns before Attila especially. It's well worth it. But now let's get on to the man of the hour. Attila the most renowned leader of the Huns, hailed from a noble lineage within the Hunnic hierarchy. His father, Munzuk, was the brother of kings Oktar and Ruga, who jointly ruled over the Hunnic Empire in the early 5th century. The structure of Diarchy, with multiple rulers, was a recurring feature among the Huns, Although historians remain uncertain about its institutionalization. Now, what about Attila's date of birth? Well, that in itself is a matter of conjecture. There's various proposals ranging from the 390s to perhaps the early 400s. While some historians suggest a birth date around 395, or perhaps 406, the precise timing remains elusive, which makes things a little difficult for us, but just allow it to add to the mysterious allure of this figure. Let's put it that way. Now what about Attila's upbringing? Well, it was mainly steeped in the dynamics of his era, of course. He was certainly a product of his culture, an environment. He wasn't really breaking the mold when it comes to what a Hun is generally like. 
Well, as the Huns had established their dominance in Europe, their nomadic lifestyle and military prowess reshaped the politics. Their swift expansion, marked by their conquest of territories belonging to the Alans and their incursions into the Gothic kingdom, underscored their formidable presence. And it was among this where Attila was growing up, on the move, going into new mysterious lands. Certainly a interesting experience for a young lad, and it makes you wonder with some speculation what Attila would have seen along that route into the new adventure. Well, within the Hunnic society, Attila would have been exposed to a culture deeply rooted in pastoralism and warfare. The Huns were renowned for their expertise in mounted archery and javelin, skills that were integral to their nomadic way of life, and often practiced from a young age. Their primary sustenance came from the meat and milk the products derived from their herds, emphasizing their dependence on animal husbandry for survival. So, as a young boy growing up among the Huns, those would have been the main activities. If you weren't practicing your horse riding, archery or javelin throwing skills, you would be milking the cows, or shearing the sheep, or perhaps preparing the sheep for a dinner with them as the main cause. Well, meanwhile, the Huns' interactions with neighboring peoples, particularly the Germanic tribes, catalyzed significant migrations and political shifts. This influx of Gothic refugees that had been pushed out by the Hunnic incursions into the Roman Empire only highlights the disruptive impact of the Huns' expansion, effectively showing up and saying, well, it's our land now. You get out. And they did. Moreover, the fragmentation of the Roman Empire into western and eastern halves, each grappling with their own problems, internal and external, added a further layer of complexity to this whole picture. Well, despite the tensions and conflicts that characterize their relationship, the Huns and Romans engaged in a pragmatic, yet ambiguous alliance. While the Romans viewed the Huns as both adversaries and potential allies, the Huns leveraged their military might to exact tribute and secure advantageous agreements. This intricate web of diplomacy and military strategy shaped the power dynamics between the two entities. By the time Attila reached adulthood, the Huns had emerged as a dominant force, wielding influence over a vast territory, and along with that, a diverse array of peoples. Now, that includes their own people, and the people who just became a part of the Huns along the way. His uncle Ruger's reign marked a pivotal period of consolidation and expansion for the Huns, setting the stage for Attila's ascent to power and his subsequent impact on the course of history. The death of Rugila in 434 marked a more significant transition in the leadership of the Hun tribes, leaving his nephews, Bleda and Attila, at the helm. Now remember, this wasn't really like a empire, so to speak. Think of it as more of a confederation. 
Their accession coincided with negotiations with the Eastern Roman Empire regarding the return of renegades who had sought refuge within its borders. Potentially this indicates some internal dissent within the Hunnic leadership. Potentially. Well, either way, regardless of the situation, in the subsequent year Attila and Bleda engaged in diplomatic talks with imperial representatives at Margus, showcasing their equestrian prowess and negotiating on a treaty that was somewhat advantageous to the Huns. You see, the Romans at this point were really in no bargaining position. The 4th and 5th centuries for the Romans were not ideal, to say the least. Therefore, the Romans agreed to various concessions, including the return of fugitives, a substantial increase in tribute, and the opening of markets to Hunnic traders. In return, the Huns received concessions, such as a ransom for Roman prisoners, and reinforced their borders, perhaps aiming to consolidate their dominion over the great Hungarian plain. Following the treaty, the Huns temporarily withdrew from Roman territory, allowing the Eastern Roman Emperor Theodosius II to further fortify Constantinople and bolster defences along the Danube. During this period, the Huns directed their attention towards the Sassanid Empire, launching an invasion but ultimately facing defeat in Armenia. Subsequently, they redirected their focus back to Europe. In 1140, the Huns re-emerged with a significant force along the borders of the Roman Empire, disrupting the established market on the north bank of the Danube, which had been established as part of the earlier treaty. This marked a resumption of hostilities and incursions into Roman territory, signalling the continuation of the complex and often contentious relationship between the Huns and the Romans. Oh, and by the way, some thirty years before, Rome had been sacked by the Visigoths, and it was uh, quite an embarrassment for them. The Visigoths were actually pushed to doing this by the politics of the time, as the Huns had pushed them out and into the Roman territories, where they were treated as perhaps not second-class citizens, but maybe third class. This led them to get some much-needed payback on the Romans. But that's for the Visigoths' video. Well, in their devastating campaign, the Huns crossed the Danube and launched attacks, brutal attacks, on various cities and forts along the banks including Viminacium in Moesia. Their onslaught commenced at Margus, where they demanded the surrender of a bishop who had allegedly withheld property that was claimed by Attila. As the Romans deliberated the bishop's fate, he covertly defected to the Huns and facilitated the betrayal of the city. Concurrently, the Vandals, under the leadership of Gaiseric, seized control of the western Roman province of Africa, including the pivotal city of Carthage. This conquest posed a significant blow to the Western Empire, as Africa was not only its wealthiest province, but also a vital source of sustenance for Rome. Every day, Boats and ships would be carrying forth grain and all sorts of other foodstuffs from Africa, particularly Egypt as well. It was essentially becoming the breadbasket of the empire. Losing this, well, people were about to go on a very 
serious diet plan. Additionally, it didn't help that the Sassanid Shah Yazdegerd II launched an invasion of Armenia in 441. Well, don't count the Romans out quite yet. In response to these threats, the Romans redirected forces from the Balkans to Sicily for an expedition against the Vandals, leaving a vulnerable pathway for the Huns to penetrate Illyricum and invade the Balkans in 441. The Hunnic forces sacked Margus, Vivinacium, and Signidinum, modern-day Belgrade, along with Sirmium, inflicting widespread destruction and upheaval. During 442, Emperor Theodosius recalled troops from Sicily and initiated a significant minting of new coins to finance operations against the Huns. Despite Attila and Bleto's demands, Theodosius remained resolute in his belief that he could withstand the Huns' onslaught, and therefore he rejected their ultimatums, setting the stage for future confrontations. Well, in response to Theodosius' refusal to comply with their demands, Attila launched a formidable campaign in 443, employing advanced siege tactics never before witnessed by the Romans. Equipped with battering rams and rolling siege towers, the Huns successfully assaulted the strategic strongholds of Ratiara and Naissus, mercilessly slaughtering the inhabitants and leaving the cities desolate. Along the Nisafa River, the Hunnic forces swiftly captured Sofia and Plovdiv, also Lulebergas, these are the modern names of the city, being Sertica, Philippopolis and Arcadiopolis, respectively. Despite encountering and defeating a Roman army outside of Constantinople, they were thwarted by the formidable double walls of the eastern capital. That's right, double walls. Another Roman army was vanquished near Callipolis, which is modern-day Gelibolu. Simply unable to mount an effective resistance, Theodosius admitted defeat and dispatched Anatolius, the Magister Militum por Orientum, to negotiate peace terms with the Huns. The resulting treaty imposed even harsher conditions than before. The emperor agreed to pay a punitive sum of 6,000 Roman pounds of gold for disobeying the terms of the previous treaty during the invasion. Furthermore, the annual tribute to the Huns was not doubled, but tripled, reaching 2,100 Roman pounds of gold, and the ransom for each Roman prisoner surged to 12 solidi. With their demands satisfied, Attila and Bledo withdrew to the heart of their empire, Following the Huns' retreat from Byzantium, Bleda, however, passed away, likely around 445, leaving Attila to ascend to the sole rulership. In 447, Attila once again led his forces southward into the eastern Roman Empire, crossing through Moesia. The Roman army, commanded by the Gothic Magister Militum, Arnegisclus, confronted Attila's forces in the Battle of Utus. Although the Romans fought valiantly and inflicted severe casualties upon the Huns, they were ultimately defeated, allowing the Huns to advance more or less unchecked throughout the Balkans, and they reached as far as Thermopylae, that was the site of the famous battle of the 300 versus the Persians. The city of Constantinople itself was spared from the ravages of the Huns, 
thanks to the efforts of the Isauran troops led by Magister Militum Zeno. Prefect Constantinus played a crucial role in organizing the reconstruction of the city's damaged walls, which had been weakened not by attacks, but by earthquakes. In some areas, new fortifications were erected in front of the existing walls to bolster the city's defenses. The devastation wrought by the Huns in other areas was immense, with over a hundred cities falling to their onslaught. Constantinople narrowly escaped being besieged, but the surrounding regions, well, they suffered greatly. The accounts of Callinicus in his life of St. Hippatius vividly describe the chaos and carnage unleashed by Attila and the Huns, with widespread massacres and the desecration of churches and monasteries, resulting in an untold loss of life and suffering among the populace. And you bet I'm going to read it. So this is what he said from Callinicus's Life of St. Hippatius. The barbarian nation of the Huns, which was in Thrace, became so great that more than one hundred cities were captured, and Constantinople almost came into danger, and most men fled from it. There were so many murders and bloodlettings that the dead could not be numbered. Aye, for they took captive the churches and monasteries, and slew the monks and the maidens in great numbers. Eesh. Not a good time to be around. Well, with all of that unpleasantry out of the way, in 450 Attila set his sights on expanding his dominion by targeting the Visigothic kingdom of Toulouse. To bolster his forces, he sought to forge an alliance with Emperor Valentinian III of the Western Roman Empire. Now do remember, at this point, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire were quite different things politically, with their own interests and their own friends and enemies. Well, Attila had enjoyed a more or less cordial relationship with the Western Roman Empire and its influential general, Flavius Aetius. Aetius, who had briefly sought refuge among the Huns in 433, had earned Attila's favour through his military exploits against the Goths and the Bagaude, leading to his appointment as Magister Militum in the West. The diplomatic manoeuvrings of Geyseric, the king of the Vandals, who would also oppose the Visigoths, may have also played a role in Attila's decision to target Toulouse especially. However, it didn't quite go to plan. An unexpected twist emerged with the involvement of Valentinian's sister, Honoria. In the spring of 450, Honoria, discontent with her arranged marriage, sent Attila a plea for help along with her engagement ring. Although her intentions may not have been romantic, Attila interpreted the gesture as a marriage proposal, and seized the opportunity to expand his influence. Upon learning of Honoria's actions, Valentinian was understandably outraged. However, he was persuaded by his mother, Galla Placidia, to spare Honoria's life and instead simply exile her. Valentinian vehemently denied the legitimacy of the supposed marriage proposal and sent a message to Attila refuting the claim. Well, in response to this, Attila dispatched an emissary to Ravenna to assert Honoria's innocence 
affirm the validity of the proposal, and assert his intention to claim his supposed rights. <laughs> A lot of drama, isn't it? Well, amidst the succession struggle following the death of a Frankish ruler, Attila inserted himself into the political fray by backing the elder son, while old Flavius Aetius supported the younger. The specific identities of these kings remain uncertain, and are, of course, subject to conjecture. Either way, rallying his vassals, which included the Gepids, Ostrogoths, Herus, Scyrians, Thuringians, Alans, and many others, Attila commenced his march westward. In 451, he arrived in Belgica, at the head of an army famously exaggerated by Jordanes to half a million strong. This is indeed quite an exaggeration. It certainly makes for a good book, though, which is what I'm sure Jordanes was thinking. Beginning his campaign, Attila swiftly captured Metz and Strasbourg on April the 7th. Other cities also fell victim to his onslaught, as chronicled by a hagiographic VK, commentating on the deeds of their bishops. Nicasius was martyred before the altars of his church in Reims, while Servatus is credited with saving Tongeren through his prayers, akin to St. Genevieve's legendary defense of Paris. Talk about that in a different video for sure. Also, Lupus, the bishop of Troyes, reportedly confronted Attila in person and talked him out of destroying the entire city. Well, in response to Attila's advance, Aetius mastered troops from the Franks, Burgundians, and Celts to oppose him. Diplomatic missions led by Avitus sought to dissuade Attila from further aggression, while also securing an alliance with the Visigothic king Theodoric I. Together, the combined forces reached Orléans ahead of Attila, effectively halting the Hunnish advance. Aetius pursued Attila, engaging him in battle near Catalanum, modern-day chalons en champagne Attila, recognizing the strategic advantage of the plains for his cavalry, decided that it was in his best interest to confront the Romans and the Visigoths in open battle. And what a battle it was! The ensuing clash, known as the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, is widely regarded as a strategic victory for the Visigothic-Roman alliance. Theodoric actually perished in the fighting, and Aetius, perhaps fearing the consequences of either an overwhelming Visigothic triumph or a defeat, refrained from fully exploiting his advantage. Nonetheless, the outcome favoured the Romans. And this was coming at a good time, because the Romans needed some good news. Theodoric's death left the Huns in retreat, and the Romans emerged with the appearance of victory. In 452, Attila returned to Italy with the dual purpose of renewing his claim to marry Honoria, and asserting his dominance over the Western Roman Empire. Along his way, the army thought it would be a good idea to simply ravage the Italian countryside, and left a trail of destruction in their wake. The cities of Italy suffered greatly, with Aquilia being razed to the ground to such an extent that its original site became scarcely recognizable. 
The attacks led to the establishment of communities in what would later become Venice, as fleeing residents sought refuge on the small islands of the Venetian lagoon. Well, despite Attila's onslaught, Flavius Aetius, the Western Roman general, lacked the military strength to engage the Huns directly. Instead, he employed guerrilla tactics to harass and impede Attila's advance, relying on a mere shadow of force to slow the Hunnic onslaught. Attila's relentless march was eventually halted at the River Po, where his logistical challenges, including disease and starvation among his troops, hindered his further progress. Under Emperor Valentinian III, recognizing the gravity of the situation, dispatched three envoys, Gennadius Avienus, Trigetius, and Pope Leo I, to negotiate with Attila. The historic meeting took place near Mantua, at the Mincio River, where the envoys succeeded in persuading Attila to withdraw from Italy and engage in peace negotiations with the emperor. While Prosper of Aquitaine provides a brief account of the meeting, attributing its success solely to Pope Leo, other sources, such as Priscus, suggest that Attila's superstitious fear of suffering a fate similar to that of Alaric, who died shortly after sacking Rome in 410, may have influenced his decision to withdraw. A bit of superstition. Well, the year 451 was not a good one. It had already brought hardship to Italy in the form of a devastating famine, and the following year offered very little relief as crops continued to falter. Attila's ruthless invasion of the northern Italian plains in 452 only exaggerated these regions' woes, and it further diminished the hopes for a successful harvest. The logistical challenges of advancing on Rome were just too much for him, and capturing of it would have likely not alleviated Attila's own supply difficulties as there were plenty of them. Therefore, it was just simply more advantageous for Attila to seek peace. Well, adding to his predicament, an East Roman force led by another officer named Aetius had crossed the Danube and engaged with the Huns that were left behind to guard their territories. This additional threat, combined with the natural human pressures, compelled Attila to retreat from Italy. He never got past the Po River. He had Atheus, in his Chronica Minora, attributed the Huns' misfortunes to divine punishment, citing famine, disease, and defeat at the hands of Roman auxiliaries led by Aetius. Crushed both in their plundering endeavours in Italy and in their home settlements, the Huns ultimately sought peace with the Romans. After Emperor Marcion of the Eastern Roman Empire decided to stop paying tribute to the Huns, Attila retreated from Italy and returned to his palace situated across the Danube. Despite his withdrawal, he secretly harbored intentions of launching another campaign against Constantinople, to reclaim his lost tribute. However, fate had other plans for Attila. Life hits you pretty fast. In the early months of 453, he met his demise under peculiar circumstances. According to the conventional account provided by Priscus, Attila was partaking in a feast to celebrate his latest marriage to the young and beautiful Ildico, whose name suggests Gothic or Ostrogothic origins. Amidst all the festivities, everyone was having a ball. 
but Attila suddenly began to suffer from severe bleeding, and ultimately succumbed to his condition. Sounds a little suspicious, doesn't it? Well, the exact cause of his death remains a subject of speculation. Well, some suggest that he may have experienced a nosebleed and choked to death while he was too drunk, while others propose that he died due to internal bleeding that was possibly caused by ruptured esophageal varices. These diluted veins, typically a consequence of prolonged alcohol abuse, are fragile and prone to rupture, leading to fatal hemorrhages. Despite the uncertainty surrounding the specifics of his demise, he was well and truly dead, and his death marked the end of an era for the Huns, and left a void that would shape the course of history for years in its wake. There is another account of Attila's death, though, as recorded by Roman chronicler Marcellinus, some eighty years after the event, and it suggests a little bit of a different narrative. According to this account, Attila, described as the king of the Huns and ravagers of the provinces of Europe, was allegedly pierced by the hand and blade of his wife. While this version implies assassination, most historians consider it more hearsay and prefer the contemporary account provided by Priscus as recounted by the 6th century historian Jordanes. Priscus's narrative describes how Attila's attendants, sensing something was wrong on the day, broke into his chamber and beheld his lifeless body. He had appeared to have died from an effusion of blood, and there was no visible wound while his young bride stood weeping beneath her veil. The Huns, in accordance with their customs, mourned Attila's death by plucking out their hair and inflicting deep wounds on their faces, a testament to the warrior's valor. A remarkable aspect of Attila's death, as Priscus recounts, is a divine in intervention experienced by Emperor Marcion of the Eastern Roman Empire. Marcion reportedly dreamt of a god standing behind him, showing him Attila's broken bow, symbolizing the end of the Hun threat. This divine revelation signaled to Marcion that the formidable Attila had met his demise, providing relief to rulers who had long feared his power. Well, what happened next? Attila's body was laid in state within a silken tent on a plain, surrounded by the best horsemen of the Hunnic tribe. They circled around in a manner reminiscent of circus games, while recounting Attila's deeds in a funeral dirge. His burial was a grand affair, with his body placed in coffins of gold, silver, and iron, symbolizing his unmatched power and wealth. The tomb was also adorned with the spoils of war and princely ornaments, and those involved in the burial were slain to safeguard the secrecy of his final resting place. After Attila's death, his sons, Elak, Dengisht, and Ernak vied for power. And ultimately, this is what led to the downfall of the Hunnic Empire. Their rash eagerness to rule, and their insistence on dividing the nations among themselves, like a family estate, sparked internal strife and rebellion. A Germanic alliance led by the Gepid ruler Arderic, 
revolted against the Huns, culminating in the Battle of Nidau in 454 AD. In this decisive battle, Elak, Attila's eldest son, was killed on the field, dealing yet another significant blow to the Hun forces. Following Elak's death, Attila's sons continued their aggressive pursuits. Hard to shake old habits, of course. They also viewed the Goths as deserters and launched attacks against them. However, their efforts were repelled, and some groups of Huns relocated to Scythia, likely under Ernak's leadership. Dengazich attempted a renewed invasion across the Danube in 468, but he suffered a defeat at the Battle of Bissene by the Ostrogoths. He met his demise the following year at the hands of the Roman Gothic general Anagast, and this really was the final nail in the coffin for the Huns. Now, further descendants of Attila have been a subject of speculation and genealogical inquiry. While some medieval rulers claimed direct descent from Attila, such as the Bulgarian Khans and the Hungarian Arpad dynasty, Tracing a verifiable line of descent has proved challenging. Despite numerous attempts by genealogists, valid sources for Attila's descendants have likely largely dried up, leaving much of his lineage shrouded in the myth and legend of the old world. Nonetheless, the legacy of Attila the Hun continues to intrigue historians and genealogists alike, with various royal houses seeking to establish a connection to the legendary conqueror. Now, I could end it there, but just before I go, I want to give a quick account from Jordanes about Attila that is quite interesting. I'll read it now. He was a man born into the world, to shake the nations, the scourge of all lands, who in some way terrified all mankind by the dreadful rumours noised abroad concerning him. He was haughty in his walk, rolling his eyes here and there, so that the power of his proud spirit appeared in the movement of his body. He was indeed a lover of war, yet restrained in action, mighty in counsel, gracious to suppliants, and lenient to those who were once received into his protection. Short of stature, with a broad chest and a large head, his eyes were small, his beard thin and sprinkled with grey, and he had a flat nose and swarthy skin, showing evidence of his origin. Some scholars have posited that certain physical features attributed to Attila, such as his reportedly mongoloid appearance, could suggest a possible East Asian ancestry. These features include the shape of his eyes, cheekbones, and other facial characteristics that are commonly associated with individuals from Eastern Asia. However, there is a debate going on among historians regarding these physical features. While some argue for the East Asian origins, others argue more for physical traits that are more enigmatic of Scythian populations. The Scythians were a group of nomadic peoples who inhabited the Eurasian steppe during these times, and their physical appearance could have shared some similarities with those attributed to Attila. Ultimately, this whole discussion surrounding Attila's ancestry is for a while going to remain a subject of debate until we find some more conclusive evidence. Theories proposing East Asian or Scythian ancestry for Attila 
are based on interpretations of the historical accounts, some archaeological evidence, and anthropological, anthropological rather, studies. And that's fine. But for the moment, they don't provide definitive answers. As such, Attila's exact ethnic background and ancestry, well, for the moment, we're just going to have to wait and see. Perhaps the viewers in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, who are watching this video, will know. Who knows what discoveries we will make in the near future. Chivalry a code of conduct that evolved over centuries, a code that embodies the ideals of knighthood, valour and honour. Originating in medieval Europe, chivalry encompassed a complex set of virtues, but also obligations, that shaped the behaviour of knights on and off the battlefield. While it's often romanticized in literature and legend, the historical development and practical implications of chivalry reveal somewhat of a nuanced and dynamic system that adapted to the social and political trends of the Middle Ages. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's great to have you again. If you'd like to support the channel, as always, check out the Patreon. Otherwise, a like, comment and subscribe certainly goes a long way. Now, without further ado, let's talk about the Code of Chivalry. First of all, what is that word, chivalry? Well, the term Chivalry originates from the old French word chevalerie, which literally translates to horse soldiery. Originally it referred to a specific subsection of horse-mounted warriors, as indicated by the French word for a horse, cheval. However, over time, it became associated with the ideals and values of knighthood, in its earliest use, the French word chevalier meant a man of aristocratic standing, possibly of noble lineage, who possessed the capability, when needed, to equip himself with a war horse and the weapons of a heavy cavalryman, and who has also undergone certain rituals that confer upon him this status. Hence, during the medieval period, the plural form of chevalerie, which later transformed into the English word chivalry, originally referred to the collective body of heavy cavalry when assembled for a battle. But as time passed, the meaning of the term expanded to encompass a more broader sense. During the Middle Ages, Chevalier evolved from its original concrete military definition to represent the ideal of Christian warrior ethos, which was popularized in the burgeoning romance genre of the 12th century. Additionally, it became associated with the concept of courtly love, which was promoted in contemporary poetry and music such as, for example, the Minnesang. Now, these evolving ideals of chivalry emphasized virtues such as bravery, loyalty, honor, and respect for women. The principles of chivalry are encapsulated in three separate medieval works, each offering their unique perspective on the concept. An anonymous poem, Orden de Chivalerie, recounts the tale of Hugh II of Tiberias, who was captured by Saladin and released after agreeing to demonstrate the rituals of Christian knighthood. 
The poem sheds light on the rituals and customs associated with knighthood during the Crusades. The next one, Liber del Ordo de Cavalleria, authored by Raymond Lull from Majorca, delves into the subject of knighthood in general. Lull's work explores the various aspects of being a knight, likely influenced by the chivalric ideals prevalent during his time. And finally, Geoffrey de Charnay's Livre de Chivalry examines the qualities and attributes expected of knights, with a particular emphasis on prowess and martial skill. Charnay's work provides insight into the ideals and values upheld by knights during the late medieval period. Interestingly, none of these authors were aware of each other's works, yet their writings collectively contribute to a broader understanding of the concept of chivalry. And while each text approaches the concept from a different angle, they collectively depict chivalry as a way of life integrating military service, nobility, and of course, religious observance. The development of the code of chivalry occurred during the late Middle Ages, evolving in the aftermath of the Crusades. Influenced by both the historical deeds of knights in the Holy Land and these romanticized ideals of courtly love, the code of chivalry became a guiding ethos for knights, emphasizing virtues such as loyalty and compassion to others. Leon Gautier, a pioneering French literary historian, compiled what he referred to as the medieval Ten Commandments of Chivalry in his book Chivalry, published originally in 1884. These commandments encapsulate the core values and principles expected of knights during the medieval period. They provide a very good insight into the ethical code that governed the conduct of knights and shaped their ideals of honor and nobility. So, these, outlined by Gautier, the Ten Commandments of Chivalry, are as follows, and I'll read them in no particular order. Thou shalt believe all that the Church teaches, and shalt observe all of its directions. This commandment emphasizes the importance of religious faith and obedience to the teachings of the Church. All knights were expected to uphold and defend the Christian faith with no exceptions, and their actions were mostly guided by religious principles. Thou shalt defend the Church. More or less the same. Knights were seen as champions of the Church system, and they were expected to come to the aid to safeguard the Church's interests, both on and off the battlefield, and in war and peace. The Church was effectively the boss. Thou shalt respect all weaknesses, and shalt constitute thyself the defender of them. Now this one sounds a little tricky. What it means is that this commandment is underscoring the chivalric virtue of compassion and empathy towards others. Knights were expected to show kindness and mercy towards the weak, including women and especially children and the elderly. And it was thought that it was the priority of a knight to defend women from harm. Thou shalt love the country in which one was born. Of course, 
knights all had to be loyal to their homeland, and they were duty bound to defend it against enemies, from without or within. Patriotism and loyalty were essential virtues of chivalry. Thou shalt not recoil before thine enemy. Courage and bravery in the face of danger were paramount virtues for knights. They were expected to confront their enemies with valor and resolve, and never back down from a challenge. Thou shalt make war against the infidel without cessation and without mercy. Now this command reflects the religious fervor of the Crusades era, during which knights were called upon to wage holy war against the infidels in the name of the Christian Church. Of course, that simplifies it a little too much. The Crusades mainly came about to protect pilgrims who were being attacked along the roads getting to Jerusalem and other holy sites. Groups like the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller were set up to effectively protect them. And, of course, part of protecting the pilgrims is fighting against the infidel. So I suppose that's where that comes from. It was also a political thing. The Knights certainly had to be reminded of who the good guys and the bad guys were. There was no thinking outside this box. That being said, Saladin, the one who was meant to be the enemy, was universally respected, at least via many sources, reckoning by a lot of their European knights, as for him expelling the virtues of what a chivalric person would do. I have a whole video on Saladin if you want to learn more about that. Moving on. Thou shalt perform scrupulously thy feudal duties, if they be not contrary to the laws of God. Knights had feudal obligations to their lords, including military service and loyalty, however, these duties were expected to align with the laws and principles of the church. Knights were to fulfill their feudal obligations faithfully while upholding their religious convictions. Thou shalt never lie, and shalt remain faithful to thy pledged word. Honesty, integrity and honor all fundamental virtues. Knights were expected to uphold their word and act with honesty and integrity, not just in military matters, but in all of their dealings, both on and off the battlefield. Of course, this falls into line with observing the Christian ethics of not bearing false witness. Thou shalt be generous, and give largesse to everyone. Generosity and magnanimity were esteemed virtues of a chivalrous knight. Uh, therefore they were expected to be generous in all of their actions, and give freely to those in need. This includes their vassals, allies, and even outstretching a helping hand to the less fortunate. Thou shalt be everywhere, and always be the champion of the right and the good against injustice and evil. This commandment embodies the overarching duty of knights to uphold justice and righteousness. They were expected to stand up for what is right, and oppose injustice and evil wherever they encountered it, embodying the ideas of true chivalry. So, these ten commandments, if we can say it like that, 
while certainly catalogued at a later date, they provide a moral and ethical framework for knights to follow, guiding their behavior both on and off the battlefield. They encapsulated the majority of the noble ideals and values, giving us a pretty good road map of what a knight should and should not be doing. Of course, not all knights were following this to the T, and there were a lot of knights who thought that these kind of restrictions were somewhat stifling. Historians have offered varying perspectives on chivalry, challenging the traditional view of it as purely a civilizing and stabilizing force in a rather chaotic Middle Age. Now, contrary to this portrayal, some scholars argue that the role of knights in maintaining public order was complex, but often somewhat problematic. Ugh, I hate that word. While they contend that while chivalric codes and ideals provided guidance to knights, they were also riddled with contradictions and did not always lead to a more ordered and peaceful society. Well, the ambivalent and sometimes disruptive role played by knights in medieval European society was indeed an issue to be contended with. The ideals of chivalry were not always aligned with the interests of public order and stability. The conception of medieval society, compromising of those who pray, those who fight, and those who work, seem to be in conjunction with knighthood, but also pose challenges to the establishment of social harmony. This world view of knights rooted in martial values and pre-Christian traditions, often clashed with the objectives of the church and monarchy. Indeed, if you've watched my video on knights in general, you'll know that a lot of these traditions do go back to Roman times. So, perhaps I should have told you at the start of the video to watch that first. But here we are twenty minutes in. There's no turning back now, isn't there? Well, I digress. The church sought to reform and guide knights, mold them into their image, recognizing the need to temper the disorderly and chauvinistic elements of chivalry. Similarly, royalty encountered conflicts with knights over matters of warfare and personal disputes. Here's the other thing. When you're a knight, you're kind of known as the local tough guy, right? So, when somebody gives you a raw deal, there's only really one way of dealing with it. Well, of course, you're bogged down by this series of rules that you are meant to follow. But... You're sick of being told what to do. Indeed, a lot of knights had no doubt felt this way. Just a bit of speculation, but I certainly would have. Well, moreover, emerging merchant class and the bourgeois, representing the social and economic forces of this growing modernity, seem to be at odds with the values of chivalry. The knights, driven by notions of value and honor, viewed the values of commerce as inferior, and sometimes resorted to violence against those engaged in trade. And here's another thing. Merchants in these times were often seen in some places as less than a farmer, well, why is that? Surely a merchant's doing pretty well. Well, yes, they are. 
but the merchant doesn't produce anything. He does not create anything. He simply takes something from someone else and sells it at a higher price. He is a middleman, and many people saw these people as parasites. Well, some historians also raise skepticism about early writers on medieval chivalry, cautioning that their accounts may be coloured by polemical agendas. Writers often viewed chivalry as a means to reform corrupt secular society and emphasised its origins in the Teutonic forests brought into civilization by the great and wonderful Catholic Church. Others, however, view chivalry as a social rather than a military phenomenon, focusing on its key features such as generosity, fidelity, liberality and courtesy. They portray chivalry as somewhat of an ethical inheritance that shaped the behaviour of individuals and provided a moral framework for social interaction, an ideal for those unwashed masses to aspire to. Now before the emergence of codified chivalry, there existed an uncodified note of noble conduct centred around the concept of the prudhomme which can sort of be translated as a wise, honest, and sensible man. This unwritten code, known as the noble habitus, encompassed the behavioural and material expectations that were prevalent, prevalent rather, in medieval societies, and not just in the upper classes, but indeed across all social platforms. Now this concept of noble habitus as a modern idea was pioneered by the French philosopher sociologists in our modern era Pierre Bourdieu and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, although its roots can be traced back to works as ancient as those of Aristotle. It represents this set of social norms and expectations that govern the behaviour of aristocratic individuals emphasizing qualities such as wisdom, honesty, and sensibility. More or less, if we were going to boil it down, we would say that it was almost a secularized form of universally preferable behavior. Good manners, if you will. Going back to that golden rule that is prevalent in all cultures, treat others how you would like to be treated. Well, the pre-chivalric noble habitus, as discovered by historians and elaborated upon by scholars, encompasses several key principles, which I will go through briefly now. The first being loyalty. This virtue was considered a practical utility among warrior nobility. Closely associated with prowess on the battlefield, highlighting the importance of reputation for loyalty in noble conduct. Secondly, forbearance. Knights were expected to exercise self-control, not only in combat, but also at the courts of their lords. The early noble habitus emphasized the nobility of mercy and forbearance, as evidenced by historical documents, such as the Conventum of Hugh de Lusignan of the 1020s. And of course, these qualities were well established before the formalization of chivalry, so it wasn't really reinventing the wheel, just writing it down. The next one is hardiness. Physical resilience and prowess in warfare were essential components. Exceptional physical prowess on the battlefield often led to attaining noble knightly status. 
Indeed, usually you would have to be from a noble family to become a knight. Either your father was a knight, or you were born of somewhat noble stock. However, if you were noticed by a commander or general on the battlefield for exemplifying extreme courage, or perhaps just managing to murder a lot of people in a very short amount of time, then you could perhaps get a glowing commendation and go up in the ranks, moving from peasant to slightly more well-dressed peasant. Now, largesse or liberality. Generosity was, of course, once again considered a very noble quality, with liberality representing one of the noble virtues. And it wasn't just about merely giving possessions away, but one was also expected to look at those greedy elements of society with a good deal of contempt, to look down upon those who hoarded things for themselves. Next one is the Davidic ethic. Now, what is the Davidic ethic? Well, it's derived from biblical tradition. The concept encompasses noble qualities such as safeguarding the vulnerable, ensuring justice for widows and orphans especially, and in general, opposing cruelty and injustice. The ideal warrior leader is portrayed as a guardian protector, committed to upholding ethical principles and demonstrating benevolence towards the weak. There was none of this Gaston-esque sort of character. Well, at least, there wasn't meant to be. Knights were expected to always be humble. Which leads us to the last one. Honour. Achieving honour was closely tied to living up to the ideals of the Prudhomme and embodying all of the virtues listed above. Not some of them, not most of them, but all of them. If you were a very great warrior, but you were cruel to your servants, or you looked down upon the poor, held your nose as you walked past the, the peasant working the field, then you were not considered a very good knight. If you slayed innocents, or lent people money at high interest. That's a big no-no in the Middle Ages, by the way. You get thrown down the well for usury. Well, that also means that you weren't a very good knight. Also, if you acted very, very nicely to everybody, rode around on your horse, flicking coins to people, and generally being a nice guy, that was great, but... When the call to arms rang out, if you weren't the first on the field, well, you'd lost your qualification, friend. All of these principles formed that base foundation of the pre-chivalric noble habitus, and laid the groundwork for the development of the formal code of chivalry in the later medieval period. Courtly behavior remained a recognized form of superior conduct in medieval European society throughout the Middle Ages. It was expected of all aristocrats, and its norms were integrated in chivalric literature. However, unlike chivalry, courtliness was not confined to noble society alone. Examples can be found of servants, merchants, clergy, and free peasants being commended for their courtly behavior in medieval literature. This broader application of courtly behavior suggests its widespread influence across various social classes. Now, the emergence of chivalry as a recognizable 
and prescriptive code of behavior can be tied to a more exclusive definition of nobility that emerged around the late 12th century. This had a significant impact on the professional horse warrior, the knight. Retained knights were prominent figures in the households of barons, counts and princes, and were considered proper associates of their lords. As such, knights adopted the fashions and behaviors of their lords. Many knights were drawn from the younger sons of noble families, leading them to regard themselves as noble, albeit of lower status than their lords. The tipping point of the nobilizing of the knight is often located in the households of the sons of King Henry II of England, particularly his eldest son, Henry the Young, died in 1183 died quite young, by the way. Young Henry lived a lavish lifestyle, focused on the great northern French tourneying society of the 1170s and 80s, funded by his father to distract him from meddling in his realms and to stake a claim to cultural superiority over other European princes. Now, despite criticism, and I mean widespread criticism, for his wasteful and hedonistic lifestyle, young Henry played a significant role in the development of chivalry as a noble code. The De Re Militari of Ralph Niger, circa 1187, the first known work to use the knight as a moral exemplar and definitive nobleman, was written by the young man's former chaplain, partly as a moral defense of the knightly lifestyle. Another reason for the coalescence of chivalry as a noble code in the late 12th century is suggested by an analysis of conduct literature. The courtly habitus underwent a crisis as its moral failures became evident to writers, particularly in the materialism that motivated courtly society. They're rich people. Come on. The Roman Diel's poet knight Raoul de Hodonc is seen as a critique of courtliness and its failures. Raoul's solution is to focus moral eminence on the figure of the knight, who is to be the avatar of a new moral nobility, set above all other males. A knight was expected to eschew materialism and embrace noble generosity. So, by this time, in medieval literature, chivalry's fairly depicted through three overlapping areas, each highlighting different duties and virtues. Duties to countrymen and fellow Christians. This encompasses virtues such as mercy, fairness and protection of the weak and poor, and the loyalty of the knight to his lord. It involves, and rather emphasizes, being willing to sacrifice one's life for others, whether it be for a lord or for a poor individual. Certainly a knight is expected to run into a burning building to save the maiden. Next up, duties to God. Of course, knights are meant to be agents of the church. Christian warriors, protecting the innocent, defending the church and championing good against evil, all while prioritizing obedience to God above loyalty to one's feudal lord. Duties to women. Now this is perhaps the most recognizable aspect of chivalry. 
It includes the concept of courtly love. Knights are expected to serve a lady, placing her above all others, and to exhibit gentleness and graciousness towards all women. There's a reason why we call gentlemanly conduct in the modern era as chivalrous. And of course, any man worth his salt wants to be as much of a gentleman as possible. Right, guys? Well, all of these emphasis placed on these different areas resulted in different strands of chivalry, each with its own focus and ideals. The first up being warrior chivalry. Now in this strand, a knight's primary duty is to his lord. It's exemplified by characters like Sir Gawain in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and the wedding of Sir Gawain and Dame Ragnell. Anybody who is a fan of the Bretonians in Warhammer Fantasy must leave a comment, so we can perhaps summon the Green Knight to the field. Next up, Religious Chivalry. Here, a knight's chief obligation is to protect the innocent and serve God. It conjures to mind figures such as Sir Percival and Sir Galahad of the Grail legends, that certainly embody this form of chivalry to its core. And then there is, of course, the romantic ideal of the chivalrous courtly love. It emphasizes a knight's unwavering devotion to his own lady, and by extension protecting the honor of all women. Think about it this way. If you have a beautiful young lady who is having trouble carrying her shopping to her car, and an old woman who is having the same trouble, a knight, at least in this sense, should be treating that situation with equal importance, not just running to the young, beautiful girl. Now, with the emergence of the knight's character and the chivalric ethos came several novel elements that reshaped medieval society. The first up was the revised social status with knights now occupying a unique position in medieval society, somewhere between the nobility and the commoners. Not quite nobility just yet. Well, their adherence to chivalric codes and their role as protectors elevated their social standing and distinguished them from the other classes within feudal society. Of course, the next part was the innovation of military tactics. You see, chivalric codes introduced regulations that governed warfare, emphasizing principles such as loyalty to the overlord and adherence to rules of engagement, which was great when you were fighting other knights, but fighting enemies who had no idea what that was and would not fight fair well, different tactics needed to be utilized. Next thing we had was fresh literary themes. Now, the ideals of chivalry inspired a rich vein of literature, including epic poems, romances, and the tales of knightly valor. These literary works often portrayed knights as paragons of virtue, embodying ideals such as courage, loyalty, honor, and mercy. And indeed, it was more or less based on a true story. For example, in the battlefield, knights were expected to never attack a defenseless opponent and prioritize the capture of fellow nobles for ransom while not causing them immediate harm. 
They were also expected to treat prisoners of war well. So, a lot of these ideas coming from the literary depictions of knights were indeed based on their real-world counterparts, albeit somewhat blown out of proportion. It's literature. There's always a dramatic license. Now, throughout the medieval period, martial exercise and military virtue remained integral components. However, as warfare evolved, the role of knights on the battlefield began to shift, increasingly restricting their activities to tournament grounds and dueling culture. The joust. It certainly conjures that image to mind, doesn't it? Continued to serve as a prominent display of knightly martial skill, well into the Renaissance era. Additionally, the martial skills of knights extended beyond the battlefield to activities such as hunting. Expertise in this area became an essential aspect of courtly life during the later medieval period. Furthermore, the practice of heraldry, with its elaborate rules governing the displays of coats of arms, emerged alongside chivalry during the High Middle Ages. Heraldry served as a visual representation of a knight's lineage, achievements and allegiances, further solidifying the connection between chivalry and aristocratic identity. Of course, Christianity was the big one that shaped the concept of chivalry, infusing those classical notions of heroism and self-sacrifice with Christian ideals. It can be observed in several key developments. The peace and truce with God. Instituted in the 10th century, this placed restrictions on knights, compelling them to protect and honor the weaker members of society while aiding the church in maintaining peace. The Just War Theory The church became more tolerant of war in defense of faith and developed theories of the just and righteous war, which sought to establish ethical guidelines for warfare. Liturgies were introduced to bless a knight's sword and symbolize chivalric purification bath, imbuing military actions with religious significance. And here's a fun fact for you. In some kingdoms of the Middle Ages, priests were forbidden from fighting. As a matter of fact, the rule was they were forbidden from drawing blood. So, many people got around this by simply using a mace. Now, if you hit somebody hard enough with a mace, they're certainly going to be bleeding, especially those big maces that they were using. But, Rules are meant to be broken, aren't they? And so are jaws, apparently. Just ask some medieval priests about that. Now, the next one is chivalry as a Christian vocation. In medieval literature such as the Grail Romances and Chevalier en Singe, chivalry was depicted as an order of God with knights viewing their way of life, simply doing chivalry as a means of pleasing God. It combined Teutonic heroic values with the militant tradition of the Old Testament. The concept of the Knight of Christ gained prominence in France, Spain and Italy in the 11th century. That notion of religious chivalry was further developed during the Crusades, which were simply portrayed as chivalrous enterprises. Chivalric orders, including the Teutonic Knights of Germany, revered the Virgin Mary as their patroness. The development of chivalry with its emphasis on the honor of a lady 
and nightly devotion, was certainly influenced by the cult of Mary. She served as a symbol of purity, compassion, and refuge. Kind of like a mummy, you know. Well, she shaped medieval attitudes towards women and contributing the development of Mariology. Think about it. Respect for women. You wouldn't disrespect a woman, wouldn't you? The Virgin Mary is a woman. It was kind of like that. Well, all in all, chivalry was a dynamic and adaptable code of conduct that evolved in response to local circumstances. Everyone's code of chivalry was a little bit different. It changed from France to Germany to Poland to really everywhere. In the late 15th century England, Sir Thomas Mallory depicted numerous chivalric groups in his work, The Death of Arthur, suggesting that each group had its own unique chivalric ideology. When The Death of Arthur was printed, William Caxton encouraged knights to read it with the hope that the stories of chivalry could serve as a unifying force for the knightly community that was already fragmented by the Wars of the Roses. And during the early Tudor period of England, some knights still adhered to chivalric ethos, although fewer were actively engaged in warfare. The emergence of professional infantrymen on the battlefield somewhat reduced the opportunities for knights to demonstrate their chivalrous action. And the decline of chivalry was further accelerated by Queen Elizabeth I's decision to reserve the power to create knights exclusively for the monarchy, ending the tradition of knights being able to create other knights. Some argue that Sir Edward Woodville, who travelled across Europe engaging in battles and died in 1488, was one of the last knight errands to witness the transition from the age of chivalry to modern European warfare. Well, whichever the case is, as the Middle Ages drew to a close, the code of chivalry gradually faded away, no longer serving as the guiding ethos it once was. So, looking back on what we've learned about chivalry, I've recently made a video about the East Asian counterpart, Bushido, which I believe that both of these ethoses have their good parts and bad parts. Now in terms of chivalry, the observance of that golden rule in our Christian theology of treating others how you would want to be treated. Well, it's a bit of an obvious one, isn't it? We don't need a code of chivalry for that. But the interesting thing about the code of chivalry to me that really kills it is the unquestioning adherence to the church. Now, if we are going to make the rule that serve God, serve the Bible, and serve what has been given to us at the Sermon on the Mount, fair enough. But if we are going to place it back into the hands of an entity that can be controlled and changed by the whims of human elements, such as the church. Well, then things get a little dangerous, especially when they can tell you who to go and kill. And with that, I think that's enough of a talk about chivalry for today. But reflect upon it. Think about how you can be a little chivalrous in your own life.
Just don't go riding any horses into battle any time soon, thank you. Now, I'd like to thank my mega chat dear patrons, that being Stark Factory, and the old JC. No, nope, not Jesus Christ. <laughs> the other JC. And I would like to thank you for listening this far. If you'd like to support the channel, then perhaps you'd like to look at the Patreon, check out the merch, or simply like, comment, and subscribe. It all helps YouTube push me out to a bigger audience. And my goodness, the channel is growing. We're at over 3,000 subs now. I think we'll get to 5,000 before the end of next month. Tell your friends. Thank you for listening, and once again, I will see you in the next video. Good night, everyone. The Albigensian Crusade, 1209-1229 A twenty-year-long military campaign initiated by Pope Innocent III to eliminate the Cathar heresy in Languedoc, the south of France. But it wasn't just a religious conflict against the Cathars, but also a political maneuver to extend the influence of the French crown over the wealthy and semi-autonomous southern regions. Regardless, it was marked by its brutality and mass persecution of the Cathar believers, and this crusade drastically altered the region, leading to a significant reduction in the Cathars and the consolidation of the French state. The Albigensian crusade is remembered for a tragic loss of life, the suppression of religious diversity, and its role in the expansion of royal power. Hello, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, it's good to meet you. If you're coming back, good to see you again. As always, if you want to support the channel, the links to the Patreon are in the description. Otherwise, liking the video and subscribing certainly helps push it out to a broader audience. Did you like it? Thank you. Now, without further ado, let's begin. Please, make yourself relaxed. First, let's talk about the Cathars. Originating from the Greek term, Katharos, for pure, the Cathars' beliefs were deeply influenced by the very early Gnostic thinkers, embodying a dualistic world view. They suggested the existence of two opposing transcendental forces, a benevolent god of spirituality and an evil demiurge termed Rex Mundi, or in our tongue, the king of the world. Well, this was responsible for creating the flawed physical realm. For the Cathars, the divine was entirely spiritual, embodying love and peace, and Jesus was not seen as a man, but a spiritual being, with his biblical depictions meant rather allegorically. Now, Cathar ideology suggested that human beings were initially soulless, with souls either being a malevolent gift from the Demiurge, or a beneficial gift from God. This belief underpinned their stringent views against procreation and the material world, viewing it as perpetuating the cycle of souls trapped in corrupt bodies. They denied the legitimacy of secular authority, and abstained from military duties and oath-taking, 
aligning once again with their rejection of the material world's politics. Moreover, their ethical teachings included prohibitions against animal slaughter and meat consumption. The Cathar critique extended all the way to the Catholic Church, denouncing its priesthood as corrupt and asserting that any individual, regardless of who they were, could perform the sacred rites, challenging the traditional Catholic sacraments. They specifically developed the Consolamentum, a spiritual baptism through hand-laying, seen as a purification from sin, particularly administered to those who were near death, leading to the status of perfectus. These perfectus individuals adhered strictly to Cathar moral directives, including abstaining from sex and meat, with some undergoing the endura, a fast to death, to ensure their spiritual purity. This practice was contentious, with alleged, with allegations rather, of enforced euthanasia to secure heavenly admission. The community's structure included bishops selected from the perfect, with stipulations on reapplications of consolamentum upon the commission of sin by either the recipient or the administering bishop, highlighting more of the rigidity and depth of the Cathar spiritual discipline. Can you see why the Catholic Church did not like them very much? Well, especially the whole refusing military service. Now that ought to annoy those in charge. So, Catharism found a fertile ground in the Languedoc, later known as Octania, a region characterized by its distinct cultural identity and linguistics, separate from the northern territories, recognizing themselves by this time as part of the United Kingdom of France. Unlike the north, where political unity under the French crown was more pronounced, the Languedoc was more of a patchwork of local lordships, and had a history of relative peace before the onset of the crusade against the Cathars, at least. Their dominant language, Octan, markedly different from the northern French dialects, aligning more closely with Catalan, is just another unique aspect of the region. Now, the county of Toulouse stood as a significant political force in Languedoc, owing fealty to the Angevin Empire, rather than to the French crown. Its influence was contested by the neighboring crown of Aragon and Principality of Catalonia, which exerted greater sway over the eastern territories adjacent to Toulouse. This political fragmentation was mirrored in the burgeoning power of towns throughout the region, with Toulouse emerging as the major urban center, boasting considerable size, wealth, and autonomy by 1209. Now, the architecture of the Languedoc, characterized by fortified towns, or castra, underscored a societal inclination towards defense, contrasting with the rural expanses of northern France. This urbanization facilitated a milieu of relative religious tolerance, where the Jews encountered comparatively minimal discrimination, and religious dissenters could find their refuge. Well, Muslims did not enjoy the same level of tolerance, but their intellectual contributions were nonetheless respected. Still a lot better than being in other parts of Europe. 
the sharp cultural and social dichotomy between the north and south territories of what is now France was very profound, with mutual distrust and stereotypes colouring somewhat strange perceptions on both sides, as strange as they were ill-informed. Northerners viewed the southerners as decadent and overly concerned with social proprieties, influenced negatively by what they consider lower professions and minority groups. On the other hand, the southerners perceived the northerners as uncouth and aggressive. This divide set the stage for what would eventually be a protracted and acrimonious conflict between the two regions, should war erupt. Yeah, of course it always does, doesn't it? Well, it wasn't a new idea. The Cathars were integral to a broader movement of spiritual reform across medieval Europe that traces its origins all the way back to around 653, when Constantine Silvanus introduced the Gospels to Armenia. Over the ensuing centuries, several dissenting factions emerged, rallying around dynamic preachers who challenged the Catholic Church's authority, advocating for a faith practice anchored in the Gospels and apostolic tradition, rather than simply church dogma. These groups, including the Paulicians, Bogomils, Arnoldists, Petrobrusians, Henricans, and the Waldensians, of course, faced severe persecutions, with responses ranging from expulsion all the way up to brutal executions. The call for individual spiritual responsibility in church reform was echoed by 12th century figures such as Henry of Lusan, who criticized the priesthood without aligning with Cathar dualism and Arnold of Brescia, who was executed for his beliefs. Now the Waldensians, followers of Peter Waldo, also suffered extreme persecution. While these groups shared the Cathars' anti-clerical stance and skepticism towards sacraments, only the Paulicians and Bogomils were noted for dualist beliefs that were similar to the Cathars. Now, scholars have debated the origins of the Cathars, with some proposing a direct link to the Bogomils within a broader Manichaean tradition. This connection was possibly strengthened by Latin settlers in Constantinople after the First Crusade, who may have facilitated the transfer of dualist Bogomil texts to the West introducing the consumalentum ritual and sparking the first organized dualist movements in Western Europe. By the 12th century, dissident groups like the Cathars and Waldensians became more visible in Europe's burgeoning urban centers. The Cathars, particularly in the highly urbanized Western Mediterranean France, evolved into a mass movement, spreading into areas like Lombardy by the 1170s. The movement was partly a critique of the clergy's corruption and a manifestation of the discontent with papal authority, which there was plenty of, and if you haven't heard of it, just remember, some of the records at the time are written by the papacy themselves. Now, while the Cathars shared some views with the Waldensians, especially in their critique of the Catholic hierarchy and emphasis on austerity, they differed in a few of their theological positions, with Cathars being the ones to adapt a more radical stance. This divergence led to the Church directing its efforts more aggressively against the greater of two evils as they saw it, namely 
Catharism. The persecution of heretics intensified, exemplified by the burning of Cathars in Cologne in 1163, marking a shift towards more frequent executions for heresy, a practice that previously just occurred sporadically, often more for political rather than religious reasons. And this is before the main crusade has started, by the way. The exchange between the older dualist communities in the Byzantine Empire and the newer ones in Western Europe further cemented these dualist beliefs in the West. Catharism's stronghold was, though, undoubtedly the Languedoc, where it flourished significantly more in England, France or Germany, where its presence was either minimal or short-lived. The Cathars, also known as the Albigensians, named after Albi, a city closely associated with them, faced charges of heresy by the church, notably at a council near Albi in 1176, and again during the Third Lateran Council of 1179. The remarkable success of the Cathar movement in the Languedoc has been attributed to various factors, with the alleged corruption and incompetence of the clergy frequently cited. The region's priests, particularly those in the rural areas, were often described as poorly educated and engaged in monetary and physical misconduct, with many holding their positions through lay appointments. While such clerical inadequacies were reported across Europe, the Languedoc episcopacy was notably more corrupt, exemplified by the Archbishop of Narbonne's neglect of his diocesan duties and financial exploitation, which led the Pope, Innocent III, suspending him and three of other bishops, which were reportedly his close buddies. Now, the inability of the church to address heresy effectively in Languedoc was partly due to the region's lack of political centralization and the papacy's prioritization of appointments in more politically strategic areas. Despite being a minority, the Cathars gained significant acceptance among local Catholics, with some even achieving positions within Toulouse's city council. The region's ambivalence towards popular religious movements, such as the Crusades, despite initial enthusiasm read by Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, suggests a prevailing laxity that permitted the growth of non-conformist beliefs without much substantial opposition. Well, upon his election in 1198, Pope Innocent III made it his priority to confront the Cathar heresy in Languedoc head-on, where the Cathars were disrespecting the authority of both the French king and the local Catholic Church. At least, that's how the local French king and the Catholic Church heard about it. Now, their protection by influential nobles, motivated by a desire for autonomy from the king, led some of these nobles to actually outwardly support Catharism, albeit without adhering to its rigorous ethical demands. Faced with this challenge, and unable to gain support from Philip II of France, who was very much preoccupied with conflicts elsewhere, Innocent III proposed a military crusade against the Cathars, promising the same spiritual benefits as those accorded to crusaders heading to the Holy Land. Raymond IV of Toulouse, 
Raymond VI, rather, of Toulouse, a significant regional power, actually showed quite a bit of sympathy toward the Cathars and resistance to French royal authority. But of course, he stopped just a little bit short of adopting the Cathar beliefs. His refusal to cooperate with Innocent's delegates led to his excommunication in 1207, and a papal interdict was placed on his lands. That's right, do as we tell you, or you're out of the club. Well, Innocent III's subsequent efforts to reclaim the Cathar through diplomatic means and preaching, led by Cistercian monks under Pierre de Castelnau, saw a little bit of success, but significant opposition. And it culminated in Pierre de Castelnau's murder in 1208, allegedly by an associate of Raymond IV. This act, of course, escalated the conflict, with Innocent III declaring Raymond anathematized and absolving his subjects of loyalty to him. Raymond's eventual attempt at reconciliation with the Church briefly lifted the excommunication, but his ultimate failure to meet the Church's conditions led to his re-excommunication at the Council of Avignon in 1209. This set the stage for Innocent III to formally call for a crusade against the Albigensians, framing it as part of a broader effort to rid Europe of heresy, and of course strengthen its defences against Muslim invasions, aligning this initiative with the ongoing Fifth and Sixth Crusades in the Holy Land. By 1209, approximately 10,000 crusaders had met in Lyon, preparing to head south into Languedoc. Their ranks, replenished every 40 days, included many from northern France and volunteers from England and Austria. Leadership of the crusade was uncertain after Philip II of France opted out due to emerging anti-French allies, yet promised troops support to maintain influence over the outcome. Papal legatee Arnord Amalric took command of the expedition. Efforts by Raymond VI of Toulouse to unify defences with his nephew, Raymond Roger Trensavel failed, leading him to negotiate with the Crusaders. Despite opposition from Amalric, Pope Innocent III's newly appointed legatee, Milo, was directed to follow Amalric's lead. Raymond's public repentance and acceptance back into the Church shifted the Crusaders' focus to Raymond Roger's territories, known for their Cathar populations. Thusly, the Crusaders left Lyon on the 24th of June, reaching Montpellier by July 20th, with their sights set on areas around Albi and Carcassonne. Raymond Roger, while not a Cathar himself, was seen as a protector of the sect guilty by association somewhat. Despite his attempts to assert loyalty to the church and disclaim responsibility for heresy due to his youth, the crusaders rejected peace talks and advanced on Béziers, a city known for its large Cathar community. Raymond Roger's withdrawal to Carcassonne left Béziers extremely vulnerable. The Crusaders' assault on Béziers on July 21st resulted in the city's fall and massacre of its inhabitants, including both Cathars and Catholics. The reported command by Amalric to kill them all, God will know his own, whether accurate or not, 
reflects the ruthlessness of the attack, with claims of nearly 20,000 casualties. The aftermath saw many settlements surrendering or evacuating without resistance as the Crusaders advanced unopposed to Carcassonne. I don't know if you can hear, but it's raining rather heavily outside. I love days like this. Anyway, following the devastating massacre at Beziers, Carcassonne became the Crusaders' subsequent major objective. Despite its strong fortifications, the city was at a disadvantage as it was overwhelmed by refugees seeking sanctuary. The Crusaders covered the distance from Beziers to Carcassonne in six days, initiating the siege on August the 1st, 1209. The siege swiftly intensified as the Crusaders severed the city's water supply by August the 7th, and in a bid for peace, Raymond Roger Trenceval, the Viscount of Carcassonne, entered negotiations, but was captured under the flag of a truce. The city, on August 15th, capitulated, and while its inhabitants were spared death, they were expelled, made to leave with minimal clothing, as described by differing accounts from Peter of Vaudecernay and Guillaume de Pelurens. Now, Raymond Roger's subsequent death in captivity, officially attributed to dysentery, sparked more than a few suspicions of foul play. I mean, it seems a bit dodgy, don't you think? In the aftermath of this, the leadership of the Crusader forces was conferred upon Simon de Montfort, a decision that also saw him gain control over territories including Carcassonne, Albi, and Beziers. The capitulation of Carcassonne led to a series of unopposed surrenders across the region, with Albi, Castelnaudry, Castres, Fanjou, Limoux, Lombers, and Montreal all falling to the Crusaders by autumn. The conflict then shifted to Lastors and Cabaret, with an unsuccessful attack on the latter in December 1209 by the Crusaders. The harsh winter conditions and limited troop numbers led Simon de Montfort to focus on consolidating his gains rather than launching new offences. With the arrival of reinforcements, Bram fell to the Crusaders in the March of 1210, followed by the siege of Minerve in June. Despite its lack of strategic significance, Minerve was targeted due to the presence of numerous Khazar prefects. Perfects, rather. After a prolonged siege that culminated in the destruction of the city's main water supply, Minerve surrendered on the 22nd of July. While Simon favoured leniency, Arnold Amalric insisted on harsh treatment for the Cathar perfects, leading to the execution of them who refused to renounce their faith all 140 of them brought out into the public and dealt with harshly in a show of force made an example of, it seems. The crusade continued to Termes in August, enduring despite interventions from Pierre Roger de Cabaret. The defender's situation became dire due to water shortages but they were momentarily relieved by a rainstorm, delaying their surrender. Ultimately, the defenders escaped on November the 22nd. 
By 1211, dissatisfaction with the Crusaders' tactics had alienated many of the key lords, including Raymond of Toulouse. Lastors capitulated in March, and the siege of Lavar began in April. Crusader reinforcements were then decimated in an ambush at Montgay by forces from Toulouse led by the Count of Foix. Following the recapture of Amory de Montreal's castle, numerous Cathars faced execution. The Crusaders' campaign proceeded with the fall of Cassés and the siege of Montferrand, leading Baldwin to defect to the Crusaders. Efforts to besiege Toulouse faltered due to logistical challenges, prompting de Montfort's withdrawal. Raymond de Toulouse's counterattack at Castelnaudry saw the Crusaders narrowly averting defeat. Throughout early 1212, Simon de Montfort effectively isolated Toulouse undermining Raymond's support and resources. Now seeking to counter the Crusaders, the Cathars enlisted the help of Peter II of Aragon, who, after notable victories against the Moors and an alliance through marriage to Raymond VI, possessed considerable influence. Utilizing his victories, and diplomatic efforts in Rome, Peter persuaded Pope Innocent III to attempt halting the Albigensian Crusade. Motivated by the Pope's desire to focus on the Middle East and ongoing conflicts with the Moors. By January of 1213, Innocent III had called for peace in the Languedoc, instructing Arnold Armory and Simon de Montfort to cease their aggressive campaigns, and proposing a council to reconcile differences under Peter's guidance. Hold on a moment. Wasn't this your idea in the first place, Mr. Pope Innocent III? Only the way the cat was out of the bag now, wasn't it? Who would have thought that initiating the Holy War would have become so violent. Well, despite Peter's efforts at the Council of Lavar to secure a peaceful resolution and restore the lands to Raymond VI, his propositions were dismissed, maintaining the excommunication of Raymond and the seizure of lands that were deemed heretical. Peter's rejection of this decision, and concern over Simon de Montfort's growing power, led him to support Toulouse actively. This alliance alarmed Innocent III, who, misled by Simon's delegation, denounced Peter, and called for the renewal of the crusade against him. The conflict culminated in the Battle of Muret, in the September of 1213, where, despite numerical disadvantages, Simon's tactical maneuvers led to Peter II's death and a retreat of the coalition forces. This defeat severely weakened the resistance against the Crusaders, forcing Raymond VI and his son to flee all the way back to England, where they found limited support from King John, who was cautious of the Crusades' implications. The Crusaders' momentum continued through 1214, with significant victories and territorial gains, including strategic castles in Perigord. By 1215, with the capture of Toulouse and its subsequent handover to Simon de Montfort, Recognized officially by the Fourth Council of the Lateran, Crusader control was all but solidified. The Council's decisions not only cemented Simon's authority over conquered lands, 
but also aimed to secure the church's influence over yet unconquered territories. Amidst all of this, the call for a new crusade in the Middle East by Innocent III redirected potential reinforcements from the Albigensian Crusade, leading Simon to increasingly depend on mercenaries to maintain some form of control. In the April of 1216, Raymond VI and his son Raymond VII rallied a considerable force from towns who were disillusioned with the Crusaders. And by May, they had laid siege to Beaucaré, successfully negotiating its surrender after three months due to their dwindling supplies. Despite efforts by Montfort to intervene, he was repelled. Pope Innocent III's death in July of 1216 left the crusade somewhat directionless, with leadership passing to a more hesitant Philip II of France, who was preoccupied with conflicts elsewhere. Montfort then quelled a rebellion in Toulouse, before attempting to recapture Bigorre, facing defeat at Lourdes in December of 1216. And Raymond VI recaptured Toulouse in the September of 1217, exploiting Montfort's engagement in Foix. Now, despite Montfort's return, he couldn't retake the city, and operations ground to a halt, at least for a little while. In 1218, at Pope Honorius III's urging, Montfort resumed the siege of Toulouse, but in June, Montfort died from a stone that was thrown from the city's defences, marking a significant setback for the Crusaders. But what a throw! Honorius III's subsequent call for renewed action failed to regain momentum with Prince Louis's 1219 campaign to retake Jerusalem faltering after a mere six weeks. Now Raymond VI and Raymond VII regained significant territories by 1222, with the sixth passing and the seventh succeeding him. Philip II's death in 1223 saw Louis VIII inherit the throne, leading a large force against the Cathars in 1226, capturing key towns with minimal resistance. Avignon's siege ended in September after agreeing to pay a fine and dismantle its defences. Louis VIII died in 1226, and it led to a continuation of the crusade under the Queen Regent Blanche of Castile, and Humbert the Fur of Beaujau, capturing more territories. And by 1228, a besieged Toulouse succumbed to the Crusaders' systematic devastation of the surrounding area. The Treaty of Paris in 1229 ended Raymond VII's resistance, recognizing his rule over Toulouse in exchange for concessions to the crown and a marital alliance with Alphonse of Portiers, ensuring the region's return to royal control upon Raymond's death. Following the conclusion to the military campaigns against the Cathars, the Inquisition was initiated by Pope Gregory IX in 1234 to eradicate heretical movements, including the remnants of Catharism from the Languedoc region. Operating throughout Toulouse, Albi, Carcassonne, and other towns into the 14th century, the Inquisition effectively suppressed Catharism as a widespread movement, pushing its adherents into secrecy. Punishments for those identified as Cathars ranged from wearing yellow crosses for penance to imprisonment and the forfeiture of property. 
with the most unrepentant being executed by burning. Nonetheless, this was very, very rare, and the majority simply faced lesser penalties. Dominican friars were pivotal in the Inquisition's efforts, preaching Orthodox Church doctrines and participating in the identification and prosecution of Cathars. But despite all these measures, Catharism persisted in some areas, largely out in the countryside where no one really likes to look. Now Raymond VII of Toulouse, allied now with England's King Henry III, mounted a failed revolt against French authority between 1242 and 43, which included the assassination of two inquisitors. The subsequent siege of Montsegur from 1243 to 44 culminated in the execution of over 200 Cathar perfects in the March of 1244, a direct response to the earlier killings of inquisitors. And it was this event that marked a significant blow to the Cathar community, though notably it did not extinguish the practice entirely. The Inquisition's relentless pursuit of Cathars continued, employing various methods including torture to extract confessions, though capturing only a fraction of those practicing in secret. Following Raymond's death in 1249 and Alfonso's in 1271, the county of Toulouse was absorbed into the French kingdom with the Inquisition thereafter benefiting from French royal support. King Philip IV curtailed his support in the 1290s among his dispute with Pope Boniface VIII, but reversed these limitations some thirteen years later in 1303, after witnessing anti-monarchical attitudes in southern France, particularly in Carcassonne. Thus, revitalizing the Inquisition's efforts. Now, Pope Clement V later implemented reforms to safeguard the accused rights. Bernard Guay, serving as the Inquisitor of Toulouse from 1308 to 1323, composed a manual outlining the practices of various non-Catholic groups including detailed descriptions of Cathar customs, and provided guidance for inquisitors on handling heresy allegations. His policies included the posthumous condemnation of unrepentant heretics, either by burning their exhumed remains, or simply unearthing them, based on their confessional status at death. Under Gray's tenure, a concerted effort to eradicate the remnants of Catharism was launched, successfully eliminating the movement, at least on paper, by 1350. Well, the Albigensian Crusade, characterized by its brutality, diverged quite significantly from Pope Innocent III's envisioned reforms which rather emphasize confession, clerical and lay reform, and pastoral teachings as a means to counteract heresy. The escalation of violence was largely attributed to the crusade being commandeered by unruly mobs, minor rulers, and local bishops, all of whom deviated from innocent principles. The rampant indiscriminate violence perpetrated by these groups and the secular courts against the alleged heretics prompted the papacy to seek enhanced control over heresy prosecutions, leading to the establishment of a more formalized legal process for handling such cases, which of course wasn't perfect, but baby steps first. 
the immediate aftermath of the Albigensian Crusade saw a diminished number of French participants in the subsequent Fifth and Sixth Crusades. The cultural impact of the Albigensian Crusade is clearly evident in the surviving works of troubadour poet-composers, many of whom were also knights. Notable examples include Raymond de Miravel, who appealed through his songs for Peter II's assistance in reclaiming his castles seized by Simon de Montfort, and the collaboration between Daumier and Paleazzi, whom criticized Raymond VI's treatment and encouraged resistance. The crusade and its fallout marked the beginning of the decline of the troubadour tradition. Once flourishing under the patronage of Occitan courts, they faced decline as these courts were simply destroyed. Consequently, many troubadours migrated from southern France to royal courts across Italy, Spain and Hungary, seeking new patrons and audiences for their art. But their story is one for another video. The East-West Schism also known as the Great Schism, marks a pivotal moment in Christian history that resulted in the permanent division between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. The Schism, which occurred in 1054, was the culmination of centuries of theological, cultural, and political differences. The formal mutual excommunications between the Patriarch of Constantinople and the legates of the Pope in 1054 are often cited as the symbolic event that truly crystallized the split. However, the roots of the schism extend far back into history and were influenced by a complex interplay of factors. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you and if you're coming back, it's great to see you again. If you want to support the channel, you may only follow the links to the Patreon in the comments and description. Otherwise, if you feel inclined to like, comment and subscribe, that also helps quite a lot. Now, Without further ado, let's begin our video for today. The East-West Schism Let's go back all the way to the beginning. Some scholars suggest that the divergence between the East and Western churches began long before the formal excommunications. While the Photian Schism in the 9th century marks a significant point of separation, tensions between the East and the West can be traced back even further, with some pointing to events as early as the 4th century. Orthodox apologists often highlight instances from the 2nd century as evident of early claims to papal primacy, by Rome and subsequent rejection by Eastern churches. Other scholars have identified several sporadic schisms within the early church, occurring under popes such as Victor I in the 2nd century, Stephen I in the 3rd century, and Damasus in the 4th century. One theory regarding the schism suggests that the transfer of the imperial capital to Rome to Constantinople in the 6th century played a role. Some have proposed that primacy in the church shifted along with the capital, a view that was later supported by Photios I of Constantinople in the 9th century. Constantinople, as the seat of the imperial ruler and symbol of worldly power, was regarded as the highest among the patriarchs, and thus claimed the right to govern them. 
basically akin to the authority of the emperor. Now, after the fall and destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, the early centers of Christian learning were, of course, somewhat damaged, and the influence shifted to Antioch and Alexandria in Egypt, more stable cities. The Church of Alexandria was said to have been assisted in its founding by Mark, one of the seventy apostles, with, well, while rather Antioch attracted prominent figures like Peter, Paul, Barnabas, among others. I'm sure that if you're somewhat versed in the New Testament, these names are familiar to you. Antioch served as a base from which Paul embarked on his missionary journeys, spreading Christianity across various regions. Additionally, the Church of Antioch played a significant role in sending Peter and Paul to Rome to support the growth of the nascent Christian community there, with Peter being regarded as the first bishop. In the early development of the Eastern Church, St. Thomas is said to have travelled eastward and played a key role in establishing the church in the Persian Empire and its neighbouring kingdoms and areas. On the other hand, St. Adai and St. Mary, two of the seventy apostles, are credited with much of the work in Persia. The Church of the East, therefore, grew to prominence, rivaling the Mediterranean church in size, at least at the time, the 6th to the 8th centuries, when it expanded into the Far East. Now, during the 4th century, theological debates and questions proliferated across the Roman Empire, as the emperor sought to exert control over the church. The influence of Greek speculative thought on Christian theology led to a proliferation of divergent and, frankly, conflicting opinions among many theologians. Some, of course, influenced by politics and other things that influence religious authorities. Amidst this intellectual ferment, the fundamental commandment of Christ to love others as oneself often seemed overshadowed by more abstract and avant-garde theological debates, not quite seeing the forest for the trees, it seems. Theological disputes were not merely academic but they were used as weapons in power struggles among bishops, as of course being labelled a heretic was a means for one bishop to depose another. Consequently, tensions arose within the church when leaders were perceived to overstep their bounds, or when theological disagreements escalated into actual conflicts with much broader implications. The early Christian Empire, if we may refer to it as such, experienced a significant shift in its politics, with politics being one of the first institutions to undergo change. By the 5th century, Western imperial power began to wane, even before the invasion of the barbarian kings. We're talking about the Visigoths who were being pushed into the Roman Empire's territory by Hunnic incursions from the east. And by the way, around this time, don't think that the entire empire had just flicked the switch and become Christian. That was simply not the case. Many people were still holding to their old beliefs. In fact, in 410, when Rome was being sacked by the Visigoths, a lot of the bishops there thought, 
Well, perhaps it's the old gods that are angry with us. Well, shall we perform some sacrifices, everybody? So, of course, in living memory, people were still having some old nostalgia. Now, this decline in secular authority was accompanied by a rise in its in the power and influence of the Pope, which was a relatively new office as well, and this resulted in a blurring of the lines between secular and ecclesiastical authority. Prior to ecumenical councils, Rome held a prominent position in Christianity, owing to its status as the capital of the Roman Empire, of course it's the eternal city, right? Well, while bishops from the eastern and southern Mediterranean regions recognized the persuasive leadership of the Bishop of Rome, they did not view him as infallible, nor acknowledge any judicial authority over them. The Bishop of Rome did not like this, while well, Rome's claim to special authority over other churches was rooted in its connection with the apostles Peter and Paul, you know, the important ones. Despite gaining increasing recognition as a center of Christianity in the first three centuries, historical documents from that period do not unequivocally assert or recognize the papal primacy of Rome. Now, after Jerusalem, the Church of Rome naturally emerged as the primary centre of Christianity, of course due to its early and significant Christian population. Constantine made sure of that one. The city was closely associated with the Apostle Paul, who preached there and was actually martyred there as well as the Apostle Peter, who met a similar fate. In Orthodox liturgy, that's the Eastern Orthodox liturgy, Peter and Paul are revered as the wisest apostles and princes of the Church of Rome. Peter is traditionally regarded as the founder of the Church of Rome, and the bishops of Rome are considered his successors, a direct line of command all the way down. Now, Father Thomas Hopko, a prominent Orthodox theologian, emphasizes the special honor accorded to the Church of Rome among the earliest Christian communities. According to him, the Roman Church held a place of honor among other churches due to its foundation to the teachings and martyrdom of Peter and Paul, as well as its location in the capital city of the uh, Roman Empire, which was still considered the center of the civilized world at the time, at least by the Romans. Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch, praised the church in Rome as worthy of God's honor and love, unconditionally, of course, highlighting its role as a leader among the early Christian churches. Of course, it's the Roman Empire. Any policy change? Well, they had to take the reins, didn't they? The Quarto Deciman controversy in the second century actually marks an early instance of tension between the Bishop of Rome and Eastern churches, particularly in the Roman provinces of Asia. And when we say Asia in terms of a Roman province, we mean Western Anatolia, a region of modern-day Turkey. Now this controversy, the Quartodeciman controversy, arose over the official date of Easter, 
with churches in Asia following the Jewish Passover tradition of celebrating it on the spring full moon, while others observed it on the following Sunday. Bishop Victor of Rome attempted to resolve the controversy by excommunicating churches in the Roman province of Asia. But he faced resistance from the Eastern Bishop, including Polycrates of Ephesus. Well, despite Victor's efforts, and he did make great efforts to accomplish this, the Eastern churches maintained their paschal tradition, prompting Victor to reconsider his decision after the intervention of other bishops such as Irenaeus of Gaul. Perhaps an intervention was called where Victor was politely told to, as we say in Australia, pull your head in. Well, while some Catholic apologists view Victor's actions as evidence of papal primacy and authority, Orthodox apologists argue that the Eastern Churches, well, they never recognized Victor's authority beyond his own city. That's a Roman idea, and we are from the Eastern Empire, so mind your own business. The rejection of Victor's decision by the Eastern Bishops is cited as proof against the idea that the churches in Asia Minor accepted the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. Now, throughout the earliest of the early church history, the opinion of the Bishop of Rome was often sought in resolving disputes, especially among patriarchs in the Eastern Mediterranean. Rome's distance from the theological disputes of the Eastern Mediterranean allowed its bishop to be perceived as more impartial. However, following the sack of Rome by invading Goths in 410, Rome entered a period of decline and isolation, becoming increasingly irrelevant to the wider Mediterranean church. It didn't help that it was almost completely just wrecked. It looked like a bomb had hit it after the Goths had went there. It took until the rise of Charlemagne and his successors that the Church of Rome regained prominence, coinciding with the military successes of Western Mediterranean adventurers and the eventual emergence of the Papal States. Hmm, that's another video in itself. Now, on to the first ecumenical council at Nicaea, convened by Emperor Constantine the Great, which played a pivotal role in shaping the organizational structure of the early Christian Church and establishing the authority of key bishoprics, or metropolitan sees. One of the significant outcomes of the council was the confirmation of the authority of certain metropolitan sees beyond their own provinces. The bishops at the council affirmed the authority of the metropolitan sees of Rome and Alexandria, recognizing their jurisdiction outside of their respective provinces. Additionally, The existing privileges of churches in Antioch and other provinces were also affirmed. These metropolitan sees were later designated as patriarchates and were given a specific order of precedence. Rome, as the capital of the empire, was of course in the first place, followed by Alexandria and Antioch. However, as the center of political power shifted to the eastern Mediterranean, particularly to Constantinople, that grand city named after Constantine himself, the status and influence of Rome began to 
slowly drip away. With the elevation of the local bishop to the position of patriarch under Constantine, Constantinople, previously Byzantium and currently Istanbul, by the way, began to rise in prominence. The bishop of Constantinople, known as Metrophanes, gradually freed himself from ecclesiastical dependency and obtained recognition as the second-ranking see after Rome. The elevation of Constantinople's status, described as New Rome, which I'm sure raised a few out uh, eyebrows back in actual Rome, and this raised it above the seas of Alexandria and Antioch, leading to ecclesiastical rivalry between Constantinople and Rome. Now this rivalry, along with Alexandria's objections to Constantinople's promotion, fueled a struggle between the two seas in the first half of the 5th century. You see how far this all goes back. Old grievances. Now, Rome, asserting its authority based on the theory of the three Petrine Seas, with Rome in the first place, supported Alexandria's objections to Constantinople's elevation, and of course they would. However, after the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451, the position of Patriarchate of Alexandria was weakened due to a division within its Christian population, with the majority following a form of Christianity termed monophysitism. These developments sowed the seeds for the ecclesiastical rivalry between Constantinople and Rome, ultimately contributing to the schism between East and West in later centuries. Now, rewinding back a little bit, the Second Ecumenical Council, convened by Emperor Theodosius I in 381, marked another significant development in the ecclesiastical history of the Christian Church. The Council elevated the See of Constantinople to a position ahead of the other major metropolitan sees, except for Rome. It also divided the Eastern Roman Empire into five separate dioceses, each managed by a synod of bishops, with special privileges granted to Alexandria and Antioch. Following this council, tensions arose between the bishoprics of Rome and Constantinople, particularly regarding their respective positions of authority within the church. In 382, a synod in Rome under Pope Damasus I protested against the elevation of Constantinople and reaffirmed Rome's status as the Apostolic See. Successive popes, such as Syracius, Innocent I, Boniface and Celestine asserted increasing authority for the See of Rome, claiming jurisdiction over major judicial cases and emphasizing the primacy of Rome in matters of ecclesiastical discipline. Now, Pope Leo I and his successors continued to assert Rome's authority rejecting certain decisions of ecumenical councils, such as the Council of Chalcedon. Remember that one? Well, the Akkadian Schism from 484 to 519 further highlighted the division between East and West, with Pope Hormosidas insisting on declarations affirming communion with the Apostolic See of Rome, Pope Galatius I emphasized the distinct sh distinction rather 
between the power of civil rulers and that of bishops, asserting the supreme authority of the Bishop of Rome in religious matters. Pope Nicholas I also reinforced the idea of papal supremacy, claiming authority over all churches on earth. These assertions of papal primacy only contributed to the growing tension between the East and West. The Fourth Ecumenical Council, held at Chalcedon in 451, further solidified the authority of the Patriarch of Constantinople within the Byzantine Empire. The council granted the Archbishop of Constantinople jurisdiction over the provinces of Pontus and Thrace, elevating its status among the patriarchates. Additionally, an agreement ratified between Antioch and Jerusalem established Jerusalem's jurisdiction over three provinces, placing it among the five great seas. The order of precedence among the patriarchs within the Byzantine Empire was established as follows. The Patriarch of Rome, the Patriarch of Constantinople, then Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. While the Pope was considered first among equals, whatever that means, the authority of Constantinople was increasingly recognized, especially given its status as the imperial capital. Also, Constantinople was a just generally the place to be. Alexandria was pretty good. But Rome, well, it was... Let's just say after all the barbarian invasions and massacres, it had somewhat lost some of its land value. Now, Pope Leo I, although his delegates were absent during the council, recognized its ecumenical status and confirmed its doctrinal decrees. However, he rejected Canon 28 of the Council, arguing that it infringed upon the rights of Alexandria and Antioch and contradicted the sixth Canon of Nicaea. Despite Rome's opposition, the influence of Constantinople as the residence of the Emperor only continued to grow. Now, Canon 28, let's quickly just clear that up. Um, canon 28 of the Council was particularly contentious as it recognized Constantinople's authority over bishops in dioceses, quote, among the barbarians. Now, that could be interpreted in many ways. It also led to friction between the East and West, although the issue became irrelevant after the mutual excommunications of 1054. Nevertheless, debates persist regarding the applicability of this canon to the authority of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. And furthermore, Canon 9 of the Council conferred upon Constantinople the privilege of resolving disputes between bishops and the metropolitan of their province, further enhancing its own authority within the ecclesiastical hierarchy. Disunion within the Roman Empire significantly contributed to disunity within the Church. Emperor Diocletian's division of the administration of the eastern and western portions of the empire in the early 4th century all but set the stage for subsequent political fragmentation. While leaders like Constantine aimed to reunite the empire, somewhat naively, it remained divided with Theodosius the Great being the last emperor to rule over a united Roman Empire. And following his death in 395, the empire permanently split into western and eastern halves, 
each under its own emperor. The sack of Rome in 410 by the Visigoths further isolated Rome from the churches in the eastern and southern Mediterranean. Full video on that if you're interested. Go and have a look in the, I think it's in the Roman history playlist, should be. Now, this isolation of Rome suited many of the patriarchs and bishops in those regions. The Western Roman Empire eventually collapsed in the 5th century, as it was overran by Germanic tribes. And Odoacer, the bearded barbarian, declared himself king of all Italy in 476. And the Romans were all too dead to dispute it. Meanwhile, the Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantine Empire, continued to thrive, recovering territories in western Mediterranean in the 6th century, before eventually losing them all again. Bad luck, I suppose. The collapse of civil government in the West left the church with significant influence in many areas, with bishops often assuming secular administrative roles. Christianity in these regions became subject to the laws and customs of various Germanic peoples. Linguistic and cultural differences between the East and West further exacerbated these divisions. It was bad enough already without all of those linguistic faux pas. Latin was dominant in the West, while Greek prevailed in the East. The decline in individuals proficient in both languages made communication between the two halves of the church increasingly difficult. That being said, if you were versed in both Latin and Greek, you could do very well for yourself. The linguistic and cultural divergence led to different approaches to religious doctrines and the development of distinctive rites. This growing divergence laid the groundwork for what would become the later schism, although it didn't occur until much later. Nevertheless, this is just another piece of the puzzle where the outlines of the schism were becoming discernible, as suspicion and mistrust between the East and West continued to deepen. And then things got even worse. The conquest of Muslim Arabs by 661 significantly impacted the territories of the Patriarchates of Alexandria, Antioch and Jerusalem, which were only partially and temporarily recovered thereafter. Additionally, in 732, Emperor Leo III transferred territories including Sicily, Calabria and Illyria from the jurisdiction of the Patriarchate of Rome to that of Constantinople as a response to Pope Gregory III's opposition to the Emperor's iconoclast policies. This transfer expanded the jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Constantinople to the West, aligning it practically with the Byzantines' borders. Now, time for another council. The Quinisext Council of 692 highlighted the divergence between the East and West, as the West outright rejected the Council's decisions. This rejection led to pressure from the Eastern Empire on the West to abandon certain Latin customs that by this time were deemed unorthodox. These customs, including celebrating Mass on weekdays during Lent, fasting on Saturdays throughout the year, omitting the Alleluia during Lent, depicting Christ as a lamb, 
and using unleavened bread. The council also addressed disputes over celibacy for priests and deacons, affirming the right for married men to become priests, but forbidding priests to marry and bishops to live with their wives. Deposition was prescribed for anyone attempting to separate a clergyman from his wife. Now Pope Sergius I, although a loyal subject of the empire, rejected this council, stating his preference to, and I quote, die rather than consent to erroneous novelties. Now, he certainly made his point clear. Well, after he did that, he refused to sign the canons, leading to Emperor Justinian II ordering his arrest and abdication, abduction rather, to Constantinople. However, the attempt was thwarted by the militia of the Excartate of Ravenna. The council was ratified in Visigothic Hispania by the 18th Council of Toledo, under King Witiza's urging, although later reversed again by Fruella I of Asturias. The primary causes of the East-West Schism were rooted in these disputes over claims of jurisdiction, particularly concerning papal authorities and the insertion of the filioque clause in the Nissan Creed by the Western Patriarch in 1014. The seventh canon of the Council of Ephesus explicitly prohibited modification of the Nicene Creed, which was established by the First Ecumenical Council in 325. The Ether Eastern Orthodox, rather, argue that this canon prevented any modification of the creed by any individual or body, including ecumenical councils, by the way. Once it's there, it's there. The creed quoted in the Acts of the Council of Ephesus in 431 is that of the First Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, without the modifications made by the Second Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in 381, such as the addition of who proceeds from the Father. This change was seen as addressing teachings outside of the Church, particularly the teachings of Macedonius I of Constantinople, without altering the original orthodoxy of the Creed. Therefore, the word different in the seventh canon of the Council of Ephesus is understood to mean contradictory, rather than merely adding explanatory elements to the existing creed. Additionally, there were other catalysts for the schism, including variants over liturgical practices, although these were considered less significant compared to the disputes over papal authority and the Nicene Creed. Now, here's the big one. The major break between the churches of Rome and Constantinople occurred in 863 and lasted for several years due to a series of events surrounding the deposition of Patriarch Ignatius of Constantinople and his replacement by Patriarch Photios, enforced by Byzantine Emperor Michael III. In response to the deposition of Ignatius and the appointment of Photios, Pope Nicholas I held a synod at the Lateran in 863. This synod reverted the decisions made in 858, confirmed Ignatius as Patriarch, and anathemized Photios. However, this intervention by the Pope was viewed as unacceptable by the East, as it was seen as an intrusion into the process of election 
and confirmation of patriarchs in the ecclesial jurisdictions outside Rome's authority. Additionally, the Pope's attempt to remove Photios and reappoint Ignatius was seen as meddling in matters of imperial authority and the internal affairs of the Eastern churches, and they certainly did not appreciate that. Well, in response to the actions of Pope Nicholas I, Patriarch Photios convened a council in 867 at Constantinople. The council deposed Pope Nicholas I, condemned the teaching of the Filioque Clause, and excommunicated Nicholas. Pope Adrian II succeeded Nicholas after his death. However, the council's decisions were later annulled by the Constantinople Council in 869-70. to Following the Council of Constantinople of 870, the Council of Constantinople in 880 restored the conclusions of the Council of 867. The Roman Catholic Church rejects the councils of 861, 67, and 880, but accepts the councils of 870. I know, it's so easy, right? Now, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Leading up to 1054, relations between the papacy and the Byzantine court were relatively positive. Relatively. Emperor Constantine the Ninth and Pope Leo the Ninth were allied against pretty common enemies, particularly the Normans, who were imposing Latin customs in areas under their control, with papal approval, by the way. However, the defeat of the papal forces at the Battle of Civite in 1053 where Pope Leo the Ninth was captured and imprisoned, strained relations between the papacy and the Byzantine court. The absence of the Lombard Catapran Argyrus, a key figure in the alliance between Pope Leo and Constantine, further exacerbated the rift. Meanwhile, Patriarch Michael I of Constantinople made it a habit of criticizing Western practices, such as the use of unleavened bread, which he deemed as Judaistic. The criticism was conveyed to Pope Leo IX by Humbert of Mormotiers, who then translated it into Latin and brought it to the Pope's attention. In response, Pope Leo sent a letter to the Patriarch Michael Keralius, citing the donation of Constantine, a forgery that claimed papal primacy, which the Patriarch then rejected. The situation escalated when Humbert, along with other legates, arrived in Constantinople in the April of 1054 to address the ongoing disputes. However, their reception was hostile, and they stormed out of the palace, leaving behind a contentious letter for the Patriarch. The Patriarch refused to recognize their authority, and when Pope Leo IX died later that month, the legates continued to assert their authority despite the legal technicality of their mandate ending with the Pope's death. Well, the events leading up to the proper Great Schism in 1054 reached a climax when the papal legates frustrated with Patriarch Michael of Constantinople's refusal to address the issues at hand got together and decided to take drastic action. On July 16, 1054, they issued a charter of excommunication directed against Patriarch Michael, Archbishop Leo of Ohrid, and their followers. 
Well, this charter listed 11 accusations against Michael and his supporters ranging from promoting eunuchs to the episcopacy, to refusing communion to women who were menstruating. The legates then entered the Hagia Sophia during divine liturgy and placed the charter on the altar, officially excommunicating those named. The Hagia Sophia is the main church, or rather, was the main church in Constantinople. It is now the main mosque in Istanbul. But they still kept up a lot of the decorations, so that was nice of them. Well, two days later, they left Constantinople, leaving behind a city on the brink of a riot. Patriarch Michael supported by the people, retaliated by holding a synod on July 20th, 1054, when he excommunicated the legates in return, hitting them with the Uno reverse card, it seems. The tension between the papal legates and the Byzantine authorities escalated further when the patriarch had Argus's family arrested to appease the angry populace. Although an imperial envoy attempted to invite the legates back for further discussions, they failed to return and departed for Rome. In response, Patriarch Michael presided over the synod that formally anathemized the legates on July 24, 1054, and burned copies of their charter while placing the original in the Patriarchal Archive. The events surrounding the Great Schism of 1054, particularly the actions of Cardinal Humbert and Patriarch Michael I, were marked by confrontations and mutual excommunications. However, these actions did not immediately lead to a complete and irreversible schism between the East and Western churches. Cardinal Humbert's choice as a papal legate was criticized, as both he and Patriarch Michael I were described as men of stiff and intransigent temper. Their initial encounter was unfriendly, and the Patriarch refused to engage further with the legates. Eventually, Cardinal Humbert simply lost patience and issued that charter of excommunication against Patriarch Michael. Well, it was more of a game of, oh yeah, well how about this? Each trying to outdo each other. Now, although these events are the ones that were often cited as the consummation of the schism in 1054, it's important to note that the schism was not finalized by these mutual excommunications. The charter of excommunication targeted only Patriarch Michael Silaranius, Archbishop Leo of Ocrid and their inheritance, without implying a general excommunication of the Byzantine Church. It was targeted more at individuals rather than the overall structure. And because of this, this dispute could have potentially been resolved without leading to a permanent schism, similar to the excommunication of any of the bishops that weren't towing the line or perhaps had too many of their own ideas. Well, the schism began to deepen when other Eastern patriarchs rallied behind Cerularius, a move bolstered by the support of Emperor Michael. However, some have questioned the validity of the charter. Given that Pope Leo had passed away at the time, raising doubts about the legate's authority to issue such a document at all. Well, 
either way. The significance of the events in 1054 was not immediately recognized by many contemporary historians and church members. Despite the formal actions taken by leaders on both sides, ordinary Christians in the East and West remained blissfully unaware of any substantial change in their relations. Intercommunication between the two churches continued, and the perceived division between them was not yet fully realized. Imagine this. Something as, to me, comical. Correct me if I'm wrong, any very orthodox Christians in the, in, who are viewing this. But just, just imagine that if you had a friend, and he was in Rome, you were in Constantinople, and you went to see him, you knock on the door, and he says, I'm not letting you in. You say, why not? And he says, because you make your bread differently to I. Don't you think that just sounds so ridiculous? I'm sure the problems were a little bit more deeper than that, but I, I would assume that the majority of people would see a lot of these issues as somewhat trivial. The bigger picture being a lot more important. If your friend is a Christian and you're a Christian too, then, well, just get along with each other. Well, I digress. Even in the years following 1054, friendly relations persisted, and the sense of separation between East and West was not deeply felt among the faithful. For example, in 1089, the Russian church commemorated the translation of the relics of St. Nicholas to, of Mira to Italy, without any strong sense of division from the Western church at all. The fluidity of the whole situation is reflected in differing interpretations of the geographical division between the East and West. Some areas, such as southern Italy, were interpreted differently in maps drawn up in the West, compared to those in regions where Eastern Orthodoxy predominated. Well, additionally, even in regions where rulers officially aligned with one church, there were instances of individuals and communities adhering to the other side. Efforts to reconcile the churches were made by both popes and patriarchs in the centuries following the events of 1054. However, various factors and historical developments over time only contributed to a widening of the separation between the East and Western churches. And you can certainly see it in so many aspects, how different the Eastern Orthodox Church is to the Catholic Church, and to the rather more, I call it, Americanized Christianity that we see in the United States. Um, everybody has their own beliefs, certainly. Well, thank you very much for listening been a bit of a long video, so I appreciate your patience. I hope that you learned something. Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, ruled as the King of the Franks from 768 and later as Emperor of the Carolingian Empire until his death in 814. His reign marked a pivotal moment in the history of Europe often regarded as the founding of both the French and German monarchies, and the beginning of the Carolingian Renaissance. His expansive military campaigns across Western Europe consolidated a vast realm that laid the foundation for modern Europe, promoting the spread of Christianity, 
unifying various Germanic peoples under one rule, and fostering an intellectual renaissance that would influence the continent for centuries to come. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, good to meet you, and if you're coming back for more, it's good to see you again. If you'd like to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in the description. Otherwise, like, comment and subscribe certainly helps YouTube push my videos out to a broader audience. Did you like? Good job, thank you in advance. So now, without further ado, let's get on with the topic of the day. A biography of Charlemagne. Get yourself comfortable. Let's start from the beginning. By the 6th century, the Franks, a western Germanic tribe, had already embraced Christianity, largely due to the conversion of their king, Clovis I, to Catholicism. Following the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, the Franks established the Kingdom of Francia in Gaul. This kingdom expanded to encompass most of modern France and Switzerland, as well as smaller parts of Germany and the Low Countries under the rule of the Merovingian dynasty. However, Francia often experienced division under different Merovingian kings due to the Frankish practice of partible inheritance. In the late 7th century, Francia faced internal turmoil following the assassination of King Childeric II, leading to factional struggles among the Frankish aristocracy. In 687, Pepin of Herstal, the mayor of the palace of Austrasia, brought an end to the conflict with his victory at the Battle of Tertri. Pepin, who was the grandson of Arnulf of Metz and Pepin of Landen, emerged as a prominent figure in Austrasian politics. But upon Pepin's death, his son, Charles, succeeded him, and became known as Charles Martel. Now Charles did not support a Merovingian successor after the death of King Theodoric IV in 737, and left the throne vacant. Instead, he had the plan to divide the kingdom between his sons, Carloman and Pepin the Short, who succeeded him after his death in 741. The brothers later placed the Merovingian Childeric III on the throne in 743. Several years later, in 747, Carloman abdicated and retired to a monastery close by to Rome, leaving his son, Drogo, to succeed him. Charlemagne, also known as Charles the Great, was born as the eldest son of Pepin the Short and his wife, Bertada. Bertada hailed from an influential noble family in Austrasia. However, the exact date of Charlemagne's birth remains a little uncertain, with different sources proposing various years. And this isn't anything strange. Records from that time are a little bit spotty. One tradition, influenced by the 9th century biographer Einhard, suggests that Charlemagne was born in, born rather, in 742, based on Einhard's report that Charlemagne was 72 years old at the time of his death. However, Einhard's knowledge of Charlemagne's life in the early years was limited, and he may have provided an approximate date following the model of Roman imperial biographies. There is another view, however, and it points to a near-contemporary addition to the Annales Petaviani, which records Charlemagne's birth 
in 747. Lorsch Abbey commemorated Charlemagne's birth on April 2nd, from the mid-9th century onwards, and this date is likely considered to be genuine. Considering that the analysts had marked the start of the year from Easter rather than January 1st, some historians have argued that April 2nd in the recorded year would have corresponded to 748. Consequently, April the 2nd, 748, is generally accepted as Charlemagne's likely birth date. Now, there is some speculation regarding concerns around the legitimacy of Charlemagne due to uncertainties surrounding the marriage date of Pepin and Bertardo. If Pepin and Bertardo did not marry until 749, Charlemagne may have been considered illegitimate. Additionally, the precise place of Charlemagne's birth also remains unknown, although scholars have suggested various Frankish places, including those in Veres, Surman, and Kiersny, as possible locations, but we're yet to come to a complete consensus on it. Now, Einhard, in his writings, mentions Charlemagne's Patrius Sermo, which translates to native tongue. Most scholars interpret this as a form of old High German, likely a Rhenish Franconian dialect. However, due to the spread of the evolving of old French language in Francia, Charlemagne most likely grew up bilingual, speaking both Germanic and Romance dialects. In addition to his vernacular languages, it's reported that Charlemagne was proficient in Latin and possibly had some understanding of Greek. Of course, Greek was little by little falling out of fashion. While Charlemagne's father, Pepin, received education at the Abbey of St. Denis, the extent of Charlemagne's formal schooling is another matter of uncertainty. It is likely that he received training in military matters during his youth at his father's court, which travelled frequently. Charlemagne emphasised the importance of liberal arts education, encouraging its study among his children and others. However, it's once again unclear whether he pursued formal education in his youth, or took it up later on at his life in the court. Which brings us to the manner of his literacy. While some believe that he could read, based on some circumstantial evidence, others argue that there is very little direct evidence to support the claim. Charlemagne typically had texts read aloud to him and dictated responses and decrees, which was pretty much common practice for literate rulers of the time anyway. While it's likely that he attempted to learn writing in later life, Einhardt, our main source on his early life, uh, does not explicitly mention Charlemagne's ability to read. So, while it is possible that he could, it remains a bit of a mystery. Now, during the reign of Pepin, there are only occasional references to Charlemagne in the Frankish annals. By 751 or 52, Pepin had deposed Childeric and replaced him as king. Early Carolingian influence sources claim that Pepin's seizure of the throne was sanctioned beforehand by Pope Stephen II. But modern historians somewhat dispute this for the most part. It is likely, however, that 
Papal approval came only when Stephen travelled to Francia in 754, apparently to request Pepin's aid against the Lombards. And on this trip, he anointed Pepin as king, thus legitimizing his rule. Charlemagne, along with his brother Carloman, was anointed along with their father during this event. And at the same time, or around there so, Pepin sidelined his son Drogo, sending him and his brother away to a monastery. Charlemagne began issuing charters in his own name in 760, and joined his father's campaign against Aquitaine in the following year. After Pepin's death in 768, Charlemagne and Carloman succeeded their fathers as joint rulers. They had separate coronations, and while they maintained separate palaces and spheres of influence, they were considered joint rulers of the Frankish kingdom. The immediate concern for the brothers was the ongoing rebellion in Aquitaine, which Charlemagne ultimately subdued after Carloman withdrew from the campaign. Now Carloman's refusal to participate in the war against Aquitaine caused a pretty large rift between the brothers, quite a conflict of interest. And while the reasons for Carloman's abandonment of the campaign are a bit of a mystery, it probably stemmed from disagreements over territorial control, or perhaps Carloman's focus on securing his rule in the northern part of Francia. Well, whichever way it was, despite their differences, Charlemagne and Carloman maintained a joint rule, for practical reasons mainly, and they sought support from the clergy and local elites to further solidify their positions. Which brings us to 771, where Carloman suddenly passed away. And this, of course, left Charlemagne as the sole king of the Franks. Well, Charlemagne moved quickly to secure his brother's territory, forcing Carloman's widow and children to flee to Desiderius's court in Lombardy. In response, Charlemagne ended his marriage to Desiderius's daughter, and got a new wife, Hildegard, the daughter of Count Gerald, to strengthen his hold on Carloman's kingdom, and gain support from Gerald himself. Now, Charlemagne's first campaign as the sole king of the Franks was against the Saxons on the eastern frontier. The Saxons had been raiding the Frankish border, prompting Charlemagne to respond by destroying the pagan shrine at Eresburg and seizing their treasures. This victory not only enhanced Charlemagne's reputation, but it also provided desperately needed funds for further military actions, and it marked the beginning of over thirty years of continuous warfare against the Saxons. In 722, Pope Adrian I sought Charlemagne's support in recovering territories captured by Desiderius, the Lombard king. Concerned about the presence of Carloman's sons in the Lombard court, Charlemagne gathered his forces to intervene, and despite attempts at diplomacy, including offering gold to Desiderius, Charlemagne's army crossed the Alps to besiege Pavia, the Lombard capital, in late 773. During the siege, Charlemagne's wife Hildegard gave birth to a daughter, Adelaide. Charlemagne left part of his army under the command of his uncle Bernard, to continue the siege while he captured Verona, 
where Desiderius's son had taken Carloman's sons captive. However, the fate of Carloman's sons and wife remains unknown. Another mystery that we've yet to figure out. Well, after celebrating Easter in Rome in April 774, the break was over, and Charlemagne continued the siege at Pavia. And he got a little bit lucky, because disease had actually struck the besieged Lombards. Tends to happen when you're all crowded in so close together. And it led to their surrender by June. Charlemagne then deposed Desiderius and proclaimed himself the king of the Lombards. The subsequent annexation of the Lombard kingdom by Charlemagne was unprecedented, but he was able to support, secure support rather, from Lombard nobles and urban elites, which made the takeover mostly peaceful. Desiderius and his family were confined to a monastery for the rest of their lives. How boring. And Charlemagne returned to Francia with the Lombard royal treasury. In Charlemagne's absence in Italy, the Saxons took advantage and raided the Frankish borderlands. Well, they weren't going to stand for that so in response the Franks launched a counter-raid in the autumn of 774 and initiated a full campaign against the Saxons in 775. Charlemagne was then compelled to return to Italy when Duke Frogord of Friuli rebelled against him. Charlemagne swiftly crushed this rebellion, redistributing Frogord's lands to Franks to solidify his rule in Lombardy. He then spent the winter in Italy, issuing charters and legislations to further consolidate his power, as well as taking a few Lombard hostages for good measure. Amidst these campaigns, his other daughter, Rotrude, was born back in Francia. Upon returning to the north, Charlemagne conducted another campaign against the Saxons in 776, resulting in the submission of many Saxons who surrendered captives, lands, and converted to Christianity. In the following year of 777, Charlemagne convened an assembly at Paderborn, attended by the Frankish and Saxon representatives. Many of the Saxons in attendance pledged allegiance to Charlemagne, but the Saxon leader Widukind fled to Denmark to prepare for a brand new rebellion. During the Paderborn assembly, Charlemagne also received representatives from Al-Andalus, or Muslim Spain. They sought Charlemagne's support for the restoration of Yusuf ibn Ad al-Rahman al-Fihri, the ousted governor of Cordoba. Sorry about that, the Islamic names are a little difficult. Additionally, Suleiman al-Arabi, governor of Barcelona and Girona, expressed his desire to join the Frankish kingdom and seek Charlemagne's protection against Cordoban rule seeking an opportunity to strengthen his southern frontier and expand influence further, Charlemagne agreed to intervene. Crossing the Pyrenees, Charlemagne's army encountered very little resistance, until they faced an ambush by Basque forces at the Battle of Roncevaux Pass in 778. The Franks suffered defeat in the battle, and withdrew from the campaign, albeit with most of their army intact. Upon his return to Francia, 
Charlemagne was greeted by the birth of his twin sons, Louis and Lothair, born while he was away in Spain. Tragically, Lothair passed away in infancy. Well, meanwhile, the Saxons had taken advantage of Charlemagne's absence to once again launch another raid. In response, Charlemagne dispatched an army to Saxony in 779 while he addressed domestic matters, such as holding assemblies, legislating, and a rather pressing famine in Francia. During this time, Hildegard gave birth to another daughter, Bertha. Charlemagne's certainly attacking on all fronts, isn't he? Now, he himself returned to Saxony in 780, overseeing assemblies where he received hostages from Saxon nobles and supervised their baptisms. In the spring of 781, Charlemagne and Hildegard traveled with their younger children to Rome, fulfilling a request made by Pope Adrian in 775. During their visit, Adrian baptized Carloman, Charlemagne's son from Hildegard, and renamed him Pepin. Louis and the newly named Pepin were anointed and crowned, with Pepin appointed as king of the Longbards, and Louis as king of Aquitaine. Both young kings were sent to reside in their respective kingdoms under the guidance of regents and advisers. Now during this trip, Hildegard, guess what, gave birth to her eighth child, Gisela. Tragically, upon the family's return to Francia, Hildegard passed away, mainly due to complications from childbirth, followed shortly by her newborn daughter. Charlemagne arranged for epitaphs for both his wife and daughter, and ensured that daily masses were held at Hildegard's tomb. Shortly after, his mum, Betrada, also passed away. And by the end of the year, Charlemagne remarried to Fastrada, the daughter of the East Frankish Count Radolf. So he can't have been too upset about it. Well, in the summer of 782, Widukind returned from Denmark and launched an attack on the Frankish positions in Saxony, managing to defeat a Frankish army possibly due to internal rivalry among the Frankish counts that were leading it. Upon learning of this defeat, Charlemagne hurried to Verdun, but Widukind had already fled before his arrival. Charlemagne then summoned the Saxon magnates to an assembly and compelled them to surrender prisoners to him, viewing their previous actions as treachery. The annals report that Charlemagne ordered the execution of four and a half thousand Saxon prisoners in what is known as the Massacre of Verdun. He shed the blood of the Saxon men. While the exact number might be exaggerated, historians do agree on the basic truth of the event, with some regarding it as a significant stain on Charlemagne's reputation. Now, in the aftermath of this massacre, Charlemagne issued the Capitulatio de Partibus Saxoniae Legal Code, which included harsh laws penalizing pagan practices with death. Can't get more harsh than that, can't you? This legal code aimed at forcibly converting Saxons to Christianity, but also suppressing their cultural identity. And it certainly seemed to do its uh, intended purpose. 
For the next several years, Charlemagne focused on completing the subjugation of the Saxons. He concentrated his efforts in Westphalia in 783, and pushed into Thuringia in 784, while his son, Charles the Younger, continued operations in the West. Throughout these campaigns, the Frankish armies seized wealth and enslaved Saxon captives. Notably, Charlemagne continued campaigning through the winter months instead of resting his army. By 785, Charlemagne had effectively subdued Saxon resistance and gained full control of Westphalia. And in the summer of that year, he met once again with Wittekind and persuaded him to surrender. He also convinced him to get baptized with Charlemagne as his godfather. And with that, it marked the end of the last phase of the Saxon Wars. Well, almost. In 786, Charlemagne travelled to Italy with the aim of extending his influence further into the south. Upon his arrival he marched into the Duchy of Benevento, where Duke Arecus initially fled to a fortified position at Salerno, before eventually offering Charlemagne his fealty. Charlemagne accepted the submission, along with hostages, including Arecus's son, Grimoald. During his time in Italy, Charlemagne also met with envoys from Constantinople. However, Empress Irene's exclusion of Charlemagne and Frankish bishops from the 787 Second Council of Nicaea led to Charlemagne breaking the betrothal between his daughter Rotrud and Constantine the Sixth. Following Charlemagne's departure from Italy, Duke Arecus sent envoys to Empress Irene to promise an allegiance against the Franks. However, before finalizing his plans, both Arecus and his elder son Romuald died of illness within weeks of each other. It's pretty convenient, don't you think? Well, Charlemagne then sent Grimoald back to Benevento to serve as a duke and return it to Frankish suzerainty. Although a Byzantine army invaded Lombardy as part of the planned alliance, they were repulsed by the combined forces of the Franks and Lombards. Meanwhile, Charlemagne turned his attention to Bavaria, ruled by his first cousin, Duke Tassilo. Tensions between the two rulers escalated, leading to Charlemagne's invasion of Bavaria in 787. Tassilo ultimately surrendered and recognized Charlemagne as his overlord. However, in the following year of 17, 788, rather, Tassilo was accused of plotting with the Avars against Charlemagne, and was subsequently deposed and sent to a monastery. Charlemagne spent the following years consolidating his rule in Bavaria and warring against the Avars. In 789 he granted rule over Maine in Neustria to his son, Charles the Younger, leaving his other son, Pepin the Hunchback, <laughs> very unfortunate title, without any lands at all. Well, Pepin's marginalization in the succession led to a failed conspiracy in 792, where he attempted to assassinate Charlemagne and his brothers. The plot was discovered, and then Pepin got sent to a monastery as well. And this monastery must be getting pretty full. During the early 790s, Charlemagne focused on mainly ecclesiastical affairs, convening councils at Regensburg in 792 and Frankfurt in 794 
to address theological controversies and enact reforms. Following the council at Frankfurt, Charlemagne's wife, Fastrada, fell ill and passed away, leading him to simply just find another wife, and he married Lutgard shortly after. During the 790s, Charlemagne intensified his efforts to subdue the ongoing Saxon resistance, launching a series of annual campaigns that lasted until 799. These campaigns were characterized by their brutality, with Charlemagne's forces systematically devastating Saxon lands and forcibly relocating many Saxons to Francia, where Frankish elites and soldiers were installed in their place. The prolonged conflict prompted Charlemagne to establish his court at Aachen, strategically located near the frontier. At Aachen he constructed a grand palace, including a chapel that would eventually become part of the Aachen Cathedral. It was during this period that Einhard, that aforementioned scholar and biographer, joined Charlemagne's court. Meanwhile, in the south, Pepin of Italy continued to engage in warfare against the Avars, contributing to the collapse of their kingdom and the expansion of the Frankish rule eastward. In addition to military campaigns, Charlemagne pursued diplomatic efforts to expand his influence further, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Britain. Although negotiations for a marriage alliance between Charles the Younger and the daughter of King Offa of Mercia failed due to Offa's insistence on reciprocal marriages, Charlemagne and Offa did manage to establish a formal peace treaty in 796. This treaty safeguarded trade and ensured the rights of English pilgrims traveling through Francia to Rome. Charlemagne also provided refuge and support to deposed English rulers, including Ebdbert of Kent, Egbert of Wessex, and Erdwulf of Northumbria, treating the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms as quasi-satellite states, and establishing direct relations with English bishops. Additionally, Charlemagne formed an alliance with Alfonso II of Asturias, although Einhard characterized Alfonso as being dependent on Charlemagne. In 795, Leo III became Pope, and faced more than a little bit of political opposition from his accession. In 799 his adversaries accused him of various offences, and attempted to physically harm him by gouging out his eyes and cutting out his tongue. That'll do it. Leo managed to escape and sought refuge in the north, eventually reaching Charlemagne's court to seek assistance. Charlemagne, who was engaged in his campaign against the Saxons at the time, interrupted his military operations to meet with Leo at Paderborn in September. After hearing from both the Pope and his accusers, Charlemagne decided to send Leo back to Rome with loyal legates to reinstate him as Pope and conduct further investigations into the allegations. Charlemagne himself did not immediately travel to Rome, but he made plans to do so after completing an extensive tour of his Neustrian lands. Finally, in November, near Mentiana, Charlemagne convened an assembly to examine the charges against Leo. However, instead of passing judgment on the Pope, Charlemagne allowed Leo to swear an oath of innocence on December 23rd. The oath 
was accepted. And on the 25th of the year 800, during a mass in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, Pope Leo III unexpectedly proclaimed Charlemagne as emperor and crowned him. Merry Christmas! This coronation marked Charlemagne as the first reigning emperor in the West since the deposition of Romulus Augustulus in 476. So it was a very big deal. And concurrently, Charlemagne's son, Charles the Younger, was anointed as king by Leo at the same time, so all around the family is making victories wherever you look. Now, historians have debated the intentions behind the imperial coronation. Charlemagne's level of awareness or involvement in its planning is also up for debate, and its significance at both the at the time and for Charlemagne's reign. Some contemporary sources suggest that Charlemagne may have been somewhat surprised by the coronation, while others argue that it was a carefully orchestrated event, planned entirely by Charlemagne himself. Either way, the coronation had profound implications for the relationship between the Frankish kingdom and the papacy, but also for the concept of imperial authority in the Christian West. The significance of the Roman Empire in European politics during the time of Leo III and Charlemagne cannot be overstated, particularly in Italy where the Byzantine Empire held considerable territory. Irene's ascent to the throne in Constantinople in 797 as the first reigning Byzantine empress faced opposition due to both her gender and her method of accession. Having deposed her blinded son, Constantine the Sixth, I bet he didn't see that coming. The presence of a female ruler in Constantinople was seen by some contemporary sources, like the Annals of Loge, as a justification for Leo III to crown Charlemagne as emperor. However, this assertion is also debated, with some arguing that the coronation was not directly related to Irene's reign. Now, the decision of Charlemagne to assume the imperial title had various implications. Some argue that it was aimed at incorporating the Saxons into the Frankish realm, while others just say it was intended to enhance Charlemagne's influence in Italy by appealing to the traditional authority recognized by Italian elites. Either way, becoming emperor gave Charlemagne the right to impose his rule over Italy, but it also posed political and military risks including the opposition from the Byzantine Empire and potential backlash from the Frankish elite. Certainly a big sword in Charlemagne's hand, but a massive target on his back. Well, either way the coronation led to a long-standing ideological conflict with Constantinople, as it challenged the Byzantine Emperor's claim to universal Christian rulership. While Charlemagne may have viewed his role more narrowly as dominion over the lands he ruled, the imperial title bestowed upon him enhanced his prestige and ideological authority. His careful formulation of his titles in official documents, avoiding direct claim to Roman emperorship, may have been a sort of underhanded way of improving relations with the Byzantine, but while also asserting his authority over the Roman Empire in the West. After his departure from Italy in the summer of 801, 
he shifted towards a more sedentary style of rule from Arkin, marking a distinct phase in his reign. While conflicts persisted, particularly on the frontiers, this relative peace of this period allowed for increased attention to internal governance. The Franks shifted their military focus toward defending and securing the empire's borders, with Charlemagne himself rarely leading armies personally. One significant expansion during this time was the enlargement of the Spanish March counties, achieved through campaigns led by Louis against the Emirate of Cordoba, culminating in the capture of Barcelona in 801. In terms of legislation, the Capitulare Missorum Generale, issued in 802, was a comprehensive piece of legislation aimed at governing the conduct of royal officials and assuring loyalty from all free men to Charlemagne. It reformed the institution of Missi Dominici, who were now assigned in pairs to administer justice and oversee governance in specific territories. Additionally, Charlemagne ordered the revision of Lombard and Frankish law codes, he also delegated authority to his sons as sub-kings, with Pepin and Louis having devolved authority as kings in Italy and Aquitaine respectively. However, Charlemagne retained ultimate authority and intervened directly in matters when necessary. Charles, the eldest son, was given rule over Francia proper, Saxony, Nordgar, and parts of Alemannia. Pepin and Louis were confined in their kingdoms and granted additional territories. Now, following his coronation, Charlemagne sought recognition of his imperial title from Constantinople, initiating diplomatic exchanges with Empress Irene. However, Irene's subsequent deposition and replacement by Nikephoros I led to tension between the two empires, particularly over control of the Adriatic Sea. Charlemagne eventually sent envoys to Constantinople in 810 to attempt to negotiate peace, relinquishing his claims to Veneto. Despite Nikephoros' death in battle before the envoys could leave Constantinople, his successor, Michael I, confirmed the peace and recognized Charlemagne as emperor and Basilius. This acknowledgement prompted Charlemagne to issue the first Frankish coins that specifically mentioned his imperial title. Additionally, Charlemagne established diplomatic ties with the Abbasid Caliph, Harun al-Rashid, in the 790s, particularly due to their mutual interest in Spain. Harun presented Charlemagne with an elephant named Abul Abbas as a gesture of friendship. Although the Byzantines initially maintained cordial relations with the Abbasids, Charlemagne's outreach to Harun contributed to strained relations between the Frankish Empire and Constantinople. His involvement in religious matters extended to a dispute over the recitation of the nicino constantinopolitan creed. This disagreement arose when Frankish monks in Bethlehem were accused of heresy for using the philoke form of the creed which asserted that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. Charlemagne convened a council at Aachen in 809 to defend the use of the filioque, leading to a compromise with Pope Leo III, who consented to the Franks maintaining their tradition while affirming that the canonical creed did not include filioque. 
Leo commissioned two silver shields with the creed in Latin and Greek, omitting filioque, which were hung in St. Peter's Basilica. Scandinavia came into contact with the Frankish world primarily through Charlemagne's prolonged conflicts with the Saxons. Raids by Danes on Charlemagne's territories commenced around the year 800. In 804, Charlemagne conducted his final campaign in Saxony, seizing control of the territory east of the Elbe and resettling it with his obertrite allies. During this campaign, King Gudfred of Denmark, concerned about the expansion of Frankish influence, proposed peace talks with Charlemagne to potentially hand over Saxon refugees. But these negotiations did not succeed. And we don't know why. We simply just know that they didn't happen. The northern frontier remained relatively calm until 808, when Gudfred, along with allied Slavic tribes, launched an incursion into Obertrite lands, extracting tribute from significant portions of the territory. Charles the Younger led a Frankish army in response, targeting some of Gudfred's Slavic allies. Gudfred attempted diplomatic overtures again in 809, but peace was not achieved. Later on in 810, Danish pirates raided Frisia, although their connection to Gudfred remains a little uncertain. In response, Charlemagne dispatched an army to secure Frisia while leading a force against Gudfred himself, who had reportedly challenged Charlemagne to battle. However, before Charlemagne's arrival, Gudfred was assassinated by two of his own men, nonetheless. Well, following Gudfred's death, his nephew and successor, Hemming, promptly sought peace, leading to a final settlement negotiated by Charlemagne's cousin Walla in 811. While the Danes did not pose a significant threat for the remainder of Charlemagne's reign, the consequences of these conflicts along with Charlemagne's earlier expansions in Saxony, contributed to the conditions that would later fuel the intense Viking raids across Europe in the ninth century. And yes, I'll get to them eventually, don't worry. Now, the Carolingian dynasty faced multiple losses in the years of 810 and 811, with Charlemagne experiencing the deaths of his sister Gisela, his daughter Rotrude, and his sons Pepin the Hunchback, Pepin of Italy, and Charles the Younger. These losses disrupted Charlemagne's earlier plans for succession, leading him to declare Pepin of Italy's son Bernard as ruler of Italy, and designating his only surviving son Louis as heir to the entire empire. To ensure the orderly transfer of power, Charlemagne completed a new will, detailing the disposition of his prophecy, including bequests to the church and all of his children and grandchildren. Now Einhard, possibly drawing on literary conventions from works like Suetonius's The Twelve Caesars recounts that Charlemagne interpreted the deaths of his family members, along with an accident he suffered falling off a horse, celestial phenomena, and structural collapses in his place, palace rather, as omens of his impending death. Nevertheless, he continued to govern, and quite energetically, in his final year, convening bishops for ecclesiastical councils and ultimately organizing a large assembly at Aachen. In this assembly, held on the 11th of September 813, Charlemagne formally crowned Louis as his co-emperor, 
and Bernard as king. It was from here that Charlemagne's health began to decline, around the autumn of 813, and he spent his last months engaged in prayer, fasting, and studying the Gospels. He ultimately succumbed to pleurisy and became bedridden for several days before passing away on the morning of the 28th of January, 814. Now, according to a biographer of Louis, namely Thegan, Charlemagne's last words were a quote from the book of Luke 2346. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. His body was prepared and buried in the chapel at Aachen on the same day by his daughters and palace officials. Louis arrived at Aachen thirty days after his father's death to con assume control of the palace and the empire, which formally marked his accession. Charlemagne's remains were later exhumed and reinterred into a new casket by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa in 1165, and then again finally laid to rest in 1215 by Frederick II. Saladin Born Yusuf in Tikrit, Iraq, hailed from a Kurdish family with roots in the village of Ajdanakan, near Dvin in Armenia. His family, assimilated into the Arabic-speaking world, had ties to the Rawadia tribe. His father, Nam ad-Din Ayyub, served as a warden of Tikrit, where they provided refuge to Zengi's defeated army in 1132. Later, due to a conflict with Mujahid al-Din Biruz, they were banished from Tikrit and settled in Mosul. Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's great to have you here again for another video. Today, we are going to look at Saladin, the great commander of the Muslim forces during the Crusades. If you'd like to support the channel, head on over to my Patreon. Or just like, comment, and subscribe to help YouTube push this out to more viewers. Now, without further ado, let's begin. Saladin's childhood in Damascus is veiled in mystery, but his education was comprehensive. While he displayed proficiency in various subjects, including Euclid and arithmetic, his deep understanding of the Quran and religious studies distinguished him from his peers. Despite academic prowess, he leaned more towards religious studies, likely influenced by the capture of Jerusalem during the First Crusade. Saladin's linguistic skills were impressive, encompassing Kurdish, Arabic, Turkish, and Persian, showcasing his intellectual breadth and cultural adaptability. Saladin's religious beliefs and practices reflect a deep commitment to orthodox Sunni Islam, characterized by piety, devotion to jihad, and opposition to heterodox movements. According to Baha ad-Din Shahad, Saladin was a devout Muslim who found solace in Quran recitations prayed regularly, and exhibited a strong aversion to philosophies and beliefs that were contrary to the most orthodox version of Islam. His reverence for the sacred texts and adherence to religious rituals underscored his unwavering commitment to his faith. Despite his opposition to certain Sufi individuals, Saladin was a patron of Sufi institutions including Kangas and Zawiyas in Egypt and Syria. His endorsement of Sufism 
reflects his recognition of its spiritual value within Islam and his desire to promote religious devotion and piety among his subjects. His dedication to jihad was a central aspect of his religious identity. He viewed jihad as a sacred duty and exhibited zeal in its pursuit, prioritizing military endeavors over many other activities. His unwavering focus on jihad exemplifies his commitment to defending Islam and combating its enemies. His actions against individuals like Qadid al-Kafaz and Yahya al-Surawadi, whom he perceived as deviating from orthodox Islamic teachings, highlight his staunch opposition to heterodox movements. His efforts to suppress groups like the Order of Assassins underscore his commitment to upholding Sunni orthodoxy and combating perceived threats to Islamic unity and integrity. Saladin's patronage of Kankas and Zawiyas was not only a means of fostering spiritual growth, but also of promoting religious knowledge and piety among his closest subjects. By endowing these institutions, Saladin sought to create environments conducive to religious scholarship and orthodoxy, furthering the dissemination of Sunni teachings and practices. Now, on to Saladin's military career. His military career began under the guidance of his uncle, Asad ad-Din Shirku, a prominent military leader serving under Nur ad-Din, the Zengid Emir of Damascus and Aleppo. Saladin's education and training in military affairs were heavily influenced by Shirku, who played a pivotal role in shaping his nephew's military prowess. In 1163, the Fatimid vizier Shawar sought military assistance from Nur ad-Din to reclaim his position in Egypt, which had been usurped by his rival Dirgam. Nur ad-Din dispatched Shirku, accompanied by Saladin, who was then 26 years old, to support Shawar's cause. Saladin's involvement in this expedition was initially a minor one, tasked with logistical duties such as collecting supplies from Bilbeis before its siege by the combined forces of the Crusades and Shawar's troops. However, Saladin's role expanded during the ensuing Battle of Al-Balbain, fought on the desert border of the Nile, Positioned on the right wing of the Sengit army, Saladin played a crucial role in the battle's outcome. Muslim sources indicate that Saladin was initially stationed in the baggage of the center, with instructions to lure the enemy into a trap by feigning a retreat. Despite early successes by the Crusader force, the unforgivable terrain ultimately hindered their progress and Saladin's tactical maneuvering contributed to the Zengid victory. This battle, the Battle of Al-Balbain, is regarded as one of the most notable victories in Saladin's early military career, although the extent of the triumph remains debated among historians. Following the battle, Saladin and Shirku proceeded towards Alexandria, where they received a warm welcome and additional resources. However, faced with a superior Crusader Egyptian force besieging the city, Shirku opted to divide his army, with Saladin entrusted with defending Alexandria while the main force took its chance to withdraw. In the power struggle over Egypt, Shirku found himself at odds with Shawar and Amalric I of Jerusalem, leading to Shawar's request for assistance from Amalric. 
In 1169, Shoah was reportedly assassinated, with Saladin implicated in his death, and Shirku passed away later that year. Following Shirku's demise, several candidates were considered for the vizier role to Al-Adid, most of whom were Kurds. The ethnic solidarity among the Kurds influenced the Ayyubid's family's political maneuvers, with Saladin and his inner circle cautious of Turkish influence. Despite Nur ad-Din selecting a successor for Shirku, Al-Adid appointed Saladin to replace Shawar as a vizier. The rationale behind the Shia Caliph Al-Adid's selection of Saladin, a Sunni, varies among historical records. Ibn al-Athir suggests that Saladin was chosen due to his perceived weakness and a lack of obedience among the other emirs although he eventually gained their acceptance after negotiations. Others speculate that Saladin's appointment was engineered by Al-Adid's advisors to weaken the Syria-based Zengids, or based on his family's reputation for generosity and military prowess. Inaugurated as vizier on the 26th of March, Saladin underwent a transformation, renouncing wine-drinking and adopting an even more devout religious demeanor. Despite gaining considerable power and influence, Saladin grappled with loyalty conflicts between Al-Adid and Nur ad-Din. Later that year, Saladin faced internal challenges including an assassination attempt orchestrated by Egyptian soldiers and emirs. With intelligence from his chief, Ali ibn Safyan, Saladin thwarted the conspiracy, arresting and executing the chief conspirator. Subsequently, a revolt erupted involving black African soldiers and Egyptian factions that were opposed to Saladin's rule. But by the 23rd of August, Saladin had decisively quelled the uprising, solidifying his grip on power in Cairo. Towards the end of 1169, Saladin, reinforced by troops by Nur ad-Din, achieved a significant victory over a large crusader Byzantine coalition near Damietta, Following this success, in the spring of 1170, Nur ad-Din complied with Saladin's request and sent his father to Egypt. This move was encouraged by the Abbasid Caliph al-Mustanjid, who sought to pressure Saladin into deposing his rival Caliph al-Ad. Saladin, meanwhile, continued to consolidate his power in Egypt and expand his support base. In an effort to solidify his authority, Saladin appointed family members to prominent positions, and initiated the construction of several religious institutions. He commissioned the building of a college for the Malachi sect of Sunni Islam in the city, as well as another for the Shafi denomination to which he belonged located in Al-Fustat. Having established himself in Egypt, Saladin turned his attention to the Crusaders and launched a campaign against them, laying siege to Darum in 1170. In response, King Amalric withdrew his Templar garrison from Gaza to reinforce the defense of Darum. Despite this, Saladin managed to outmaneuver the Crusader forces and capture Gaza in 1187. Subsequently, in 1191, Saladin destroyed the fortifications in Gaza that had been constructed by King Baldwin III for the Knights Templar. 
So around the same time as this, around 1191, Saladin targeted the Crusader Castle of Eilat, situated on the island at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. Although the castle did not pose a significant threat to Muslim naval passage, it could harass smaller Muslim ships, and that is a problem. Therefore, Saladin decided to capture and dismantle it, and he did, further securing his control over the region. According to Imad ad-Din, Nur ad-Din urged Saladin in June 1171 to re-establish the Abbasid Caliphate in Egypt, a task that Saladin carried out no more than two months later. This decision was further encouraged by Najam al-Din ad-Kabushani, a prominent Shafi fiqah who opposed Shia rule in Egypt. Saladin coordinated the execution of several Egyptian emirs, presenting their deaths to al-Adid as a suppression of the rebellion. Al-Adid subsequently fell ill, or was perhaps poisoned, while on his deathbed he requested Saladin's visit to care for his younger children. However, fearing treachery against the Abbasids, Saladin declined the request, a decision he later regretted upon learning of Al-Adid's intentions. Al-Adid passed away on the 13th of September, and five days later, the Abbasid Caliphate was reinstated in Cairo and Al-Fustat, with Al-Mustadi proclaimed as the new Caliph. On the 25th of September, Saladin departed to Cairo to participate in a joint attack on Kerak and Montreal, the desert castles of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, alongside Nur ad-Din, who would attack from Syria. However, Saladin withdrew back to Cairo upon receiving reports of increased support from Crusader leaders for traitors within Egypt, aimed at weakening his power. Nur ad-Din proceeded with the attack alone. During the summer of 1173, a Nubian army, along with the Armenian former Fatimid troops, assembled on the Egyptian border, preparing to besiege Aswan. Saladin sent reinforcements under his brother Turan Shah to assist the Emir of Aswan. The Nubians were repelled, but they later returned in that year and were once again defeated. Egyptian forces, led by Turan Shah, advanced from Aswan and captured the Nubian town of Ibrim. Saladin while transporting goods to Damascus as a gift for Nur ad-Din, utilized the opportunity to conduct raids on Crusader territory, targeting Muslim Bedouins living there to deprive the Franks of their guides. In the July of the same year, 1173, Saladin's father, Ayub, was injured on a horse-riding incident and passed away on the 9th of August. In the same year, Saladin dispatched Turan Shah to conquer Yemen, incorporating it and its port, Aden, into the territories of the Ayyubid dynasty. In the early summer of 1174, Nur ad-Din began mustering an army, sending summons to various regions, including Mosul, Diyarbakar and the Jazeera, indicating potential preparations for an attack against Saladin's Egypt. In response to these developments, the Ayyubids held a council to assess the threat, and Saladin gathered his troops outside of Cairo. However, on the 15th of May, 
Nur ad Din passed away after falling ill. Power was then transferred to his eleven-year-old son, As Sali Ismail al-Malik. Nur ad Din's death afforded Saladin greater political independence, and in a letter to As Sali, he pledged to act as a sword against their enemies, describing Nur ad-Din's demise as an earthquake shock. Following Nur ad-Din's death, Saladin had faced a crucial decision. He could either lead his army against the crusaders from Egypt, wait for an invitation from as Sali in Syria to come to his aid and launch war from there, or simply take it upon himself to annex Syria. However, Saladin hesitated to attack a land that had previously belonged to his master, fearing it would be perceived as hypocritical and render him unfit to lead the war against the Crusaders. He recognized that to acquire Syria, he needed either an invitation from As-Sali, or to warn him of the potential dangers from Crusader threats. As-Sali was later relocated to Aleppo under the guardianship of Gumush Tigin, the emir of the city and a veteran captain of Nur ad-Din's forces. Gumush Tigin planned to eliminate all rivals in Syria and the Jazeera, starting with Damascus. When the emir of Damascus sought assistance against Aleppo from Saif ad-Din of Mosul, who was a cousin of Gumush Tigin, his request was refused. Consequently, the Syrians turned to Saladin for help, which he accepted. Saladin rode swiftly across the desert with seven hundred chosen horsemen, passing through Al-Kirak before reaching Bosra. Upon his arrival in Damascus on the 23rd of November, he was greeted with acclaim. Despite initial resistance from the citadel of Damascus, Saladin's forces, led by his brother Tugtakin ibn Ayyub, successfully secured the surrender of the citadel after a brief siege. Saladin then established himself in the castle and received the homage and greetings of the city's inhabitants. Following his triumph at Damascus, Saladin delegated his brother Tugtakin ibn Ayyub as the governor of Damascus and then set out to conquer other cities previously under the authority of Nur ad-Din, but now practically autonomous. He swiftly seized Hama, encountering little resistance, but refrained from attacking Homs due to the formidable strength of its citadel. Saladin then turned his sights towards Aleppo, besieging the city on the 30th of December, after its ruler, Gumush Tigin, refused to relinquish power. During the siege of Aleppo, as Sali, fearing capture by Saladin, appealed to the city's inhabitants not to surrender to the invading force. To thwart Saladin's progress, Gumush Tigin sought assistance from Rashid ad-Din Sinan, chief dai of the assassins of Syria, who attempted to assassinate Saladin in his camp. However, the plot had failed, and Saladin's forces maintained their siege. In May 1175, Saladin faced significant resistance from Raymond of Tripoli, who gathered his forces to launch an attack on Muslim territory. Responding strategically, Saladin redirected his efforts towards Homs, later capturing its citadel in March 1175 after fierce resistance. These victories, however, 
alarmed Saif ad-Din, head of the Zengids, who perceived Saladin's actions as a challenge to his family's authority over Syria and Mesopotamia. In a decisive confrontation at the Horns of Hama on the 13th of April, 1175, Saladin's forces routed the combined armies of Mosul and Aleppo, forcing Asali's advisors to acknowledge Saladin's control over Damascus, Homs, and Hama, as well as other key several towns. Subsequently, Saladin proclaimed himself king and suppressed Asali's name in Friday prayers and Islamic coinage. As the power struggle between the Ayyubids and Zengids persisted, Saladin continued to consolidate his rule. In a significant turn of events, he forged a mutual alliance with Aleppo, allowing its rulers to maintain control over the city, while recognizing Saladin as the sovereign ruler of all conquered territories. This strategic move solidified Saladin's authority in Syria and paved the way for future expansion of his empire. Saladin's strategic maneuvers included truces with both his Zengid rivals and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, solidifying the temporary peace agreements to focus on other challenges. However, he faced a significant threat from the Ismaili sect, commonly known as the Assassins, led by Rashid ad-Din Sinan. Occupying nine fortresses strategically positioned in the an Nusariya mountains, the Assassins posed a formidable obstacle to Saladin's ambitions. In August 1176, Saladin led his army into the An Nusariya range to confront the assassins face to face. Despite laying waste to the surrounding countryside, Saladin's forces failed to capture any of the assassins' forts and ultimately retreated after facing staunch resistance. According to some accounts, a peace agreement was mediated between Saladin and Sinan by Saladin's uncle, the governor of Hama, leading to a cessation of hostilities between the two factions. During the siege of Masyaf, one of the assassin's strongholds, Saladin employed vigilant security measures to safeguard himself against potential threats. His guards were equipped with link lights, and chalk and cinders were scattered around his tent to detect any intrusions. According to one version of events, Saladin had narrowly escaped an assassination attempt when his guards noticed a spark descending the hill of Masyaf, leading to the discovery of a poisoned dagger and a threatening note left by the assassins. Saladin suspected Sinan himself to be behind this attempt on his life. Another account suggests that Saladin withdrew his troops from Masyaf due to the urgent need to confront a crusader force near Mount Lebanon. However, in reality, Saladin sought to forge an alliance with Sinan and the assassins, recognizing the strategic advantage of depriving the Crusaders of a potential ally. Subsequently, Saladin and Sinan maintained cooperative relations, with Sinan dispatching contingents of his forces to support Saladin in key battles against the Crusaders. This alliance underscored Saladin's pragmatism, and his willingness to engage in diplomatic maneuvers to achieve his overarching objectives of consolidating power in the region and repelling external threats. After his campaign in the Al-Nusriya mountains, 
Saladin returned to Damascus and allowed his Syrian soldiers to return home, leaving Turan Shah in charge of Syria. He then departed for Egypt with only his personal followers, arriving in Cairo on the 22nd of September. Saladin had been absent from Egypt for roughly two years at this point, and upon his return he got busy to organizing and supervising various projects aimed at fortifying and reconstructing Cairo. One of Saladin's major initiatives was the repair and extension of the city walls, along with the commencement of construction of the Cairo Citadel. He also ordered the construction of the Bir Yusuf, Joseph's Well, a deep well measuring 280 feet deep, which would serve as a vital water source for the city. Additionally, Saladin oversaw the construction of a large bridge at Giza, designated to bolster the city's defences against potential Moorish invasions. Remaining in Cairo to supervise these improvements, Saladin also established educational institutions, such as the Madrasa of the Sword Makers, and implemented reforms in the internal administration of the country. In the November of 1177, Saladin embarked on a raid into Palestine in response to the recent Crusader incursions into Damascus territory deeming the truce no longer tenable. With a significant portion of the Crusader army engaged in besieging the fortress of Harim, north of Aleppo, southern Palestine was left relatively undefended. Capitalizing on this opportunity, Saladin led his army to Ascalon, which he referred to as the Bride of Syria. William of Tyre documented that Saladin's army comprised 26,000 soldiers, including 8,000 elite forces and 18,000 soldiers from Sudan. This formidable army proceeded to raid the countryside, sack Ramla and Lod and extend their reach as far as the gates of Jerusalem, showcasing Saladin's military prowess and expanding his influence in the region. In November 1177, Saladin faced a significant setback at the Battle of Monte Gassard. Despite having a much larger army, Saladin hesitated to ambush the Crusades led by Baldwin IV of Jerusalem, fearing the skill of the Templar generals among them. Consequently, when Saladin and his men were surprised near Ramla, they were caught completely off guard. The Templar force, consisting of only 375 knights, engaged in close combat with the Ayyubid army resulting in heavy losses for Saladin. Realizing that defeat was imminent, Saladin mounted a swift camel and retreated to the territories of Egypt. However, Saladin was undeterred by this defeat and remained prepared to confront the Crusaders once again. In the spring of 1178, he camped near the walls of Homs and engaged in skirmishes with the Crusader army. His forces achieved victory over the enemy in Hama, capturing prisoners of war whom Saladin ordered to be beheaded for their actions against Muslim lands. Despite these victories, Saladin spent the remainder of the year in Syria without further confrontation with his enemies. In April 1179, Saladin received intelligence indicating that the Crusaders were planning a raid into Syria. He deployed one of his generals, Farouk Shah, to guard the Damascus frontier and instructed him to light warning beacons upon sighting the enemy. 
when the Crusaders, led by King Baldwin, advanced too rashly in pursuit of Farouk Shah's force. They were defeated by the Ayyubids. Encouraged by this victory, Saladin called for more reinforcements from Egypt to bolster his forces even more. During the summer of 1179, King Baldwin attempted to fortify Jacob's Ford, a strategic passage over the Jordan River. Despite Saladin's offer of a hefty sum to abandon the project, in response, Saladin resolved to destroy the fortress defended by the Templar knights, moving his headquarters to Banias. The ensuing battle resulted in a decisive victory for the Ayyubids, with many high-ranking knights captured and the fortress fa falling rather to Saladin's forces. In the spring of 1180, Saladin, eager to commence a vigorous campaign against the Kingdom of Jerusalem, agreed to a truce proposed by King Baldwin. Droughts and bad harvests had hampered Saladin's supplies, making the truce a rather practical choice. Despite objections from Raymond of Tripoli, the truce was upheld after Saladin's naval fleet appeared off the port of Tartus further compelling compliance from the Crusaders. In June 1180, Saladin hosted a reception for Nur ad-Din Muhammad, the Artikid Emir of Kefa at Gyaksu, where he presented him and his brother Abu Bakr with gifts valued at over 100,000 dinars. This gesture was aimed at solidifying an alliance with the Artikids and impressing the other emirs in Mesopotamia and Anatolia. Earlier, Saladin had offered to mediate between Nur ad-Din and Kilij Arslan II, the Seljuk Sultan of Rum, who were in conflict over territorial disputes. Despite Saladin's attempts, Arslan refused to return the lands given to Nur ad-Din as a dowry for marrying his daughter, alleging mistreatment of her. Saladin was enraged when he received accusations from Arslan about his further abuses against his daughter by Nur ad-Din. Threatening to attack Malatya, Saladin demanded negotiations leading to an agreement where Arslan's daughter would be sent away for a year, with strong repercussions if Nur ad-Din failed to comply. Returning to Cairo in early 1181, Saladin planned to observe the fast of Ramadan, and then undertake the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca. However, he changed his plans and was seen inspecting the Nile River banks, he faced conflicts with the Bedouin, whom he accused of trading with the Crusaders. Saladin then confiscated their grain and forced them to migrate westwards, deploying Ayyubid warships against the Bedouin river pirates. In the summer of 1181, a dispute rose involving Majad al-Din, a former deputy of Turan Shah in Zabid, Yemen. Saladin's administrator, Baha ad-Din Karakush, led a force to arrest Maj ad-Din, accused of misappropriating revenues. Despite protests of innocence, Majad ad-Din was released in exchange for a payment of 80,000 dinars. This incident highlighted the eternal strife following Turan Shah's department, departure rather, from Yemen, with Saladin expressing frustration over the lack of returns from the province. Saif ad-Din's death in the June of 1181 led to his brother 
is Ad-Din inheriting the leadership of Mosul. Later, on December 4th of the same year, as Sali, the crown prince of the Zengids, passed away in Aleppo. Before his death, he had his officers swear loyalty to Iz ad-Din, seeing him as the only Zengid ruler capable of opposing Saladin. Iz ad-Din faced challenges in managing both Aleppo and Mosul, prompting him to hand Aleppo to his brother Imad ad-Din Zangi in exchange for Sinjar. Saladin, respecting his previous treaty with the Zengids, did not oppose these arrangements. In the May of 1182, Saladin left Cairo for Syria with a significant portion of the Egyptian Ayyubid army. Despite warnings of potential crusader interception, he chose the desert route across the Sinai Peninsula to Ayla, encountering no resistance. He ravaged the countryside near Montreal, before arriving in Damascus. There, he learned of Farouk Shah's attack on the Galilee, and subsequently led his army into Galilee, sacking various towns. Although he faced a significant crusader force near Belvoir Castle, the battle was inconclusive, and Saladin withdrew due mainly to logistical difficulties. Afterwards, Saladin received an invitation from Kukbari, the Emir of Haran, to occupy the Jazeera region in northern Mesopotamia, officially ending the truce with the Zengids. Crossing the Euphrates, Saladin besieged Aleppo briefly before proceeding to capture several cities in the Jazeera region with the help of local allies. His victories included Edessa, Saruj, Raqqa, Kirkasiya, and Nusaybin, among others. Saladin's fair treatment of the conquered cities earned him quite a lot of praise even among his enemies, as he abolished certain taxes and generally improved governance. As Saladin advanced in Mesopotamia, he received reports of crusader raids near Damascus. Unperturbed, he focused on consolidating his control over the captured territories while facing raids by Zangi, the emir of Aleppo on his northern cities. Despite these challenges, Saladin remained determined to expand his influence in the region. As he approached Mosul, he faced resistance from the Zengids, who appealed to An Nasir, the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad, for support. An Nasir Influenced by his vizier who favoured the Zengids, sent Badr al-Badr to mediate between Saladin and Iz ad-Din. However, negotiations failed, as Iz ad-Din rejected Saladin's terms, leading Saladin to lay siege to the city on November 10th, 1182. Facing a stalemate in the siege, and wanting to withdraw without damaging his reputation, Saladin decided to attack Sinjar, held by Izadin's brother, Sharaf ad-Din. Sinjar fell after a fifteen-day siege on December 30th, although Saladin's soldiers plundered the city despite his efforts to protect its inhabitants. After establishing a garrison at Sinjar, Saladin awaited a coalition assembled by Izadin, consisting of forces from Aleppo, 
Mardin, and Armenia. However, upon hearing of Saladin's approach, the coalition sent messengers requesting peace, and both sides returned to their cities without engaging in a battle. On March 2nd, 1183, Saladin received news from Al-Adil in Egypt that Reynald de Chatillon, a crusader, had launched a raid in the Gulf of Aqaba, targeting towns and villages along the Red Sea coast. Although the raid was primarily piratical in nature, it alarmed the Muslims, who were not used to taking on such attacks from sea. In response, Saladin mobilized his warships from Fustat and Alexandria to the Red Sea, under the command of Lu, an Armenian mercenary. They broke the Crusader blockade, destroyed most of their ships, and pursued and captured those who fled into the desert. Saladin ordered the execution of the surviving Crusaders, numbering around 170 in various Muslim cities as a reprisal for their raid on the Red Sea coast. From Saladin's perspective, the war against Mosul seemed promising in terms of territorial gains, but he faced challenges as his army shrank due to some of his allies withdrawing their support. Despite this setback, Saladin and Taki ad-Din pressed forward against the coalition, led by Iz Adin, marching eastward to Ras el Ain without encountering resistance. After three days of intense fighting, Saladin's forces successfully captured Ahmed by late April. Saladin handed over the city to Nur ad-Din Muhammad, who pledged allegiance to Saladin and promised to support him in future campaigns against the Crusaders. The fall of Ahmed weakened Iz Adin's coalition, as it convicted Il Ghazi of Mardin to join Saladin's service. In an effort to gain legal justification for taking over Mosul and its territories, Saladin appealed to the Abbasid Caliphate and Nasir, requesting a document supporting his cause. Saladin argued that while he had conquered Egypt and Yemen under the Abbasid banner, the Zengids of Mosul had openly supported his rival Seljuks, and only sought the Caliph's support when needed. He accused Izadin's forces of hindering the Muslim war effort against the Crusaders. Saladin defended his actions, stating that his ultimate goal was to fight the Crusaders, eradicate the assassins, and rectify wrongs within the Muslim community. He promised the Caliph that if given control over Mosul, he would use it as a stepping stone to capture Jerusalem, Constantinople, Georgia, and other territories held by the Almohads in Maghreb. Saladin emphasized that all these conquests would be achieved by the will of God, and he offered territorial concessions to the Caliph in exchange for his support. After successfully capturing Aleppo, Saladin swiftly moved to secure his newly acquired territories. He sent his brother, Taj al-Muluk Buri, to capture Tel Khalid, northeast of Aleppo, which surrendered upon Saladin's arrival. From there, he marched towards Aintab, gaining possession of it with little resistance. On the 21st of May, he positioned his forces outside of Aleppo, encircling its suburbs in anticipation of capturing the city. Zangi, the ruler of Aleppo, did not offer much resistance, 
as he was unpopular among his subjects and wished to return to his previous city of Sinjar. Negotiations were conducted, and on the 12th of June, Aleppo was formally handed over to Saladin, in exchange for Zangi regaining control of Singar, Nusebin, and Raqqa, with the condition that these territories would serve as vassals to Saladin. The people of Aleppo were surprised by Saladin's takeover, but some emirs welcomed him and pledged their allegiance. Saladin replaced the Hanafi courts with Shafi administration, despite his promise not to interfere in the city's religious leadership. Additionally, he allowed Zangi to take his belongings from the citadel and sold the remaining stores to replenish his own coffers. After spending a night in Aleppo's citadel, Saladin marched towards Harim near Antioch, which was held by Surak. Saladin attempted to negotiate with Surak for the city's surrender, offering him Busra and property in Damascus in return. However, Surak's garrison forced him out, and Saladin's deputy arrested him on suspicion of planning to cede Harim to Bohemond the Third of Antioch. Saladin then arranged for the defense of Harim against the Crusaders, and agreed to a truce with Bohemond, while also assigning Azaz to Alam ad-Din Suleiman, and Aleppo to Saif ad-Din al yazkaj both of whom had supported him. These actions consolidated Saladin's control over the region, and marked significant progress in his campaign against the Crusaders. Saladin's response to Crusader attacks, particularly by Reynald of Châtillon, was swift and decisive. Reynald's harassment of Muslim trading and pilgrimage routes on the Red Sea posed a significant threat, prompting Saladin to take action. In September 1183, Saladin crossed the Jordan River to attack Baysan, sacking and burning the town and intercepting crusader reinforcements along the Nablus Road. When the main crusader force under Guy of Lusignan advanced, Saladin led his men to Ain Jalut, engaging in skirmishes and raids to weaken the crusaders. Despite the Crusaders' reluctance to engage his main force, Saladin managed to inflict losses on them before withdrawing due to low provisions. He sought retribution against Reynald by besieging his fortress at Kerak twice, in 1183 and 1184. But both attempts were unsuccessful due to relief forces. Undeterred, Saladin resumed attacks on the territory of Izadin around Mosul, which had allied with another powerful governor. However, facing illness and increased resistance, Saladin signed a peace treaty in March 1186. Reynolds continued provocations, including raiding a caravan of pilgrims, further fueled Saladin's determination to retaliate. Saladin vowed to personally slay Reynald for breaking the truce and resolved to dismantle the entire Christian kingdom of Jerusalem in response. The culmination of Saladin's efforts came on the 4th of July 1187 with the Battle of Hattin, where his forces decisively defeated the Crusaders. Saladin captured Reynald, who was personally executed by Saladin in retaliation for his attacks against Muslim caravans. Guy of Lusignan, fearing a similar fate, was spared by Saladin, who emphasized Reynald's extreme transgressions as justification for his execution. 
the Battle of Hattin marked a critical turning point in the Crusades, cementing Saladin's reputation as a formidable adversary to the Crusader states. His capture of almost every Crusader city marked a significant milestone in the campaign to reclaim these Muslim territories. Despite preferring to take Jerusalem without bloodshed and offering generous terms, the inhabitants chose to resist, leading to a siege. Balian of Ebelin's threat to kill Muslim hostages and destroy holy shrines prompted Saladin to accept terms of quarter, allowing most inhabitants to leave Jerusalem within forty days upon payment of a ransom. Patriarch Heraclius of Jerusalem organized the payment of ransoms for many citizens, while others were enslaved. Following the capture of Jerusalem, Saladin summoned the Jews and permitted them to resettle in the city, particularly those from Ascalon. Tyre, commanded by Conrad of Montferrat, remained a stronghold against Saladin's forces. In 1188, Saladin released Guy of Lusignan, who attempted to reclaim Tyre but was refused admission by Conrad. Instead, Guy besieged Arca. Saladin's relations with Queen Damar of Georgia were amicable, as she sought the return of confiscated possessions of Georgian monasteries in Jerusalem. Although the outcome of her request is unclear, Georgian pilgrims were allowed passage into the city, Queen Damar also attempted to obtain the relics of the True Cross from Saladin, offering a substantial sum, but she was not successful. After his victories, Saladin contemplated invading Europe to extend his conquests, expressing his desire to free the earth of non-believers. This ambition underscores Saladin's determination and the far-reaching scope of his campaigns. The Third Crusade, prompted by the events of Hattin and the fall of Jerusalem, saw King Richard I leading Christian forces against Saladin. King Richard's siege of Arca resulted in the execution of almost 3,000 Muslim prisoners of war with various accounts attributing different motives to the massacre. The armies of Saladin and King Richard clashed at the Battle of Arsuf, where Saladin's forces suffered heavy losses and were forced to retreat. Following this battle, Richard occupied Jaffa and restored its fortifications while Saladin dismantled the fortifications of Ascalon to prevent it from falling into Crusader hands. Throughout the conflict, negotiations for a truce between Richard and Saladin took place, with various proposals being exchanged, including marriage alliances between their family. However, disagreements over compulsory religious conversions ultimately led to the rejection of these proposals. In January 1192, Richard's army occupied Beit Nubar, close to Jerusalem, but withdrew without attacking the holy city. Instead, Richard focused on restoring fortifications in Ascalon, in July of 1192, Saladin attempted to threaten Richard's command of the coast by besieging Jaffa, but Richard arrived and defeated Saladin's forces. The Battle of Jaffa marked the end of military engagements in the Third Crusade. Richard and Saladin finally brokered a truce agreement with Richard agreeing to demolish the fortifications of Ascalon, while Saladin recognized crusader control 
of the Palestinian coast from Tyre to Jaffa. Additionally, Christians were allowed to travel unarmed as pilgrims to Jerusalem, and peace was maintained between Saladin's kingdom and the Crusader states, at least for the following three years. Saladin's death occurred on March the 4th, 1193, in Damascus due to a fever. At the time of his passing, he possessed only one piece of gold and forty pieces of silver, having given away much of his wealth to his impoverished subjects. Consequently, there were no funds available to pay for his funeral. He was interred in a mausoleum situated in the garden outside the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, Syria. Originally, this tomb was part of a larger complex that included a school. Today, little remains of this school, except for a few columns and an internal arch. In later centuries, Emperor Wilhelm II of Germany donated a new marble sarcophagus to the museum. However, rather than replacing the original wooden sarcophagus, both were kept in place. Visitors to the museum can now see both sarcophagi, with the marble one placed to the side, and the original wooden one covering Saladin's tomb. In the late 12th century, a fraternity emerged in Arca, formed by German merchants from Bremen and Lübeck, which laid the groundwork for what would later become the Teutonic Order. After taking over a hospital after the city's capture, this group initiated their mission to care for the sick, under the moniker of the Hospital of St. Mary of the German House in Jerusalem receiving Pope Clement III's blessing. This order swiftly became influential, leveraging control over Arker's port tolls, and eventually became more than just a hospital charity. Despite challenges, the order persisted, maintaining its historical motto, Help, Defend, and Heal and continuing its charitable events across all of Central Europe. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's great to see you again, and you already know who I am. If you'd like to support the channel, head on over to the Patreon, where all the videos are ad-free. Otherwise, if you enjoy the content, like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Now, without further ado, on to today's topic, the Teutonic Order, also known as the Teutonic Knights. In the midst of the 12th century, under Pope Calliston II's directive, the Knights Hospitalier took charge of a German hospital in Jerusalem, a sanctuary for the myriad of German pilgrims and crusaders unable to communicate in the local or Latin languages, as recounted by chronicler John de Pres. This establishment, while operating under the Hospitallers, was decreed by the Pope to be led by Germans, planting the scenes for a German-led religious institution within the Kingdom of Jerusalem itself. Following Jerusalem's fall in 1187, merchants from Lübeck and Bremen were inspired to establish a field hospital during the siege of Acre in 1190, laying the foundation for what would later be recognized by Pope Celestine II, third rather, in 1192, as the nucleus of a new order. Emulating the Knights Templar, this fledgling group evolved into a military order by 1198, with the head being designated as the Grand Master. 
tasked with crusading to reclaim and protect Jerusalem for Christianity. This transformation marked the order's shift from a hospice for pilgrims to a martial organization. Under the guidance of Grand Master Hermann von Salza, from 1209 to 1239. The order had its established roots in Arca, acquiring Montfort Castle in 1220 to safeguard the passage between Jerusalem and the Mediterranean. Montfort became the Grand Master's headquarters in 1229, though they eventually retreated to Arca after the castle fell to Muslim forces in 1271. Their reach extended across the Holy Roman Empire, including modern-day Germany and Italy, as well as Francocratia and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, bolstered by many land donations. The relationship with Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor, significantly elevated the status of Grand Master Hermann von Salza, making him a prince of the empire and allowing him to engage with other high-ranking nobles as a peer. Von Salza played a notable role during Frederick's coronation as King of Jerusalem in 1225, accompanying the emperor and publicly reading his proclamation in French and German. Despite these achievements and their esteemed status, the Teutonic Knights never quite matched the influence of their counterparts. The Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller, at least in the Crusader states. In 1211, the arrival of the Teutonic Knights in Transylvania marked a pivotal moment as King Andrew II of Hungary welcomed their assistance, offering them the district of Berzenland with unprecedented privileges, such as exemption from fees and the right to administer their own justice. This arrangement stemmed from Andrew's connections with the family of Hermann von Salza. Through marital negotiations involving his own daughter and the Thurundrian Landgrave's son. Under the leadership of a knight named Theodoric, or perhaps Dietrich, the order took on the mantle of protecting Hungary's southeastern frontier from the Cumans, constructing numerous forts and introducing German settlers among the existing Transylvanian Saxon community. Their aggressive expansion and fortification efforts, including the construction of stone castles by 1220, however, ignited envy and suspicion among the Hungarian nobility and clergy, who had been previously more or less indifferent to these lands. The return of King Andrew from the Fifth Crusade to a kingdom simmering with discontent over the campaign's cost and failures exacerbated tensions even further. Nobility pressure to retract the knight's privileges had led Andrew to reassess the initial agreement, although initially he stopped short of revoking their rights. Amidst the rising uncertainty about their future under Prince Bela's impending rule, the knights sought to place themselves directly under papal authority in 1224, a move that, unfortunately for them, backfired rather spectacularly. When King Andrew found out about this, he promptly expelled them from the country in 1225. While the ethnic German settlers brought by the order were allowed to stay, becoming part of the Transylvanian Saxons, Hungary was left vulnerable. You see, the expulsion of the knights, 
who had provided a robust military defense, left the region ill-prepared against the subsequent Cuman incursions, once again threatening the peace and security of the southeastern borders. In 1226, amidst the crusading zeal that swept through Western Europe, Duke Conrad I of Masovia, from northeastern Poland, sought the help of the Teutonic Knights to secure his borders against the pagan Baltic Old Prussians. He offered Kelmo land as a base for their operations, a proposal that Hermann von Salza, the Grand Master, saw as an opportunity to hone his knight's skills for future battles in the Holy Land, get a little bit of practice in before the real game begins. The Golden Bull of Rimini, issued by Emperor Frederick II, granted the order special imperial rights over Prussia, including that aforementioned Kelmo land under the guise of papal sovereignty. In a significant expansion of their influence, the knights absorbed the smaller order of Dobirzin in 1235, further cementing their presence in the region and somewhat bolstering their numbers. The campaign to subjugate Prussia unfolded over fifty years, marked by intense violence and resistance from native Prussians who fiercely opposed their conquerors going as far to execute captured knights in very barbaric medieval rituals. We're talking public executions, racks ripped apart by horses, all manner of medieval imagination. Despite all of this brutality, the conquest eventually led to the formal submission of some Prussian nobles, who saw their privileges reaffirmed by the Treaty of Christberg. However, the repeated Prussian uprisings between 1260 and 83 resulted in the displacement, or resettlement, of much of the Prussian nobility, eroding the rights of free Prussians and leading to a gradual assimilation of the remaining nobles with the German settlers. This period also saw varying degrees of integration and resistance among the Prussian populace, with frontier regions experiencing more freedoms compared to the more settled areas. The imposition of Christianity, while officially aimed at integrating Prussian society into Western Christendom, was met with mixed responses. The local bishops resisted the incorporation of pagan practices into the new faith, whereas the Teutonic rulers found it easier to manage a populace that had the opportunity to retain some of its pagan traditions, albeit in a form that the Christians found a little more palatable. Look at Christmas, for example. Think of things like that. After decades of warfare, the legacy of the Teutonic Knights' conquest of Prussia was largely stripped of its native population. Either through death or deportation, fundamentally altering the region's demographic and cultural landscape forever. In the wake of their military campaigns in Prussia, the Teutonic Order governed the region as a monastic state, enjoying a status akin to that of the Knights Hospitaller in Rhodes and Malta, under the dual auspices of Papal and Holy Roman Imperial Charters. This era saw Prussia become a bastion of the Order, as it sought to recover from the demographic devastations of plague and warfare 
that had decimated the native Prussian population. To replenish their numbers and bolster the region's development, the order actively promoted immigration from across the Holy Roman Empire, drawing Germans, Flemish, and Dutch settlers, as well as from Masovia, bringing in Poles who would later be known as Masurians. This influx of settlers encompassed a broad social spectrum, including nobles, burghers, and peasants, fa facilitating a gradual assimilation of Germanization of the surviving old Prussians. So, the landscape of Prussia was dramatically transformed by the order's architectural endeavors as well, with the construction of numerous castles serving as military bastions to quell native uprisings and support the ongoing confrontations with neighboring realms like the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland. These confrontations were a hallmark of the 14th and 15th centuries, punctuating the order's tenure in the region with a series of military engagements. Furthermore, the establishment of major towns and cities on the ruins of former Prussian settlements marked the landscape with symbols of the order's dominion and the new Christian order that they imposed. Among these new urban centers were Turun, Kelmo, Olsitzen, Elblag, and Klaipeda, and notably the more recognizable Königsberg, which was established in 1255 to honor King Ottokar II of Bohemia, symbolizing the profound transformation and Christianization of the Prussian lands under the Teutonic Order's rule. Following the catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Sol, the Livonian Brothers of the Sword found themselves incorporated into the Teutonic Knights in 1237, henceforth known as the Livonian Order. This marked the beginning of a series of ambitious, yet ultimately challenging campaigns to extend their dominion. The knight's aspiration towards Rus met a setback in 1242 at the Battle of the Ice, where they were defeated by Prince Alexander Nevsky of Novgorod. The ensuing years saw the Order's efforts refocused on the conquest of the Coronians and the Semigallians, though this was not without its own difficulties. In 1260, the Battle of Derbe saw the knights suffer a defeat at the hands of the Samogitians, igniting widespread uprisings across Prussia and Livonia. It was not until the Siege of Königsberg from 1262 to 1265 that the tide finally began to turn, culminating in the subjugation of the Coronians in 1267 and the Semigallians in 1290. Moreover, a significant Estonian rebellion was quelled between 1343 and 1345, and in 1346 the Duchy of Estonia was acquired from Denmark, further expanding the Order's territory. You see, by now the Order was getting quite powerful. More land means more power, and as with the Church, the knightly orders the nobles, it always comes down to land. The fall of Acre in 1291, and subsequent expulsion from Hungary, left the Teutonic Knights in search of a new focus for their crusading zeal. 
and eventually they found one. A little more close by, in fact, a stone's throw away. They found a target for their cause in the pagan people of Lithuania. The region's resistance to Christianization, at least compared to the rest of Eastern Europe, presented a protracted challenge. Initially, relocating their headquarters to Venice with ambitions to reclaim Outrima, the order soon shifted focus to Marienburg, better positioning themselves for the conflict with Prussia. The prolonged pagan stance of Lithuania attracted knights from across Western Europe to join the seasonal campaigns, leading to notable victories such as the Battle of Strepa in 1348 and the Battle of Rudau in 1370. The warfare between the Order and Lithuania was once again marked by extraordinary brutality, as was the style in the 14th century. With recorded instances of torture and ritualistic killings on both sides, the conflict deeply influenced the political landscape fostering enduring rivalries and impacting the cultural psyche of the region. It was never really the same after these wars. This protracted struggle actually spanned the breadth of over 200 years, with the front line stretching along the Neman River, dotted with numerous forts and castles encapsulating the enduring and bloody saga of the Teutonic Knights' campaigns in the Baltic. At the dawn of the 14th century, the Teutonic Knights found themselves embroiled in a conflict over Pomerelia's succession, a territory embattled by claims from the Margaves of Brandenburg and Duke Vladislav I, the elbow high of Poland, each bolstered by diverging historical ties and local support of nobility. The death of King Wenceslas of Poland in 1306 intensified these disputes, leading Brandenburg to seize much of Pomerania, leaving only Gdansk's citadel unoccupied. Unable to defend Gdansk, Vladislav sought the aid of the Teutonic Knights, led by Grand Master Siegfried von Fuchtwangen. My goodness, those German names. Please excuse my Polish and the German pronunciations. It's not what this channel is best at. In a significant turn of events, the knights under Prussian Lendmaster Henrik von Plotsk expelled the Brandenburgers from Gdansk on September 1308, but then, controversially, retained control over the city. Reports of a massacre vary widely, with figures ranging from 60 to as many as 10,000 victims, reflecting the contentious and unresolved nature of the event. The subsequent Treaty of Soldin in 1309 saw the knights secure claims to Gdansk and other strategic locales from Brandenburg, solidifying their dominion and facilitating a crucial land bridge between their monastic state and the Holy Roman Empire while concurrently serving Poland's Baltic access. This acquisition of Gdansk not only intensified the enmity between the Knights and Poland, but it also signified a pivotal moment in the Order's history. 
amid the persecution of the Knights Templar, which was really reaching a zenith at this point, the Teutonic Knights shifted their headquarters from Venice to Marienburg in 1309. They did this to attempt to safeguard their autonomy. Now, despite the growing papal scrutiny, the order maintained its position and continued its campaigns against the pagans in Lithuania. Now facing a vengeful Poland, and ongoing legal scrutiny. The Treaty of Kalitz in 1343 eventually managed to temper the conflict, with the Knights ceding territories to Poland, but retaining Pomerania and Gdansk, thus preventing their strategic gains. This period also saw participation from the Knights in the Battle of Legnica in 1241, alongside a contingent from the English Knights of St. Thomas, marking their involvement in the Mongol invasions of Poland. Despite the disastrous outcome for the combined Polish-German forces against the Mongols' superior tactics, Granted, many of these were tactics that the Mongols had been using in the East, and the Europeans had never really seen anything like it before. Very difficult to deal with. Very difficult to plan for a Mongol attack. But that's for the Mongol video. I'll do that one soon. In the mid-14th century... The Teutonic Knights were granted an ambitious mandate by Emperor Louis IV, which purportedly included the right to conquer all of Lithuania and Russia, signifying a dramatic expansion of their crusading frontier. Under the leadership of the new Grand Master Vinrik von Niprod, 1351-82, the order ascended to the zenith of its power, and, of course, the zenith of its influence, becoming a beacon for European crusaders and nobility, seeking glory and spiritual redemption in the northern crusades. The strategic island of Gotland plagued by piratical exploits of the Victual Brothers, was ceded to the Teutonic Knights by King Albert of Sweden. This move, intended to eradicate the pirate threat, saw Grand Master Conrad von Jungingen successfully reclaim Gotland in 1398, securing the Baltic Sea for merchant traffic and further extending the order's influence. However, the politics of the time shifted dramatically in 1386, with the baptism and subsequent marriage of Grand Duke Jogalia of Lithuania to Queen Jadwiga of Poland, transforming him into King Vladislav II Jagiello of Poland, and establishing a personal union that presented a formidable challenge to the Teutonic Knights. Initial attempts by the order to exploit divisions between Vladislav and his cousin Vitautas ultimately backfired, leading to a consolidation of opposition against them. Jogela's conversion marked the beginning of Lithuania's official Christianization undermining the crusading pretext under which the Teutonic Knights had justified their expansionist policies. Despite the nominal Christian status of both Prussia and Lithuania, hostilities with Poland and Lithuania persisted, fueled by territorial ambitions and deep-seated rivalries. Old memories certainly die hard. 
The creation of the Lizard Union in 1397 by Prussian nobles in Kelmoland underscored the growing internal dissent against the order's governance. By 1407, the Teutonic Order had reached the pinnacle of its territorial expansion, commanding a vast dominion that included Prussia, Pomerelia, Samogotia, Gotland, also, the Newmark and more, further consolidated by the pawn of Newmark from Brandenburg in 1402. This extensive realm underscored the order's significant, albeit contested, role in the medieval geopolitical theatre of Northern Europe. The pivotal moment for the Teutonic Knights came in 1410 with the Battle of Grunwald, where a unified Polish-Lithuanian force under Vladislav II Jagiello and Vitautas delivered a crushing defeat to the order. This battle saw the fall of Grand Master Ulrich von Jungingen, along with the majority of the order's top officials, challenging the myth of their invincibility. Although the subsequent siege of Marienburg by the victorious allies failed, largely due to the strategic defense led by Heinrich von Plauen, the first piece of thorn in 1411 allowed the order to maintain its territorial holdings. Nonetheless, the image of the order as a formidable force, a undefeatable band of warriors. Well, that was significantly tarnished at this point. And once you've lost your reputation, it's very hard to get it back. In the aftermath, the Teutonic Order faced declining influence, along with internal discord, exacerbated by the financial strain of a hefty indemnity imposed by Poland and Lithuania, leading to discontent among the cities over lack of representation. Heinrich von Plauen's attempts at authoritarian reforms eventually led to his ousting, with Michael Kuckmeister von Sternberg stepping in as the new Grand Master. Yet, he too struggled to reverse the Order's fortunes. The Golub War saw the Order cede small border areas and relinquish claims to Samogitia in the Treaty of Melno of 1422. This further ate, ate away and diminished their power. It seems that it was all bad news at this point for the Teutonic Knights. Now the Order's internal strife was mirrored by the broader situation and broader conflicts of the era, including feuds among knights from different regions and the destructive raids of the Hussites during the Hussite Wars. Despite attempts to rebel these invasions, the knights were bested by the Bohemian infantry, highlighting their waning military capability. Further setbacks were encountered in the Polish Teutonic War from 1431 to 1435, marking a period of sustained decline for the once mighty military order, as they grappled with both external pressures and internal fractures. The formation of the Polish Confederation in 1440 by the gentry and the burghers within the state of the Teutonic Order marked the beginning of significant political upheaval. By 1454, the dissatisfaction with the Order's rule had grown to such an extent that the Confederation began an open rebellion, seeking annexation by the Polish crown. 
King Casimir IV Jagiellon of Poland welcomed this appeal, formally incorporating the region and setting the stage for the Thirteen Years' War between the Order and Poland. This conflict saw Prussia ravaged and led to significant territorial and political losses for the Order. In an effort to fund their war efforts, the Order returned Newmark to Brandenburg in 1455 and subsequently lost control of Marienburg Castle, prompting a relocation of their headquarters to Königsberg. The second Peace of Thorn in 1466 decisively ended the war, with the order ceding significant territories to Poland and agreeing to become a Polish fief, fundamentally altering its position in the region. From this point forward, the Grand Masters were required to pledge allegiance to the Polish King, diminishing the Order's sovereignty. Effectively, at this point, they'd become agents of the Polish monarchy. The decline of the Teutonic Order's power in Prussia culminated in 1525, with Grand Master Albert of Brandenburg's conversion to Lutheranism. Secularization of the Order's Prussian holdings, and ultimately the acceptance of the Duchy of Prussia as a personal vassal of the Polish crown through Prussian homage. This event right here effectively ended the Order's rule over Prussian lands, though it had retained some territories within the Holy Roman Empire and Livonia, but these were very small territories, and they weren't going to hold them for very long. The subsequent German Peasants' War and the Livonian War further eroded the Order's holdings, with the Livonian branch seeing partition and secularization. Post-1525, the Order refocused on its possessions in the Holy Roman Empire, establishing a complex administrative structure centered in Bad Mergentime. Despite these changes, the Order's loss of Prussia remained a significant reduction in its power and territorial control, shifting its role from a sovereign military entity to a more fragmented and largely ceremonial organization within the shifting landscape of early modern Europe. After Albert of Brandenburg's departure from the Teutonic Order to establish himself as the Duke of Prussia, Walter von Kronberg took up the mantle as Deutschmeister in 1527, ascending to Grand Master by 1530. His leadership marked a significant transitional period for the Order, notably recognized by Emperor Charles V, who amalgamated the roles of Deutschmeister and Grand Master into the title of Hock und Deutschmeister in 1531, elevating the position to the status of Prince of the Empire. This reorganization ushered in a new chapter for the Order, with its Grand Magistery relocated to Mergentheim in Württemberg, an area that suffered quite a lot during the earlier German Peasants' War. The Order's commitment to the Imperial cause, particularly its support for Charles V against the Schemakaldic League, underscored its enduring martial spirit. Old habits were hard to shake. 
The Peace of Augsburg in 1555 marked a significant shift, allowing for Protestant membership while maintaining a predominantly Catholic composition, leading to a tri-denominational structure encompassing Catholic, Lutheran, and Reformed factions. This period also saw grandmasters from notable German families, and after 1761, the House of Habsburg Lorraine, managing the order's extensive holdings and leveraging its military expertise in service to the Habsburg monarchy against the Ottoman Empire. The order's storied military tradition faced its denouement in 1805 with the Peace of Pressburg's Article 12, which transitioned the German territories of the Knights into a hereditary domain under the prospective governance of the Habsburg Prince. However, the provisions of Pressburg went unfulfilled by the Treaty of Schronbrunn in 1809, leading Napoleon Bonaparte to order the dissolution of the knights' remaining territories, distributing them among his German allies by 1810. And this marked the definitive end of the Teutonic Knights' territorial sovereignty, transitioning the order from a formidable military and monastic power into a chapter of European history, shaped by centuries of crusade, conflict, and change. And with that, we reach the end of our video for this evening. I'd like to thank my Mega Chad tier patron, Stark Factory, for his generous contribution to the channel. Contributing to the Patreon keeps me going, so I can keep up this pace quite motivating, you know. Also, I'd like to thank all of my viewers for joining me and watching, especially if you got this far. Your patience is a virtue. The Knights Templar, officially known as the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, was a prominent military order of the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. Founded around 1119, the Templars played a significant role in the Crusades, operating from their headquarters on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Initially, the Templars enjoyed widespread support and amassed considerable wealth and power through donations, bequests, and land acquisitions across Europe. However, as the Crusades faltered and the Templars faced challenges in maintaining control over their holdings in the Holy Land, their popularity began to wane. Rumors and accusations against the Templars began to circulate, particularly concerning their alleged secret initiation ceremonies and several discrepancies with their growing wealth. Hello everyone and welcome. You've arrived at the history channel that you've been looking for. I'm the ASMR historian, and if you'd like to support the channel, I have opened a Patreon, where all the videos are ad-free. If you'd like to help out in a more practical way, Leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to the channel, so I can continue to grow in the algorithm. You know what it's like. Without further ado, let's begin our story for today. All you need to know about the Knights Templar. Firstly, I'm going to provide you with a brief explanation of who the knights were, before we go into 
real specifics of a chronological history. So let's begin from there. The Knights Templar were indeed an elite fighting force of their time, characterized by their rigorous training, superior equipment, and of course, unwavering dedication to their cause. Their religious convictions shaped their military ethos, emphasizing bravery, discipline, and self-sacrifice. Within the Templar ranks, there were three distinct classes, each serving a specific role in fulfilling the Order's mission. At the highest echelon of this were the Knights, the warrior monks who formed the core combat force. Sworn to poverty and obedience, they wore white robes symbolizing purity and served as the vanguard in battle. The knights adhered to strict rules, including celibacy, financial austerity, and of course, absolute loyalty to the order. The Templar priests, clad in green robes, performed essential religious duties such as conducting ceremonies, leading prayers, and maintaining records. They also provided spiritual guidance to members of the order, and often served as moral pillars during times of conflict. And there were plenty of those times. The mounted men-at-arms, known as brothers, constituted the largest segment of the Templar Order. These individuals, attired in black or brown robes, performed diverse roles, ranging from guarding and stewardship to squire duties. They were responsible for logistical support, ensuring that the knights were adequately equipped and supported on the battlefield. The Templars' military prowess was further augmented by their well-trained war horses, which were outfitted with armor and trained specifically for combat. This combination of skilled warriors, disciplined monks, and formidable steeds made the Knights Templar a formidable force wherever they went. Moreover, the Templars' belief in martyrdom as a noble death instilled them with unparalleled courage and determination in the face of crippling adversity. The famous Battle of Monte Cassard in 1177 stands as a testament to the tactical acumen and courage of the knights, who, despite being vastly outnumbered, managed to achieve a remarkable victory against the formidable forces of Saladin, or, if there are any Arabic-speaking viewers watching, I may do my best from memory and say that it is pronounced Salahuddin or Salahadin. Correct me in the comments, if you will. Now, Saladin, the renowned Muslim military leader, sought to advance towards Jerusalem with a formidable army comprising 26,000 soldiers. King Baldwin IV of Jerusalem, along with around 500 knights and their supporters, found themselves pinned near the coastal town of Ascalon, facing overwhelming odds. Well, amidst this dire situation, a small contingent of eighty Templar knights, accompanied by their entourage, attempted to reinforce the besieged forces. As Saladin's army approached, 
the Templars, aware of their numerical disadvantage, opted for a strategic approach. They met Saladin's troops at Gaza, but were deemed too insignificant to engage in battle, prompting Saladin to disregard them and continue his march towards Jerusalem. Quite an oversight. A very rare oversight for Saladin, by the way, who was an extremely intelligent military commander, and reportedly quite a gentleman. Taking advantage of Saladin's decision to disperse his forces for pillaging, the Templars seized the opportunity to strike. They swiftly joined forces with King Baldwin's army, and embarked on a daring march northward along the coast. Meanwhile, Saladin's troops, scattered and unprepared, fell victim to a surprise ambush orchestrated by the Templars near Monte Cassard, close to Ramla. The Templars' audacious assault caught Saladin's forces off guard, disrupting their cohesion and rendering them vulnerable to attack. Despite their numerical superiority, Saladin and his troops found themselves overwhelmed by the relentless assault of the Templars and their allies. The Battle of Monte Cassade proved to be a decisive turning point, as Saladin's army suffered heavy losses and was compelled to retreat in disarray. Although it was not the final confrontation with Saladin, the victory bought a crucial respite for the Kingdom of Jerusalem, providing them with a year of much-needed peace. The valiant stand of the Templars at Monte Cassade became immortalized as a legendary feat of heroism and military prowess. Despite their relatively limited numbers, the Templars frequently played pivotal roles in major battles, where they would either lead the charge at the onset of the engagement or provide crucial support to the main army from the rear. Their participation extended beyond the Holy Land, by the way, as they fought alongside renowned leaders such as King Louis VII of France, and of course King Richard I of England, that's Richard the Lionheart, by the way. In addition to these exploits in Palestine, members of the order were also actively involved in the campaigns of the Spanish and Portuguese Reconquista. One notable engagement was the Siege of Tomar in 1190, where Templar knights demonstrated their combat prowess and contributed to the Christian efforts to reclaim territories from Islamic rule in the Iberian Peninsula. Following the official papal sanction, the Knights Templar transformed from an order of humble monks into a revered charity across Europe. This newfound status brought them significant resources and financial backing from various sources all over Europe. One notable source of revenue was the contributions made by new members joining the order. As part of their initiation, these individuals took vows of poverty and often donated substantial sums of money or property to the order, further bolstering its wealth. Not a bad business plan. Additionally, the Templars engaged in lucrative business dealings that contributed to their financial prosperity, 
leveraging their trusted international network. Nobles would entrust the Templars with their wealth and assets, while they embarked on journeys, such as joining the Crusades. This arrangement served as a form of financial security, allowing nobles to safeguard their fortunes until their return. Right. So the brief history over, you kind of get an idea of what the Knights Templar were doing, right? Well, you see, originally, the Knights Templar were just there to guard pilgrims who were facing attacks while going to the Holy Land. This became a rather large problem. But by the year 1150, the Templars had expanded their mission beyond merely guarding pilgrims to pioneering an innovative system of issuing letters of credit. Pilgrims would deposit their valuables and deeds at a Templar house in their home country and receive a letter detailing their holdings in return. This letter often encrypted with a cipher alphabet, served as a form of currency that pilgrims could use to withdraw funds from their accounts at other Templar establishments along their journey. Pretty clever, huh? Not only did this system ensure the safety of pilgrims by sparing them from carrying valuable possessions, but it also enhanced the Templars' influence and economic power. As the Knights Templars' involvement in banking activities expanded, they became increasingly influential in the realm of finance, ultimately shaping the foundations of modern banking practices. Despite the Church's prohibition, against usury, that's charging interest, the Templars found ways to engage in lending practices by implementing clever loopholes. Instead of charging interest directly, they devised agreements where they retained rights to the production of mortgaged property, effectively charging rent in lieu of interest. This is quite often how Sharia-compliant banks work in the Islamic world. They still charge the interest, but they simply do not call it interest. It's more of a fee to service the loan. The Templars' vast holdings were essential to sustaining their military campaigns, as the cost of maintaining a knight grew substantially over time, requiring extensive land and resources. The order accumulated significant estates to support these operations. For example, by 1180, a Burgundian noble required three square kilometers of land to sustain himself as a knight a figure that rose to 15.6 square kilometers of land by 1260. Now that's inflation. Additionally, the Templars were responsible for supporting thousands of horses and pack animals, with high maintenance costs exacerbated by the challenging conditions of the Crusader states in the eastern Mediterranean. Despite these challenges, the Templars' astute political connections and understanding of the commercial dynamics of the Outrema communities propelled them to positions of immense power. For a group that took vows of poverty, they certainly seemed to be very good at making themselves rich. They acquired large tracts of land across Europe and the Middle East, constructed churches and castles, 
purchased agricultural properties, engaged in manufacturing, and controlled significant import and export operations. Their influence even extended to the maritime domain, with the Templars maintaining their own fleet of ships. At one point, they held dominion over the entire island of Cyprus, demonstrating the extent of their authority and wealth, but also attracting unwanted attention. We'll get to that later. The remarkable success and growing influence of the knights inevitably raised concerns among rival orders, and of course various nobles across Europe and the Middle East. Among their most powerful competitors were the Knights Hospitaller and the Teutonic Knights, both of whom vied for prestige, resources, and of course territory in the region. The Knights Hospitaller, also known as the Order of Hospitallers, shared a similar mission to the Templars in providing medical care and protection to pilgrims in the Holy Land. While they initially cooperated with the Templars, competition for resources and influence inevitably led to tensions between the two orders. Similarly, the Teutonic Knights, originally established to provide medical assistance during the Crusades, evolved into a formidable military order, focused on expanding Christian territory in the Baltic region. Their ambitions often clashed with those of the Templars, particularly in areas where spheres of influence overlapped and there were a few of those. In addition to rivalry from other orders, the Templars faced scrutiny and apprehension from various nobles and, even more dangerously, monarchs. Some nobles had expressed concern over the Templars' considerable wealth and financial power fearing that their economic influence could undermine the traditional power structures. Furthermore, the Templars' status as an independent military force, accountable only to the Pope, and God, of course, raised suspicions among rulers who sought to maintain control over their territories. The Battle of the Horns of Hattin in 1187, well, that marked a significant setback for the Templars and the Crusader States. Led by Grand Master Gerard de Riedford, the Templars suffered a devastating defeat against Saladin's forces. And that's right, Saladin came back swinging, and this time... It was personal. Gerard de Ritford's lack of strategic acumen, combined with poor decisions such as venturing into the arid hill country without adequate supplies, led to the Templars being overcome by the heat and eventually surrounded and massacred by Saladin's army. This defeat paved the way for Saladin's capture of Jerusalem, dealing a severe blow to the cause of the Crusaders. However, don't write them off too quickly. In the early 1190s, Richard the Lionheart, the King of England and leader to the Third Crusade, embarked on a remarkable campaign alongside his Templar allies. Through a series of decisive military actions, 
Richard and the Templars managed to recapture significant portions of Christian territory from Saladin. Despite the diminished size and influence of the Crusader states, particularly with the relocation of the Kingdom of Jerusalem's capital to Acre, the Third Crusade succeeded in preserving Christian control in the region, albeit barely. The military orders, including the Templars, played a crucial role in the defense of Crusader states during this period. Their formidable castles served as strongholds against the Muslim advances, while their expertise in warfare bolstered the Frankish forces on the battlefield. As a result, the power and influence of the Templars reached new heights in the aftermath of the Third Crusade, solidifying their position as key players in the defense of Christian interests in the Holy Land. Following the siege of Acre in 1291, the Templars faced the necessity of relocating their headquarters from the Holy Land to the island of Cyprus. Jacques de Molay, who assumed the role of the Order's Grand Master around 1292, undertook a significant effort to rally support for the Templars and organize yet another crusade. He embarked on a tour across Europe with the aim of garnering backing for his order. During his travels, he met with Pope Boniface the Thirteenth, or the Eighth, rather, who agreed to grant the Templars similar privileges in Cyprus as they had already enjoyed in the Holy Land. Additionally, Charles the Second of Naples and Edward the First offered various forms of support to the Templars. This support ranged from exemptions from taxes to pledges for future assistance in building a new army. These pledges of support were of course crucial for the Templars, as they sought to regroup and maintain their influence in the face of their loss of territory in the Holy Land. However, their efforts to organize another crusade to get that land back would ultimately face significant challenges amidst the changing dynamics of European politics and the waning enthusiasm for further military expeditions to the East. In 1298, the military orders, including the Knights Templar led by Jacques de Molay, along with the Hospitaller and other forces, undertook a campaign in Armenia to repel an invasion by the Mamluks. Despite their efforts, they were unable to achieve success, and the fortress of Roche Gulmaim in the Belen Pass which was the last Templar stronghold in Antioch, fell to the Muslims. Following this setback, in 1300, the Templars, in conjunction with the Knights Hospitaller and forces from Cyprus, launched an attempt to recapture the coastal city of Tortosa. Although they managed to seize the island of Arwad near Tortosa, their control of it was short-lived, and they soon lost it again. This loss of Arwad marked the end of the Crusaders' presence in the Holy Land, as it was their last foothold in the region. Despite still retaining a base of operations in Cyprus and possessing significant financial resources, the Order found themselves without a clear purpose and without widespread support. Things had 
changed. This precarious situation ultimately contributed to their downfall as they became increasingly vulnerable to external pressure, but also internal strife. Now this is where another main character comes into the story. A bit of a villain. If you thought Saladin was the villain, well, you are yet to meet King Philip IV. King Philip IV of France harbored deep suspicions towards the Templars, fearing that they might be plotting to establish a sovereign monastic state, similar to the Teutonic Knights in Prussia. His concerns were compounded by the Templars' support for a coup on the island of Cyprus in 1306, which resulted in the abdication of King Henry II in favour of his brother, Amalric of Tyre. Additionally, Philip inherited land in Champagne, France, where the Templars had their headquarters. The order was already perceived as a state within a state, enjoying considerable wealth, exemption from taxes, and maintaining a large standing army, capable of freely traversing European borders, despite having lost much of his presence in the Holy Land. This, of course, was rather threatening to the monarchies of many countries. Think about how the East India Company grew so much that it became a government unto itself. This is kind of what happened with the Templars. And the actual governments, those who were put in place because they had a real claim, quote-unquote, to power, well, they were not going to tolerate this for too long. Especially now that the Templars had no one left to fight. The Holy Land was gone. And there was simply a group of highly trained warriors with very sharp blades and nothing to do. On the ominous date of Friday, October 13th, 1307, scores of French Templars were simultaneously arrested by the agents of King Philip. They were subsequently subjected to torture, particularly at locations like the Tower at Chinon, to coerce confessions of heresy and sacrilege within the order, these confessions, obtained under duress, led to their execution. Of course, in our modern day, we know that confessions extracted through torture are not reliable. But this was not our modern day, and King Philip was just looking for an excuse. The charges against the Templars were escalated on August 12, 1308, with increasingly outrageous allegations. At this point, they were just making things up. A lot of the reason for this was to turn public opinion against the Templars. Well, one of the things that they accused them of was worshipping idols. One of the idols was a cat, and another was this kind of head with three faces on it. Very avant-garde stuff. The list of charges continued to grow, encompassing accusations of denying Christ, desecrating the cross, and all out engaging in devil worship. These accusations came as quite as a shock 
to many of the Templars, who had dedicated their entire life to doing the exact opposite. During the trials in Paris, a significant number of Templars confessed, quote-unquote, to these allegations, including denying Christ and what was described as obscene kissing rituals, whatever that means. They were also accused of spitting on the cross. However, these confessions were extracted through torture, and there was no physical evidence, or even independent witnesses, to substantiate the claims. They were simply pulled out of thin air. Now, despite the Templars reaching out to Pope Clement for assistance, the pontiff's response was limited to questioning the arrests, as he was largely under the influence of King Philip. The Templars' pleas for help from the papacy ultimately proved futile in the face of political and religious motivations driving the French monarchy's actions. Now the Templars' confessions all obtained under duress, ignited quite a scandal in Paris, leading to public outrage and demands for action against the alleged blasphemous conduct of the order. This was, of course, music to the ears of the monarchy. Succumbing to both public pressure and King Philip's concern, Pope Clement issued the bull Pastoralis, Preamentarie, instructing all Christian monarchs in Europe to arrest the Templars and seize their assets. The writing was certainly on the wall for the Templars at this point. Now, while most monarchs were skeptical of the charges against the Templars, legal proceedings were initiated across various regions, including the British Isles, Iberia, the Kingdom of Germany, the Italian Peninsula, and even back on the Kingdom of Cyprus. The actual likelihood of obtaining a proper confession, well that all depended largely on whether torture was employed during the interrogation, The prevailing belief is that King Philip, motivated by jealousy of the Templar's wealth and power, as well as his substantial indebtedness to them, that's right, he owed them quite a lot of money, fabricated false charges against the order at the Tours Assembly in 1308. It is widely doubted that Philip genuinely believed these accusations, which closely mirrored those made against Pope Boniface VIII. Many historians argue that Philip orchestrated these charges to seize the Templar's financial resources for his own benefit, with very little regard for their veracity. Notably, Philip had even invited Jacques de Molay, remember him, the Grand Master of the Templars, to serve as a pallbearer at a funeral just before the arrests, suggesting he premeditated betrayal. The Templars' arrests had ripple effects on the entire European economy, prompting a shift away from the Templars' monastic banking system and a return towards a traditional European monetary practice. Witnessing the fate of the Templars, the Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem and Rhodes were also persuaded to relinquish their banking activities during this period. 
in 1312, the Council of Vienne, and under the intense pressure of King Philip IV. Following this council, Clement V issued an edict officially dissolving the Order of the Knights Templar. Many monarchs and nobles who had previously supported the knights complied with papal command and dissolved their orders within their territories. While some rulers, such as those in England, arrested and tried Templars, and they were generally found not guilty. Well done to England. I guess it's a case of cancel culture in the medieval times. Now, outside of France, much of the Templar property was transferred by the Pope to the Knights Hospitaller. Surviving Templars were often accepted with open arms into the ranks of the Hospitallers. In regions where rulers were resistant to transferring Templar assets to the Hospitallers, such as the Iberian Peninsula, alternate arrangements were made. In Aragon, for instance, the assets were given to the Order of Montesa. In Portugal, the Templar Order continued under a new name. They rebranded to the Order of Christ. This group played a significant role in the early maritime explorations of Portugal, with Prince Henry the Navigator leading the order for two decades until his death. Despite the absorption of many Templars into other orders, questions remained about the fate of the tens of thousands of Templars across Europe. The hundreds of Templars arrested in France represented only a small fraction of the estimated 3,000 Templars in the country. Furthermore, the extensive archive of the Templars, containing detailed records of their business holdings and financial transactions, was never recovered. According to papal decree, these records were supposed to be transferred to the Knights Hospitaller, but their whereabouts remain unknown. The theory suggesting that the Knights Templars used a fleet of 18 ships at La Rochelle to escape arrest in France is primarily based on a single piece of testimony from a serving brother named Jean de Chalon. According to this testimony, Jean de Chalon heard rumors that Gerard de Villiers had set sail with eighteen galleys, along with the treasury of another Templar named Hughes de Peyrot just before the arrest warrant was issued for the order in October 1307. However, it's essential to note that this testimony is considered hearsay and is the sole source for this claim. Moreover, Jean de Chalon has been noted for making sensational and potentially unreliable statements about the order casting doubt on his credibility. He was certainly known to run his mouth off a little bit, so take whatever he says with a grain of salt. So, those charges that were brought against the Knights Templar included a broad range of accusations, many of which were typical of the accusations made during the medieval inquisition. These accusations included acts such as trampling on, spitting and urinating on the cross, engaging in obscene rituals while naked, 
worshipping idols and even practicing sodomy. Some Templars admitted to these acts under torture, including the worship of an idol known as Baphomet. However, I think we all pretty much know that they are not very reliable confessions. We don't need to be scholars and historians to see through this. The specific charge of head worship, unique to the Templars, has drawn particular attention. The descriptions of the head, allegedly venerated, varied widely, leading to some scholars to suggest it may have been linked to medieval folklore about magical heads or rituals involving relics. Most of the accusations are about that three-sided head, so you got three faces on the one head. I know, very avant-garde. Overall, the charges brought against the Templars remain a subject of debate, and there are very few scholars who take any credence for them. But you see, within our living memory there exists a twist to the story. A lady named Barbara Frail discovered a thing called the Chinon Parchment in September 2001. This parchment, dated the 17th of August 1308, was found in the Vatican secret archives and indicated that Pope Clement V had absolved the leaders of the order in 1308. Frail's findings were published in the Journal of Medieval History in 2004, drawing significant attention from historians and scholars. In 2007, the Vatican published the Chinon parchment as a part of a limited edition of 799 copies of Processus Contra Templarios. This publication provided broader access to the document, allowing researchers to further analyze its contents and its implications. Another Genon parchment, also dated 20th of August 1308, addressed to Philip IV of France, confirmed the absolution granted to all Templars who had confessed to heresy. This document stated that they were restored to the sacraments and to the unity of the church. Of course, these discoveries have prompted reassessments of the Templar trials and raised questions about the validity of the accusations. Not like there was already enough questions about that. It provides evidence of the papal absolution of the Templar leaders, suggesting that the trials may have just been political. But you don't need a chin on parchment to tell you that. Of course, if the discovery in 2001 shows us anything, it's that the story can always have a twist and turn, some 700 years later. Perhaps right now in the Vatican secret archives there lies a document, an artifact, a relic, that will change this story once again. Who will find that? Will it be you? Maybe. But either way, it seems that the story of the Templars is not over yet. The history of the Knights Hospitaller traces back to the early years of the Order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem 
also known as the Knights Hospitaller until 1309. Formed in the 11th century, the Hospitallers played a significant role in the Kingdom of Jerusalem during the Crusades, alongside other military orders, for example the Knights Templar and the Teutonic Knights. While initially focused on providing care for pilgrims, the Hospitallers evolved to become a formidable military force dedicated to safeguarding pilgrim routes. Led by figures like Gerard and Raymond de Poy, they earned recognition from the Pope in 1113 and became known for their distinctive white cross. Their history, chronicled in Latin sources and later accounts by historians like William of Tyre and Joseph de la Ville Leroux, remains intertwined with the broader narrative of the Crusades in the Holy Land. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. If it's your first time here, it's good to have you. If you're returning, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming back. If you'd like to support the channel, I've opened a Patreon, where all videos are available ad-free. This helps me keep the channel going. Other than that, if you want to bump me up in the algorithm, a like, comment, and subscribe does wonders for my exposure on this platform. Otherwise, please relax and enjoy the video. Today's topic is a history of the Knights Hospitallers in the Crusades. I hope you can enjoy it. Without further ado, let's begin. Raymond de Bois, 1083-1160, was a French knight who succeeded Gerard as the second Grand Master of the Order. Serving from around 1122 or 1123 until 1160. Little is known about Raymond's role in the Order before his assumption of the Magisterium. His first official act was recorded on the 9th of December, 1124. During his early years as Grand Master, the Order focused primarily on its social mission. Raymond divided the members of the Order into clerical, military, and serving brothers, and established the first significant hospitaller infirmary near the Church of the Hospital, rather Holy Sepulchre, in Jerusalem. He also engaged in the Order's business affairs, which were mainly conducted in Spain at the time. Raymond is credited with giving the Hospitallers its first statutes, which are believed to have been composed around 1130. The rule of the Hospitaller predates 1153, as it was approved by Pope Eugene the Third after 1145, but before 1153, more specifically the 7th of July, before his death. Now this marked the official establishment of the Hospitaller as a proper order, just like the Teutonic Knights and the Knights Templar. From 1135 to 54, the order enjoyed an exemption from local religious authorities. Additionally, Raymond introduced the order's Great Seal, which was in use from the 12th century all the way until 1798. This seal depicted the Grand Master kneeling in prayer before the patriarchal cross on the obverse, accompanied by sacred letters Alpha and Omega, symbolizing the second coming of Christ. 
Now, back to Raymond Du Bois. Raymond Du Bois is depicted in several paintings housed in the Celles de Crusades, which is the Hall of Crusades in the Chateau de Versailles in France. Alexandra Lamelin's full-length portrait of Raymond Du Bois is displayed in the third room of the hall, and is quite a sight to see. Additionally, two battle scenes featuring Raymond Du Bois in military action in Syria around 11.30 are depicted in the following room. These paintings highlight Raymond's significant role as Grand Master of the Hospitallers during the Crusades. The First Crusade concluded with the capture of Jerusalem in 1099, but it took until 1104 to fully secure the city of Arca. During the early years of the Crusader presence in Arca, the Hospitallers received donated properties in the region. Baldwin I of Jerusalem granted permission for the construction of a commandery north of the San Croix Church in 1110. However, in 1130, the Hospitallers decided to relocate near the north wall of the city, due to damages sustained during work at the church. This new location became the Hospitalier Commandery of San John d'Acre. The Hospitalliers received their first castle, Coliath, from Pons of Tripoli in 1127, which remained in their possession until seized by the Ayubids in 1207. By 1149, the commandery of the Hospitallers in Arca was described as a very impressive fortified building by many of the pilgrims who came across it. In 1143, Celestine II granted the Hospitallers jurisdiction over Santa Maria Alemana, a hospital established in 1128, to accommodate German pilgrims and other crusaders. While formerly under the jurisdiction of the Hospitallers, the Pope decreed that the prior and brothers of the Domus Theonoricum, the House of the Germans, should always be Germans themselves. This tradition laid the groundwork for the formation of the Teutonic Order in 1190. But that's for another video. Raymond also took over the management of the Leprosarium outside Jerusalem, which later became the Order of Saint Lazarus with Raymond serving as its seventh Grand Master just before his death. A conflict arose between Raymond and Fulk of Anglomin, the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, around 1156. The Patriarch accused the Hospitallers of various religious infractions, and personal affronts, including competing with the Holy Sepulchre by the beauty and height of their buildings. Sounds like jealousy to me. The conflict escalated when the Hospitallers invaded the Holy Sepulchre with an armed force in response to the Patriarch's complaints. Fulk sought redress from Pope Adrian IV, asking for the withdrawal of a papal bull confirming the prerogatives of the order. Fulk then led a contingent to Rome in 1155, but the case resulted in endless debates, and no satisfaction for Fulk upon his return to Jerusalem later that year 
quite a waste of time and a wasted trip. Under the leadership of Raymond de Bois, the Knights Hospitalier first transitioned towards their more military role. Of course, they were around before Raymond de Bois was, but the world was changing, and so was their role within it. An act dated 17th of January 1126 marks the first reference to a constable of the Hospitallers, named Durand, who held military responsibilities. Now, while it is unclear if Durand was a member of the order, or simply hired by the hospital, this development predated the formation of the Templars by two years. However, the rising influence of the Templars also contributed to the Hospitaller's increased military focus. Depictions from the 19th century in the Salles de Croissades depict Raymond in battle as early as 1130. Can't argue with that. The Hospitaller's assumption of a more military role is exemplified by their involvement in the construction and operation of the Crusader Castle at Beth Giblain. Built by Folk of Jerusalem in 1135 to fortify the kingdom, the castle was donated to the Hospitaliers in 1136. Following the example of the Knights Templar, Raymond instituted protections for pilgrims by providing security for their travels to the holy places. Additionally, Raymond hired knights and men-at-arms as mercenaries and participated, through intermediaries, in the defense of the kingdom. By 1154, a category of brother priests was granted by Pope Anastasius IV, and although physicians didn't appear among the order's medical personnel until the statutes of 1184, the military aspect was formalized earlier with the recognition of brothers in arms since 1160. Consequently, the order had became legally a religious military order. Beginning in 1137, the order actively participated in wars waged by the Kingdom of Jerusalem against its enemies, who regularly attacked, and from all sides. Ascalon, due to its strategic location on the seashore en route to Egypt, posed a constant threat to the Christians, leading to continuous incursions into the southern part of the kingdom. On the advice of Fulk, the Franks decided to fortify the position of Hassan ibn Akar, which belonged to the Hospitallers and was situated east of Ascalon. This task of fortification directed with urgency by the Latin Patriarch William of Malinese, was entrusted to the Hospitaliers especially, positioning them at the forefront of defence against the Egyptians. During the Second Crusade of 1147, the Hospitaliers had become a significant force in the kingdom, and the political importance of the Grand Master had risen considerably. At the Council of Acre in June 1148, Raymond de Bois was among the leaders who decided to undertake the Siege of Damascus. Despite the disastrous outcome of this siege, the blame was primarily placed on the Templars, rather than the Hospitallers. 
I'm sure Raymond Dupuy was very relieved when he heard that. In the Holy Land, the influence of the Hospitallers continued to grow, with Raymond's governance playing a decisive role in many military operations. Well, after the failure of the Second Crusade, attention shifted back to the fortress at Ascalon, which at that time was held by the Fatimids, just one of the many enemies. Amidst the siege of Ascalon in 1153, a truce was called to allow each side to bury their dead. Despite facing numerous setbacks, including a serious defeat suffered by the Templars, Baldwin III of Jerusalem was persuaded by Raymond and the Latin patriarch Folk to continue the siege. Renewed efforts led to capitulation of the besieged Muslims on the 19th of August 1153, with the city evacuated the following day. In 1156, Nur ad-Din and his brother Nasr ad-Din routed a force of hospitallers near their stronghold at Khaled el Markab near Banyas. By the way, I'll do my best with any Arabic pronunciations. My French is probably embarrassing too. Following a broken peace treaty by Baldwin III in February 1157, Humphrey II of Turon, master of Banias, sought the aid of the Hospitallers to face the Zengids. Despite their participation, they suffered a defeat near Ras el Ma on April 24th, leading to the conquest of Banias on the 10th of May. 1157. However, they did manage to defend the castle, which Baldwin III resupplied to maintain a strong garrison there. In a subsequent encounter at Jacob's Ford on the 19th of June, the king was routed, but he managed to retreat to Safed and then to Arca. Nur ad-Din abandoned his attack on Banias and returned to Aleppo, Syria, fearing an assault by Kilij Arsan II. Humphrey later sold Banias and the castle to the Hospitallers. Under the leadership of Raymond de Bois, the Knights Hospitaller received significant support and resources to defend the Holy Land against the encroaching Muslim forces. Raymond's tenure saw a surge in donations to the Order, particularly from the county of Tripoli, which managed to bolster their financial capabilities. Moreover, Raymond's Magisterium marked the acquisition of the Hospitaller's first Crusader castles, solidifying their military presence in the region. Of course, once you're in a castle, once anybody is in a castle, it's very hard to get them out of the castle. In addition to material support, the Hospitallers secured numerous privileges and exemptions from the papacy, granting the order independence and freedom from the authority of diocesan officials, much to the officials' chagrin. These privileges provided the Hospitallers with the financial resources and autonomy necessary to effectively carry out their mission. Among the most notable strongholds established during Raymond's leadership were the Crac de Chevalier, a formidable fortress in the Levant, occupied by the Hospitaliers from 1142 
1271. Also Margat on the Syrian coast, another significant stronghold held from 1186 to 1285, one year off the century. Bad luck. These fortifications played a crucial role in the Hospitaller's defense of the Holy Land and served as symbols of their military power, but also dedication to the Gauls. Now, Raymond de Bois' death around 1160 marked the end of an era for the Knights Hospitaller. He was succeeded by Auger de Balben, who served as Grand Master for a brief period until he disappeared in 1162. No one knows where he went. Following Auger de Balben's disappearance, Gilbert of Asselé, a French knight, assumed the position of Grand Master in 1162. Under his leadership, the Knights Hospitaller underwent significant militarization, acquiring territories in the county of Tripoli and the Principality of Antioch. Gilbert played a key role in securing regal rights for the order, granting them military privileges above common law and effectively establishing a form of quasi-sovereignty. One of Gilbert's notable actions was his involvement in the Crusader invasion of Egypt, where he encouraged Almeric of Jerusalem to declare war on Egypt and expand the kingdom's territories. However, the campaign faced a significant defeat at the Battle of Harim in 1164, resulting in the capture of Raymond III of Tripoli and the loss of the city of Banyas to Nur ad-Din. In 1167, Gilbert participated in another campaign against Egypt, but the Crusaders were defeated again at the Battle of Al-Babin. Despite all of the setbacks, Gilbert's leadership marked a period of military expansion and strategic engagement for the Knights Hospitaller solidifying their role in the defense of the Holy Land and their pursuit of territorial gains. Gilbert's fervent belief in the conquest of Egypt led to his active involvement in several military campaigns aimed at securing territory in the region. In October 1168, he provided significant military support to Amalric's campaign, offering 1,000 knights and Turcopolios in exchange for Bilbais and the surrounding territories. And they had some initial success, including the seizure of Bilbais. But the campaign once again ultimately failed mainly due to how hard the re resistance was from the Egyptians, and the formation of a new alliance against the Crusaders. Following the failure of the campaign, Amalric sought assistance from other Western powers, sending an embassy that included the Grand Commander of the Hospitallers, Guy de Morny, to plead for support. Despite their efforts, the embassy returned empty-handed after two years of very fruitless negotiations. In the fall of 1169, Amalric launched another campaign against Egypt, with the assistance of the Emperor and the Hospitallers. However, this expedition also ended in failure, resulting in widespread blame being directed towards Gilbert for the Order's misfortunes. Gotta blame somebody. May as well be him. 
he was accused of neglecting the hospitalier's charitable mission and basically ruining the whole order. Well, the writing was on the wall for Gilbert, and he resigned from his position as Grand Master. Only to reconsider this later. Gilbert's resignation, of course, marked a period of instability within the Order's leadership. With Gaston de Merol's serving a brief but pretty unremarkable term as his successor. However, the internal conflicts continued to persist, highlighting the challenges faced by hospitalers during this turbulent period. In 1171, Jobert of Syria succeeded Gilbert as the Grand Master, and played a crucial role in securing the release of Raymond III of Tripoli, who had, aforementioned, been captured by Nur ad-Din in 1164. I'm sure he was having a great time in the prison. Oof. Gilbert's tenure also saw further military engagements including participation in campaigns against Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt, and his forces in Homs. Overall, Gilbert's ambitious military endeavours and subsequent resignation underscored the many complexities of the Hospitaliers' role in the Crusades, and the challenges they faced in balancing their military duties with their charitable duties. Of course, it would get him to the point where people were a little bit confused as to what the actual mission was. Were they there to fight wars? Were they there to protect pilgrims? Perhaps the hospitaliers themselves did not know either. Well, Roger de Molines assumed the position of Grand Master of the Knights Hospitaller following the death of Jobert in 1177. During Roger's leadership, the Hospitallers emerged as one of the most formidable military organizations in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. This marked an even deeper departure from their original mission of providing medical care. One of Roger's early actions was to encourage Baldwin IV of Jerusalem to continue the vigorous prosecution of the war against Saladin. In November 1177, Roger himself participated in the pivotal Battle of Monte Cassard where the forces of the Kingdom of Jerusalem achieved a significant victory against the Ayyubids. Indeed, the Battle of Monte Cassard is perhaps one of the most famous battles of the Crusades. A video on that very, very soon. I promise. I know the list is long, but I will get there. Well, However, the military focus of the Hospitallers under Roger's leadership prompted Pope Alexander III to kind of pull the reins on them and remind them of their original charitable mission. Stay in your lane, basically. Between 1178 and 1180, the Pope issued a bull calling the Hospitallers back to the observance of the rule established by Raymond de Puy. The bull forbade Hospitallers from taking up arms unless they were attacked, and emphasized their function and the importance of caring for the sick and impoverished. Well back to their original job, 
it seems. In 1184, Roger embarked on a tour of Europe alongside Arnold of Toroja, the successor of the Templar Grand Master Odo de Saint Amand, that's the Knights Templar, and Latin Patriarch Heraclius. Their purpose was to appeal to Pope Lucius III to rally support for a new crusade. However, the death of Baldwin V in Jerusalem in August of 1186 brought about a bit of a succession crisis, with Roger opposing the ascension of Sibylla of Jerusalem and Guy of Lusignan to the throne. Initially, Roger even refused to hand over his key to the royal treasury upon their coronation in 1186, putting him at odds with prominent figures, such as Reynald de Chatillon and Grand Templar Master Gerard de Ridfaux. At the end of 1186, a pretty eventful year for everybody, it seems, Renal de Chatillon defied the truce with Saladin by capturing a caravan travelling from Cairo to Damascus, which included the sister of the emir. In response to this provocation, the barons gathered in Jerusalem under the leadership of Guy de Lusignan in, on the 27th of March 1187, demanding a reconciliation between Lusignan and Raymond III of Tripoli. Roger de Moron, Gerard de Ridfort, Archbishop Josius, Balian of Ibelin and Renard Grenier were appointed to negotiate with Raymond III in Tiberias. However, their diplomatic efforts were thwarted when they unexpectedly encountered Muslim troops, leading to the ill-fated Battle of Cresson against Saladin on the 1st of May 1187. And it was a critical battle. After all, Roger de Moulins was killed. Somebody stabbed him with a big spear. Rest in peace, Roger. While well, following Roger's death, William Borel assumed the role of Grand Master ad interim. Borel had previously served as Grand Commander for a brief period in 1187. He then appointed Armin Gold de Aspa as his successor as Grand Commander. On the 12th of July, 1187, Saladin laid siege to Tiberias and successfully captured the city. Despite the advice of Hospitaller commands, Guy de Lusignan, influenced by the Templars led by Girard de Ridfall, decided to attempt to rescue the city. This led to the Battle of Hattin on the 4th of July, where an army led by Raymond III of Tripoli was surprised by Saladin's forces. Well, it did not go well for them. The Templars and the Hospitallers were unable to withstand the attack and the battle ended in a devastating defeat for the Crusaders. Many of the captured Hospitallers and Templars, including William Borel, were subsequently put to death by Saladin, with only Gerard de Ridford spared. Lucky for him. Hospitaller Knight Nicasius of Sicily, later revered as a martyr, was one of the more notable casualties. The captured nobles, including the king, 
were taken to Damascus and held for ransom. Reynald de Chatillon, however, was beheaded, and he was beheaded by Saladin himself. Saladin wanted to do the deed as retribution for Reynald's numerous offences. After the death of William Borel, Armengol de Aspa assumed the position of Grand Master. The Muslim victory at Hattin also allowed Saladin to advance towards Jerusalem, arriving at the city on the 17th of December 1187, and commencing the siege of Jerusalem three days later. Defending the city were a few knights and a small garrison of hospitallers and templars, under the command of Balian of Ibelin, who was the highest-ranking lord at the city at the time. On the 2nd of October, 18, I beg your pardon, 1187, Jerusalem capitulated, and the Christians were permitted to evacuate the city in exchange for a ransom. The evacuation occurred in three groups, with the Templars leading the first, followed by the Hospitallers, and the Latin Patriarch of Heraclius of Jerusalem and Balian of Ibelin leading the last. They were escorted to the borders of the county of Tripoli, while ten friars of the order remained in Jerusalem to attend the wounded and the sick. And there were plenty of them. Despite the loss at Jerusalem, the Franks remained under attack at the siege of Tyre. Saladin personally reinforced and supported his troops during the siege, which commenced on the 11th of November, 1187. Armengol de Aspa led the Hospitallers in defense of Tyre alongside the Templars. By the beginning of 1188, the Franks had lost control of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, but they did manage to retain Tyre, albeit holding on by a thread. The formidable castle at Maragat, remember that one, was too deemed, too difficult rather, to assault. So Saladin simply shrugged his shoulders and didn't bother with it. The game was simply not worth the candle, and the people inside weren't going to be causing much damage, all holed up in their stone fortress. Meanwhile, the Hospitallers had been defending Belvoir Castle since August 1187. On the 2nd of January 1188, they abandoned the fortress and launched a successful attack on the Muslim forces besieging it. This attack resulted in the death of Saladin's general in charge, Saif al-Din Mahmud and the capture of a significant cache of arms. However, to the east, beyond the Jordan River, Al-Adil I, Saladin's brother, launched an attack on the castles of Crac de Chevaliers and Montreal, both of which surrendered due to lack of supplies by the end of September 1188. Additionally, the siege of Safed concluded with the capitulation of the castle belonging to the Templars on November 30. The Hospitallers continued to resist at Belvoir Castle until the 3rd of January 1189, when they were forced to surrender due to famine. In late 1189, Armengol de Aspa stepped down from his position as Grand Master, leading to a temporary void in leadership 
until Garnier of Nablus was elected as his successor in 1190. Garnier had been severely wounded at the Battle of Hattin in 1187, but managed to make his way to Ascalon, where he recovered from his injuries. During this period, he awaited the departure of Richard I of England for the Third Crusade in Paris. Garnier arrived in Messina on the 23rd of September, where he met with noble figures such as Philippe Auguste and Robert IV de Sablé, who would soon become the Grand Master of the Templars. Among the hospitaliers accompanying Garnier was the Italian Ugo Canefri. Departing Messina on the 10th of April 1191, Garnier sailed with Richard's fleet and anchored at the point of Lemesos on the 1st of May. Despite Gania's efforts at mediation, Richard subdued the island on the 11th of May. Setting sail once more on the 5th of June, they arrived at Arca, which had been under Ayubid control since 1187. In Arca they found Philippe Auguste leading the siege a two-year-long attempt to dislodge the Ayubids. The besiegers eventually prevailed, and on the 12th of July 1191, the Muslim defenders capitulated. On the 22nd of August 1191, Richard travelled south to Arsuf, with the Templars forming the vanguard and the hospitaliers positioned at the rear guard. Accompanied by an elite force prepared to intervene as needed, Richard encountered heavy pressure from the Muslims at the beginning of the Battle of Arasuf on September 7th. Garnier's knights, situated at the rear of the military column, faced intense attacks. Garnier rode forward to pursue Richard to initiate an attack, but Richard initially refused. Eventually, Garnier and another knight charged forward, leading the rest of the Hospitaller force into battle. Despite disobeying Richard's orders, Garnier's actions contributed significantly to the victory and Richard ultimately signalled for a full charge, breaking the enemy's ranks. And with that, we reach the end of the Battle of Arsuf, and the early days of the militarization of the Knights Hospitaller. Thank you very much for listening to this rather long-winded video. If you've enjoyed the content, why not have a look at my Patreon, where all the videos are available ad-free. Or, leave your thoughts in the comments, like the video, and subscribe for more. I'm always making more videos, and I'm showing no signs of slowing down. Thank you very much for listening, it's once again been a pleasure. And with that, I wish you good night.